Thank you very much for coming today, both those of you here in person and um, joining us virtually. I'm Susan Dudley. I direct the George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center, which works to improve regulatory policy through research, education, and outreach. And I'm very pleased to be hosting today's event with ITIF and the Schumpeter Project. Regulatory and antitrust policies are of great interest lately, especially those related to technology. But not all of the issues or concerns are new. We're here to commemorate the 20th anniversary of a volume, volume that addressed these topics, and I have it here, titled Dynamic Competition and Public Policy, Technology, Innovation, and Antitrust Issues. It was edited by Jerry Elig, an economist, um, it was actually published in 2001, so this is its really its 21st issue. So um, anybody born the year this was published could probably join us for the reception afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerry devoted his career to applying economic concepts and analysis to a variety of different policy issues. He taught at George Mason University and for many years was a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center there. He also had several forays into government as a senior economist for the Joint Economic Committee of the US Congress in the mid 1990s, as deputy director and acting director of the FTC's Office of Planning, um, Policy Planning in the early 2000s, and as chief economist at the Federal Communications Commission from 2017 to 2018. I was lucky enough to hire him as a research professor at the GW Regulatory Study Center when he left the FCC, and he worked with us until his untimely death last year. We've established an award in his honor and are hosting a conference based on his scholarship in June, um, so you can ask any of us from GW about that um, during breaks. He was a prolific writer and published his insights in economics, law, public policy, political science, and management journals. And he was a great communicator, able to convey complex concepts in an accessible and even folksy way. This book illustrates um, those qualities, shedding light on different models of dynamic competition from Schumpterian to evolutionary to Austrian to path dependence, and then applying those to important policy issues. So if you're interested in these topics, I encourage you to read at least the introduction to this volume and also the first chapter in which he and Daniel Lin provide a taxonomy of dynamic competition theories, their assumptions and policy implications. Working with the Mercatus Center last year, we edited a volume of Jerry's works. Because he was so prolific, we really had a hard time narrowing the selection down um, without having an encyclopedia-length publication. But I'm pleased to say that the taxonomy chapter from this volume made the cut. Um, and it, like so much of his writings, so this is the new book. Um, thank you. We can get you copies of that if you're interested. Um, and look, so much of his writing, it seems just as applicable today as it did when he first wrote it. So indulge me while I read the first paragraph of the introduction to the 2001 book. When sweeping economic change occurs, new technologies and business methods rapidly replace old ones. Previously unheard of firms dominate their markets by successfully pioneering the new ways of doing things. But a dominant firm also raises fears of monopoly. At what point does a successful competitor cross the line separating pro-consumer innovation from anti-consumer monopolization? And he includes um, his introduction with this chapter, or with this phrase. These chapters represent a variety of different approaches to dynamic competition but all demonstrate a similar point. If policymakers want to take innovation, creativity, and change seriously, they need new, new analytical approaches that treat these phenomena as the main act rather than a sideshow. This book offers a step in that direction. 
I hope this conference is another step in that direction. And I wish you could have had Jerry here introducing it instead of me. And I'm so grateful to Aurelia and ITF for suggesting this event and bringing such a terrific group of speakers together. I look forward to learning more about what dynamic competition means for public policy, creativity, and innovation today. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. Uh, very quickly, um, it's a great pleasure to organize this conference together. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Bryce for superb collaboration. Uh, and of course, thank you to ATIF uh, staff member uh, who have worked relentlessly uh, for this conference day to materialize. Dynamic competition is essential. Um, it is perhaps the most single important things entrepreneurs care about. Uh, the fear of being outcompeted the uncertainty about the next technology, about the next market, and whether these companies uh, will ever survive, or whether, as Joseph Schumpeter uh, described, they will be defeated by the gales of creative destruction. This endless process of competition through disruptive innovation is what makes dynamic competition. This dynamism is perhaps the most peculiar feature of capitalist societies. As opposed to static socialist uh, economies, capitalist societies are engines of progress, change, and constant innovation. But if dynamic competition is a daily quest for survival for entrepreneurs, regulators too often remain cosseted within the models of static competition. Firms are assumed to compete with current and well-identified rivals, they compete through price, so the lower price and zero profits are supposedly evidence of competition. While higher price and market power are inevitably evidence of a lack of competition. Regulators straight jacket the entrepreneurial quest for dynamic competition through innovation into obsolete analytical tools um, which prevent rather than preserve competition. Competition without innovation, or rather competition without innovation capabilities, is not the preservation of the, of the competitive process. It is its very opposite. Preventing firms from building dynamic capabilities in the name of a more perfect competition amounts to denying the firms the ability to compete with other firms in the next technological phase, in the next line of product, in the next market environment, which will inevitably emerge from the old market environment. Competition in straight jackets is not competition. And, co and perfect competition is often the enemy of good competition. Because imperfect competition, what we describe as imperfect competition, is in fact the genuine source of innovation. Regulators have to adjust their reasoning accordingly. Scholars have discussed the need for Schumpeterian competition for a long time now without sufficient consideration. And one of the prominent scholars uh, that has spoken eloquently uh, about dynamic competition is, of course, Jerry Ellick. Uh, this conference commemorates uh, the, the book that Suzanne just described. And the question is, it was published in 2001. What we have learned since then? Well, unfortunately, uh, Jerry's insights remain astoundingly accurate for today's current antitrust enforcement. And, uh, and the state of affairs. Current antitrust enforcement uh, seems to depart even further away from the benefits of dynamic competition. We apply a strong assumption of static competition in a time of disruptions. The mismatch between the entrepreneurs, calculus, and the regulators' analytical tools has been, is greater than ever. Here is why this co such conference is important. We're delighted to have gathered such an impressive line of speakers, and the entire uh, conference will be not only in person, but also live streamed. To those watching on internet, uh, feel free to ask questions to our panelists through uh, Slido, uh, which is available on the ATIF website. So without further ado, let me introduce our opening keynote speaker, uh, Patricia Brink. We're delighted to have Patricia uh, as opening uh, keynote speaker this morning. Patty is a senior counsel for international and intergovernmental engagement at the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. 
Patty joined the antitrust division after graduating from the University of California, Davis Kill, uh, King Hall School of Law. She has held a variety of leadership position at the antitrust division, including nearly 10 years as a director of civil enforcement. Previously, Patty was uh, a staff attorney in several sections in the division and was special counsel for the Microsoft decree enforcement and has been involved in a civil case cooperation and technical assistance trainings with many international jurisdictions. She's an active member of the uh, American Bar Association Antitrust uh, Law Section and of several organizations advancing women's participation in competition law. Patty, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Aurelian, for the um, very kind introduction. And to the GW Regulatory Study Center and the ITIF for the opportunity to be here today and to speak to people in the room as well as those online. Um, and we're going to be talking today about the importance of competition and innovation. I have to admit that when Aurelian first talked to me about talking to this conference, I, I, I said that I really wasn't much of a Schumpeter scholar and that I might need some, some materials to uh, read up. And, um, but once, once I started reading some of the articles that he sent me in the materials, I realized that um, talking to you from an enforcer's point of view about innovation and dynamic competition might be a great way to start today's conference. Uh, before I get into it, let me first give my disclaimer, which is the views on my own and not necessarily those of the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. So I'm going to spend some time talking about innovation and giving you some examples of the ways in which um, the Department of Justice has done a deep dive of looking at innovation competition on specific mergers. And I think these may call into question Aurelian's contention about the regulators only using static views and not really taking and 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 also I think there was something about obsolete tools, <laughs> so I, I don't really think that's the case, but um, I'll talk to you about specific cases and you can be the judge. Um, but before we did that, I thought I, I, it would, would be of interest to the audience um, to have a short update on some of the activities of the antitrust division right now. Last week, uh, we had a number of different conferences, both in town and, and around. There was an enforcer summit hosted by DOJ and FTC, where our international and state partners talked uh, about a variety of topics, including merger enforcement and the revisions to the merger guidelines. Um, then there was a conference of the National Association of Attorneys General. It was also the ABA antitrust section conference. And I mentioned these, um, and there also was a CRA conference the week before in Brussels, and I mentioned these largely to say that there was a lot of opportunity for the new leadership at both the FTC and the DOJ Antitrust Division to give updates and to express their positions and what they hope to, to get done and, and update everyone they did. Um, so rather than talk about, you know, sort of the specific rundown of, of enforcement cases, I wanted to just highlight three particular aspects of antitrust policy that I think are important right now. One of which is um, the president's, President Biden's executive order on competition, the revision of the merger guidelines, and also the current view of merger remedies. Um, so we all recognize that antitrust is having a moment and that, that antitrust and competition law and policy are part of our national debate, perhaps you know, more significantly than any time since, you know, around when the Sherman Act and Clayton Act were first enacted more than a century ago. Congress is debating new laws and, and many people both inside and outside the competition agencies are calling for increased enforcement. From my point of view, the President Biden's executive order on competition that was issued last July may be one of the most significant tools for advancing competition goals and increasing competition that will benefit all Americans. The executive order, which someone in my office counted as imposing 72 obligations on 14 different federal agencies, acknowledges the importance of fair, open, and competitive marketplace 
and describes industry consolidation and weakened competition, competition across many markets as contributing to a host of ills that affect consumers, workers, farmers, and small businesses alike. The EO takes note that in addition to the traditional antitrust laws, Congress has also enacted over many years industry-specific fair competition and anti-monopolization laws enforced by other executive branch agencies. Examples of statutes that were called out in the executive order in need of updating and or increased enforcement included the Packards and Stockyards Act for agricultural markets, the Bank Merger Act, the Telecom Act, and the Shipping Act. The EO creates a whole of government approach to competition using advocacy, collaboration, and education as tools for interagency relationships. The EO also uh, creates a White House Competition Council that will coordinate, promote, and advance governmental efforts to address overconcentration, monopolization, and unfair competition that affects the American economy. Now, historically, we at the Antitrust Division have frequently worked with our federal and state partners to advocate for pro-competitive laws, rules, and regulations. But the EO is a game changer in requiring these, the federal agencies to place an emphasis on competition in addition to the public interest standards that they have used in their regulatory oversight. Our procurement, procurement collusion task force is a great example of an interagency effort. The PCSF is a multi-agency body tasked with detecting, investigating, prosecuting, and deterring antitrust crimes such as bid rigging and related fraudulent schemes. In just two years, they've trained over a thousand state and federal procurement officials. It's gonna be fascinating to see what can be built out of the executive order. We've already begun laying the groundwork by entering into new memorandums of understanding with federal, aid, federal agencies and talking to agencies about how competition works in their markets. In the long run, we hope to see regulation that supports competitive markets instead of inadvertently erecting entry barriers or raising the cost to participate in the market. We also hope to have sectoral regulators sensitive, sensitized to competitive competition effects in mergers in their industries. So in addition to the EO, another development I would like to mention is the project to modernize the merger guidelines. As many of you know, the merger guidelines play a critical role for because they provide for the public, the business, and courts a clear explanation of the standards by which the agencies evaluate transactions. In uh, this January, the FTC and DOJ launched a call for public comments to revise and strengthen the guidelines. So we've already gotten more than 400 comments so far. Comment period expires on, January, on April 21st, so you have another, yet another week to submit a comment and we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> I'm not gonna discuss what the timetable is for those guidelines, but I can tell you that our teams and the F teams at the FTC are working hard. So that is a watch this space uh, topic. So I'd like to turn now to the topic of innovation in mergers and about how the agencies, meaning the antitrust division and the Federal Trade Commission, and really I'm gonna be talking from my experience at the antitrust division, how the agencies evaluate innovation as a matter of competition between the company, between companies. In many mergers, innovation is a very important aspect of the competition between the merging parties. Innovation competition can be of particular concern in high tech industries where innovation is rapid and the industry is constantly evolving but innovation is also an, an issue in many not very high tech industries, an example of which I will discuss later. Focusing solely on competition between the parties on existing products would miss the big picture and the substantial breadth of innovation parties may bring to an industry. We often hear a defensive argument that merger in harmful near term effects should be permitted because it somehow unlocks innovation that would not be achieved organically or by contract. But we think it's even more important to think about the potential for harms to innovation and dynamic competition. The attorneys and economists in the antitrust division recognize that we need to be able to address a loss of competition, even if price effects 
are not predictable or quantifiable. Enhanced market power can be manifested in non-price terms and conditions that adversely affect consumers, including reduced product quality, reduced product variety, reduced service, or diminished innovation. It's harder to measure and predict these things than price effects, but it's an important part of our job to prevent these anti-competitive outcomes. There are many different ways to look at innovation competition. We can look at research and development activities that are primarily aimed at current lines of business where the parties overlap. Or we can examine innovation for the development of future lines of business that do not currently exist. For companies innovating to develop the next new product before their competitor, innovation competition looks a lot like competition to provide products at a lower price or higher quality. In those situations, we look to evidence that a merger will reduce the pressure to innovate. A good example of these types of merger challenges are the pharma mergers that are reviewed by the Federal Trade Commission. Other mergers may raise a different type of in innovation competition, which is the issues of the capacity of the merging companies to innovate that's not related to specific products. For, ex for example, the merging parties may be one, only the two firms or two of a small number of firms with a broad R&D program developing new products or solutions to meet evolving cust customer demands. The products in which they will compete in the future don't exist yet because of the inherent unpredictability of the innovation race in which they engage. Customers benefit from this competitive dynamic and we should not disregard anti-competitive effects in a transaction combining two innovative firms simply because we cannot pin those innovation efforts to a specific product. Uh, also, in addition to, to these two different types of innovation tied to a specific product or not tied to a, a specific product, we also should be concerned uh, with mergers that threaten to preserve market power or monopoly power by inhibiting or disincentivizing innovation. In many cases, dinner, disintermediation of a monopoly product will arise from an adjacent industry or another layer of a vertical supply chain. Mergers involving a firm already with monopoly power will transfer its incentive to preserve that monopoly to the acquired firm that otherwise would have been incented to engage in disruptive innovation. If you're interested in this particular type of, of, of issue, I really recommend Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Canner's recent speech on dominant firms building anti-competitive moats to protect their monopoly. So as, we, as will be discussed greater in this conference, many common tools in antitrust analysis are derived from static models of competition. We can adapt them to reflect some dynamic elements of an industry, but the framework that they use generally relies on some continuity of the market so that measures like past market shares have some clear relevance for future outcomes. But in an industry where the primary nexus of competition is a dynamic where firms win or lose successive waves of innovation development, static measures may miss dynamic harms. That does not mean that past performance will be irrelevant to the analysis, but the facts, are drawn, from, facts drawn from the past should be interpreted in light of the competitive model that's appropriate to a specific case. I'll talk in a, in a bit about the facts and analysis of two specific transactions reviewed by the antitrust division that demonstrate our approach to this type of dynamic competition between firms. In our investigations of these mergers, we heard from customers that they depend on innovation competition when seeking solutions and new technologies to resolve their problems and take their products to the next level. Customers value the competition on innovation because it can help them achieve solutions more quickly and multiple competitors innovating will give them different approaches in case one of them is ultimately unsuccessful. In addition, competition and innovation can lead to continual improvement. When one competitor introduces a new product, the other will react by developing competing improved technology, creating a cycle of leapfrogging technology. So to, I'd like to make this discussion a little more concrete by discuss, discussing two merger in, uh, investigations. Although these mergers took place a few years ago, and one is decidedly not a high-tech industries, 
industry. They provide good examples of the ways in which the antitrust division looks at mergers that affect the innovation capacity of the merging firms. I'd first like to discuss the proposed merger of Baker Hughes and Halliburton, which, uh, who were two of the big three competitors in oil field services. In that industry, Baker Hughes, Halliburton, and a th the third company, Schlumberger, were differentiated from other competitors based on their innovative capacity. At the time we challenged that transaction in 2016, over 90% of Halliburton's revenues derived from products and services that were also sold by Baker Hughes, the company it sought to acquire. The same was true for Baker Hughes. Over 90% of its revenues came from markets where it competed with Halliburton. We ultimately found 23 products and services where the murder, merger would cause a substantial lessening of competition. In many of those markets, the merger would have left just two dominant suppliers. But the, product, the problems with this merger went well beyond these 23 products and services. We found that the big three, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, and Schlumberger, drove innovation for these markets, often, often leading the way for developing next generation technology to solve the most challenging pro problems facing the oil and gas industry. The big three were often the only suppliers qualified to bid on the most challenging projects involving offshore wells or deep onshore wells where products must function in high temperatures and at high pressure. Customers had a number of concerns relating to, to innovation. The big three had been instrumental in working on new technologies for using new oil, oil extraction efforts. In some situations, only two of the three were interested in developing new technologies. Customers wanted more competitors available to help them resolve their problems because having different approaches makes success more likely. Customers believe that com the competitive back and forth between the big three over a number of years had increased the efficiency of various technology. And as the big three developed products to compete with one another's earlier developments, prices went down. I should emphasize the remedies question in when the agencies are evaluating transactions like this. The more we looked at this transaction, the more we, we became convinced that it was unfixable. The parties offered a fix that involved an array of piecemeal divestitures and various entanglements that they argued replaced all of the lost static competition. But the divestitures would have failed to maintain the competitive dynamic in the industry. Halliburton mostly would have kept the mo more successful product lines and sold assets related to the less successful product lines to a third party. Beyond that, and critical to innovation, Halliburton would have kept for itself critical company-wide assets and personnel that support those product lines because those were at common assets shared with other parts of Halliburton. They would have kept the infrastructure essential to making each firm successful and just sold off some pieces. Based on large part on the competition to innovate, we sought a full stop injunction to block the merger. The parties ultimately abandoned the transaction which preserved competition in this industry. The second transaction I'd like to talk about is the proposed merger, which is, uh, was in 2014 of Applied Materials and Tokyo Electron, uh, two of the world's largest providers of the tools that were used to manufacture semiconductor chips. The semiconductor chip industry is marked by exponential technological advancement, and each move to smaller transistor sizes required increasingly complex tools that implement the latest developments in precision materials science and engineering. Companies like Amit and Tell worked in partnership with semiconductor manufacturers to develop tools the manufacturers can use to make chips more powerful, faster, smaller, and more efficient. Often semiconductor manufacturers would identify a problem they're having and tool suppliers like Amit and Tell would present options to solve that problem. To be considered by semiconductor manufacturers, the tool producers needed experience in solving similar problems and a proven track record, as well as the ability to sustain significant investments in R&D. Not surprisingly, progressively fewer and fewer firms were able to complete, compete successfully to develop and manufacture leading edge semiconductor tools. Among those remaining in this industry were aim at Intel. And in some areas of specialization, they were in fact the only two viable options. Our investigation of that proposed transaction determined that the merger threatened to subject this vital component 
of the technological development process to a significant reduction in competition and possibly even monopolization. Like the Baker Hughes Halliburton investigation in Amit Tell, we identified a number of specific overlaps where the merging firms sold existing tools in competition with each other. For these tools, the merger would have eliminated the competition between the parties in areas where there were few, if any, competing alternatives. But had we stopped there, relying only on a static view of the competition between Amit and Tell, we would have missed the most crucial aspect of their competition. Instead, our investigation also found that the existing overlap between the specifically identified tools was emblematic of broader competition to develop new tools. Due to their extensive capabilities, Amit and Tell were well positioned, if not uniquely positioned, to develop new technologies and engineer tools to solve the, the industry's high value problems. Amit and Tell developed assets and built capabilities that gave them a vital lead over smaller competitors. They had technology building blocks that gave them a significant advantage in developing new, new tools to solve customers' problems. And they had both the engineering staffs and R&D facilities in place to develop the new tools, as well as the R&D budgets to take on more risky projects and persevere through setbacks. A less capable for, firm without these advantages potentially could have solved a high value problem, but it would take significantly more time to do it, would be significantly more costly, and it would face a lower probability of success. Cases like Baker Hughes Halliburton and Amit Tell show the ways in which the antitrust division has examined the process by which companies were innovating to determine whether the merger would, would, would lessen important innovation competition. I'd like to talk about two more issues that are common to challenging transactions and analyzing transactions like this, um, specifically uh, 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 transactions that are really based on innovation competition. First is the difficulty, and I'm sure this will come up in the merger panel, the difficulty in predicting the outcomes of innovation competition. The future is always uncertain, uncertain, but particularly when you're thinking about innovations that are yet to come. And this is an area that underscores that we should not require predictive certainty to challenge a possible competitive problem in its incipiency. Congress established the merger law with an incipiency standard because it wanted to prevent mergers with a reasonably probable loss of competition even if the specific effects are uncertain. Another issue, in addition to predicting the outcomes, is how to measure innovation ca capability. Um, there really are, are many different ways. Um, what um, we've used several times is looking at R&D expenditures, particularly as a, as a percentage of global revenue, also looking at patent counts of the two firms. Um, in Baker Hughes Halliburton, Schlumberger and Baker Hughes had a large, larger percentage of R&D spending than any of the other rivals. And Schlumberger and Halliburton had more patents over the last 20 years than smaller rivals. R&D spending can actually be tricky to rely upon because competitors have a lot of discretion in how they report the spending. They, can, they also report it differently to the antitrust agencies than they do in their public reporting. They may not track R&D expenditures by products and some R&D supports many different products. Also patent counts can be tricky because the patenting process is usually very lumpy. Firms may file many patents in one year and then none at all for a number of years despite the fact that they have conducted research every year. Um, in our, uh, in our complaint challenging the Baker Hughes Halliburton merger, which I recommend to use, especially for the pictures that we put in of the 23 different products at issue, um, we gave specific examples that highlighted the innovation competition between the companies. Um, I'd like to read just a short excerpt that I think is useful. Um, this is from our complaint challenging the merger. For example, a major extraction company procuring an integrated suite of completion equipment for wells in the ultra deep water Gulf of Mexico turned to the big three 
because those were the only firms with the technical capacity to meet the extreme temperature pressure and other conditions in, in these wells. Some of the products necessary to build these wells did not yet exist. And the company decided to pit, pit Halliburton and Baker Hughes against each other in a design challenge to create the best solution. Both Halliburton and Baker Hughes invested substantial resources in research and development to win this challenge, reducing the number of bidders from three to two, as the merger would have done, for these types of product, projects would represent a very significant, significant reduction in competition with the effects being especially acute for those projects where a customer needs to award contracts to two qualified suppliers. Real world examples of this head to head competition such as this are powerful in demonstrating the intensity of the innovation competition. So another issue raised by these transactions is, is as I discussed a little bit, is um, whether a remedy is possible. During the antitrust investigation of these two transactions I've discussed, the merging parties proposed divestitures that they argued would resolve the loss of competition by the merger. Both proposals raised significant issues since both had a high risk of failure and did not re replace the lost future competition to develop new solutions. In Amitel, a structural remedy would have been difficult to construct. Ultimately, the parties um, abandoned that merger after we informed them that the pros proposed remedy would not have replaced the competition eliminated, eliminated by the merger, particularly with respect to the development of equipment for next generation semiconductors. Likewise, in Baker Hughes Halliburton, we determined that the deal was unfixable. The fix offered by the parties would have involved numerous entanglements between the divestiture buyer and the parties and would have been complicated to administer and enforce. Important to the innovation competition, the parties would have retained the assets that allowed them to compete effectively as innovators. And there was no way to ensure that a divestiture buyer would be able to replicate the unique level of innovation the parties offered. The transaction, uh, as I said, was ultimately abandoned. So I talked earlier about the antitrust division's current initiatives to promote competition, specifically the president's executive order and the pending revisions of the merger guidelines. So I'd like to finish with a brief discussion of current thinkings on remedies in merger cases. The two cases I've discussed are good examples of transactions that could not be resolved with remedies. Increasingly, the agencies are asking whether transactions should be blocked instead of fixed in order to maintain the pre-merger level of competitions, competition. Um, some of the consideration that goes into those con conversations include how well the assets could be carved up and sold, especially in evolving markets, how well the buyer of those assets would make effective use of the assets, and also the overall complexity of the remedies, which can create difficulties in the, in the implementation and enforcement of the remedies. All of these considerations are leading to more merger challenges and increased merger litigation which in my mind is beneficial really for, for two main reasons. First, more merger challenges means more court opinions that interpret the merger laws. And that also uh, helps develop this important area of competition law. Also increased enforcement of anti-competitive merger can serve to deter illegal merger, the benefits of which resound to all of us. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the panels.
Well, welcome back. Um, for our next panel um, is on um, rulemaking. So um, I'll, I thought what I would start is just um, read to you from um, the Federal Trade Commission's Statement of Regulatory Priorities and the most recent Unified Agenda of Regulatory Actions. It says the case-by-case -case approach to promoting competition, while necessary, has proved insufficient, leaving behind a hyper-concentrated economy whose harms to American workers, consumers, and small businesses demand new approaches. Accordingly, the Commission in the coming year will consider developing both unfair methods of competition rulemakings, as well as rulemakings to define with specificity unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Um, similarly, um, our previous speaker, speaker mentioned the comp President Biden's competition executive order, and he encouraged the commission to consider rulemakings, again, through rulemaking regarding non-compete clauses, surveillance, pay for delay, pharmaceutical agreements, unfair competition in online marketplaces, occupational licensing, real estate listing, and brokerage, and more. So this distinguished panel um, will explore the legal and economic aspects of using rulemaking to define unfair methods of competition and unfair or deceptive acts or practices. Um, and I think it promises knowing the panelists to be both insightful and lively. We have four experts who will bring different perspectives on the FTC's rulemaking authority and, and different experiences. We'll begin with Maureen Olhausen, who chairs Baker Bot's Global Antitrust and Competition Practice. She has had a long career at the FTC, including as acting chairman and commissioner, where she directed all aspects of the FTC's antitrust work, including merger review and conduct enforcement, and she steered all FTC con consumer protection enforcement with a particular emphasis on privacy and technology issues. Howard Beals is Professor Emeritus of the GW School of Business and a senior scholar with the GW Regulatory Studies Center. From 2001 through 2004, he served as director of the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection, where he was instrumental in redirecting its privacy agenda to focus on the consequences of the use and misuse of consumer information. Earlier in his career, he served as a branch chief at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. And Howard, I think that's when we first met. Um, Richard Pierce is the Lyle T. Alverson Professor of Law at GW and author of over 20 books and 130 articles on administrative law, government regulation, and the effects of various forms of government intervention and in the performance of um, markets. His books and articles have been cited in hundreds of judicial opinions, including over a dozen by the Supreme Court. He's also a senior scholar with the Regulatory Studies Center. And if you look in today's Wall Street Journal, he has um, a letter to the editor. And um, finally, we will hear from Aurelien Portuais. And I'm sure I didn't pronounce that quite right, despite my I should be able to speak French better than that, is an expert in U.S. antitrust and EU competition law and economics, and he's director, of course, of ITAS, Schumpeter Project on Competition Policy, and an adjunct professor of law at the Global Antitrust Institute of George Mason University and at the Catholic University of Paris. What our plan for today is to have each speaker will make um, roughly 10 minutes of opening remarks, um, and then they will discuss things amongst themselves, and then we would love to open things up to um, the audience, both those of you present in the room and those of you who are joining us virtually. And I think it's up to me, unless, Arlene, did you do this talk about how to use Slido? Um, did you mention that? Yes. Anyway, I'll just um, remind, pe remind people um, that you can answer questions using slido.com. And this is the, the password, ITIF GW Antitrust. Just type in questions there. Um, and between the ITIF staff and me as moderator, we will pose them to our panelists. So with that, let me turn things over to Maureen. Great. Th thank you, Susan. Uh, thanks to um, ITIF and GW for, for having me. I'm delighted to be on this 
August panel um, to talk about one of my, my favorite topics, the FTC. Um, and I'm going to focus my remarks on FTC unfair methods of competition rulemaking. Um, right now, we believe, you know, we've been sort of given the sign that the FTC is very, very interested in this. Susan mentioned some remarks, and a lot of this is based on a, a law review article or an article that uh, current Chair Khan did on FTC UMC rulemaking, claiming that the FTC has this broad authority uh, and that it can sort of just run down the road. It, it has, for some reason, not really used this, and it can run down the road and it can be a much more efficient and effective way to, uh, to uh, change behavior in the economy and a competitive behavior or broader behavior than that, because it's also tied with this idea of an unfair method of competition. Um, who knows really what that is? Um, the FTC had a statement on that, that the new chair and her colleagues rescinded last summer. So it's kind of this broad open um, road that they see ahead of them. Um, I personally think that that road is a dead end. Um, uh, and so I have an article with, with that name called Dead End Road. But so just to give you an, a little background. So the FTC has unfair methods of competition um, authority. It was in its original statute. And it was given the tools to do case by case enforcement as a body of experts to bring forward this idea of, OK, what what to give some content to that. Um, so the FTC proceeded that way for many, many, many years and then Later on in the, like, I guess, 1960s, early 70s, it decided it wanted to try to do a rulemaking um, based on, uh, well, first they did this one on uh, tailored men's and boys' clothes, which actually was under the, was not under just pure um, UMC. That was actually Clayton Act. That sort of got overtaken, uh, taken by events. So it then had this other, and it was never enforced um, and was eventually rescinded. But they brought this other rule called the, um, um, the Octane Rule, and they did it as a joint unfair methods of competition and unfair and deceptive acts or practices rulemaking. Uh, to require that octane ratings be posted on fuel pumps. Scott appealed, uh, the DC circuit issued an opinion that ha it had this sort of uh, grand embrace of rulemaking overall as this great tool. Like it, it essentially adopted the approach of, well, the statute didn't say you couldn't, right? So therefore you can, there was this small provision in there that said the FTC could you know, promulgate rules, but it, wa it wasn't in its main section. It was more about how it does um, other, other matters. So using that, it's called 6G, um, the FTC had claimed, okay, it had this broad rulemaking. The DC Circuit opinion comes out um, in petroleum refiners. Then Congress steps in and acts the MAGMOS Act, which gives the FTC clear authority under unfair deceptive acts or practices to promulgate rules and says we take essentially take no position it says it says this doesn't affect any rulemaking authority for unfair methods of competition so chair khan's view is that that means it preserved this right that therefore that right is there i personally think it means it took no position on it um and that as we've seen um and the FTC never thereafter tried to promulgate an unfair method of competition rule using that authority. So fast forward to today, the FTC wants to try to do this, but we see that the um, interpretation, statutory interpretation uh, methods have changed greatly. So the uh, we look at something like the AMG case where the Supreme Court unanimously um, overturned a long exercise power of the FTC to get monetary redress uh, in, in court. Um, and the court gave a very you know, careful read of not just the language, but how it works into the statutory scheme, um, where it fits you know, more broadly, and unanimously said the FTC doesn't have this authority. So taking the type of interpretation that was done on unfair methods of competition in that old DC circuit case and trying to apply it today, I think is going to run into just a very different environment. Um, so I personally think that they don't, they don't have this authority, um, that if they try to move forward with it, they will probably lose, particularly because um, a lot of challenges will be brought. 
One of the other things that in this the subject of my dead end road article is I looked at well what actually happened to that rule? What actually happened to the octane rule itself, which was the 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 basis of the DC Circuit opinion? So we had the Mag Moss Act, right? That that gave the FTC clear, unfair, and deceptive acts or practices rulemaking, but with a lot of regulatory guardrails, not just notice and comment APA rulemaking, because that's the other part of this that the chair believes that she has, just straightforward notice and comment, get a rule through really quickly type of rulemaking under unfair methods of competition. Well, when you look at what happened after the Mag Moss Act to that octane rule, Congress actually took that rule and adopted it as a statute. And the FTC, and so it's exactly the same rule as the octane rule, which required this posting of octane ratings. And the FTC actually asked for unfair methods of competition rulemaking authority per, to promulg, to, you know, to uh, basically give form to that rule. And Congress did not give it to them. Congress gave them unfair and deceptive acts or practices authority with extra guardrails in place. So I think when you put all of that together, the idea that the FTC somehow, through all of this murkiness and you know congressional action not embracing UMC, ends up with clear UMC authority to do these rules, I think is very very um, unlikely. Now some people might say, well, what's the risk? What, you know, why not go down that road and see and see what happens? But you know, we live in a world of limited resources. So if the FTC is going down this route, it means it's not bringing case-by-case -case enforcement, which is how the FTC was really set up by Congress to move antitrust law forward. The FTC has, I think, done a good job using its case-by-case -case enforcement to um, bring antitrust law forward to help develop it. I would point to several Supreme Court victories involving the state action doctrine, pay for delay. There's other, there's other issues, cases. Howard was probably, you know, Indiana Federation of Dentists. I don't know if uh, anyone wants to talk about that, but I think the FTC has used those tools. And one of the really important things to look at there is because it did it under an interpretation of unfair methods of competition, um, that was coterminous with the Sherman Act, it means that other antitrust enforcers can also use this precedent to bring enforcement actions to, to, to discipline the market. So if the FTC goes down this road of unfair methods of competition rulemaking that's unmoored from that limit of unfair methods as tied to the rest of the antitrust laws, you end up creating this new body of law that essentially only the FTC can enforce because only the FTC enforces the FTC Act. So I, I see um, you know, a host of uh, sort of landmines there that I think ultimately could hurt the agency. When we looked at what happened when the FTC last won on a big rulemaking spree, the agency barely survived. Uh, and then secondly, there is that opportunity cost that it's not bringing these kinds of cases where it has actually benefited not just consumers, in you know those markets in which it's acted, but also antitrust law more broadly. Um, so I will stop there um, and turn it over to whoever six. Thank you. So how are we next? We'll hear from you. All right. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Susan. It's, uh, it's well, thank thank you both. It's a it's a pleasure to be here today and have my microphone working. Um, uh, I just want to note uh, at at the beginning, you know, the FTC did start asserting rulemaking authority in nineteen sixties. Uh, one of the most prominent rules was the cigarette rule. It was the first health warnings on uh, cigarette um, labels and advertising until Congress preempted it. Um, but it was a very different kind of rule uh, than uh, FTC's current consumer protection rules. Uh, the commission envisioned those rules as something that would resolve legal issues, uh, but they would be enforced through an administrative remedy uh, an administrative proceeding where the only sanction was a cease and desist order. Now that's very different from today's consumer protection rules that are civil penalty rules, uh, where there's a great deal more at stake. And the commission specifically noted when it uh, claimed rulemaking authority, uh, that there would be an opportunity for a violator to argue that the rule shouldn't be applied in their particular case. Uh, and the D.C. Circuit, when it upheld 6G authority, specifically cited that language uh, about the right to uh, contest whether the rule actually applied in a particular case. There's always been concern about FTC rulemaking because of the breadth of its discretion. 
And when Congress codified in 1974 uh, rulemaking authority for unfair and deceptive practices, it used procedural requirements to try to cabin that, um, di that discretion. Uh, it sought to enhance the role of reasoned decision making uh, in the process, and it sought to expand the opportunities for public input uh, into the process. Um, the result was a rulemaking binge. Uh, in the first year of statutory authority, the commission issued 16 proposals. Um, only five survived, uh, and the five that survived were shadows of the original proposal uh, by the time they actually got through the process. From my perspective, the process did its job. Uh, it prevented a lot of really bad ideas um, in those original 16 proposals uh, from becoming law. Um, in July last year, uh, the commission decided it would change the way it goes about making rules. Uh, it was adopted a new set of rules for rulemaking um, on a three to two vote with no public input uh, and with no input from most of its career staff. Uh, this was something drafted in commissioner's offices, it, it would appear. The rationale that's offered is expediency. Uh, they're allegedly removing onerous procedures adopted in the Reagan administration to curtail rulemaking. Uh, and they pay no attention at all to the effects of changes on the quality of the record that results or the quality of the commission's ultimate decisions, which would seem to be the real question. And there's two problems with the uh, remove Reagan administration restrictions. One is the rules were all in place before anybody from the Reagan administration got to the FTC. Uh, and second, in every rulemaking since 1976, the commission has adopted alternative procedures rather than to follow the procedures the way they're laid out and the rules the commission's modified. Uh, so, you know, together what they've done is a recipe for more political control of rulemaking uh, and less public input uh, in the process. Let me highlight a few of the key changes. One of them is, is less explanation. And this is just frankly inconsistent with the statute. When the original statute required the commission to explain its reasons for a proposed rule with particularity. Um, in the 1980 Improvements Act, Congress wanted two more things to be explained with particularity. It wanted the text of a proposed rule uh, to be stated specifically, because in Children's Advertising, the Commission didn't bother with that little detail. Um, and it wanted the uh, uh, particularity about alternatives under consideration. The Commission in July read that as repealing the requirement to explain the reasons for the rule with particularity. Uh, they just eliminated that. Just any statement of reasons will do. And one of the problems with that is that a part of the, uh, I mean, the particularity requirement wasn't enough. Um, every assessment of the early, uh, of the late 70s, early 80s rulemaking has said the commission didn't explain itself well enough. There was too much in dispute and no clear theory about what mattered and what evidence was important. And so the process just, just diverged. Uh, so less explanation is going to make things worse, uh, uh, not, not better. The second key change is the role of presiding officers. In the 70s rulemakings, the staff that were working on these rules often developed a real commitment to the proposal. Uh, by 1980, this is the Carter Administration Commission, uh, the, there was a consensus at the commission that it should rely more on the presiding officers who oversaw the hearings as a check on staff, um, staff commitment uh, uh, to a rule. Um, the 1980 Improvements Act essentially codified that. It required a chief, an independent presiding officer who reports only to the chief presiding officer. And the rule changes in July said, well, okay, the chief presiding officer is now the chair. Uh, okay, now there's some real independence for you. Um, uh, the, the chair will serve as the presiding officer and make an independent report or appoint somebody else to do it. The act also requires an in, uh, uh, the, the presiding officer issue a recommended decision that is, quote, based on the, fi the findings and conclusions of such officer as to all relevant and material evidence. The rules purport to limit that report, uh, inconsistent with the statute again. Uh, the presiding officer is only supposed to address the questions the, the commission specifically asked. Apparently, if evidence is undisputed, it's to be ignored. Uh, rather than weighed against things that are, in fact, in dispute. A uh, third change is has to do with designated issues. Now, under Magnuson-Moss procedures, um, there is a right to rebuttal 
and cross-examination if there is a disputed issue of material fact that it's necessary to resolve. And that's a designated issue. Um, the process never really worked the way it was envisioned. It was supposed to be something to narrow the issues that were in dispute as the proceeding went on because, okay, there's only a few disputed issues that we really need to resolve. So let's focus cross-examination and rebuttals on those key issues. Never worked that way because presiding officers in the commission ended up saying, well, okay, you can cross-examine about anything just subject to time limits because we can't quite figure out how to limit this by substance. <clears throat> Under the new rules, the commission itself is going to designate issues. In the notice of proposed rulemaking, before anybody outside the commission has actually seen the proposal. Um, now, that's probably not going to work. Uh, in the commission's most rulemake, recent rulemaking venture, some of more or less starting from scratch, the business opportunity rule, the key issue turned out to be how should this rule apply to multi-level marketers? Um, the, the Herbal Life's and Mary Kay Cosmetics of the world. Um, the commission didn't see that question. They didn't see that as an issue at all. Uh, they missed it entirely because they thought the rule wouldn't cover them. They didn't mean for the rule to cover them, but the key issue was something the commission missed. Uh, okay, the public comment quickly brought out the commission issued a new proposal. They ended up with a reasonable business opportunities rule. Um, uh, but, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the commission designating up front the issues is not likely to work. There was one time when the commission reserved for itself the right to, dis to, to designate issues, children's advertising. It never did. Uh, it was caught up by the political controversy in part, but the commission never got around to designating issues. The presiding officer recommended three issues. Staff and parties recommended other issues, and the commission never decided. That's hardly a speedier rulemaking uh, process. Fourth change is the staff report. Uh, at the end of a rulemaking proceeding, the staff has always uh, written a detailed report about the rulemaking record. You know, what's the evidence? Who participated? What did they say? What's the evidence show? What do we think about the evidence? What's our recommended rule? Presiding officer issues a similar report. Both reports are subject to public comment. All right. The commission eliminated the staff report entirely. All right, the, the, the summary of the record and what, what people think the record says is going to be entirely up to private communications uh, between commissioners and the staff. Uh, nothing on the public record uh, about that at all until the, the, the rule is, uh, uh, until the rule is actually adopted. Uh, and there's no public comment opportunity on the presiding officer's report either. They couldn't do away with the presiding officer's report because that's specified in the statute. So they tried to narrow it and say, and nobody can talk about it. Uh, okay, no public comment on the uh, on that process. Last change I want to highlight is the ex parte rules. Um, uh, talking to commissioners, um, uh, sort of not on the record, if you will. Um, commissions always distinguish between timely communications and not timely communications. Uh, and if the communication is within a comment period, it becomes part of the rulemaking record. Now, the rulemaking record is important in Magnus and Moss, and it's a distinction a lot of agencies don't have, because the commission's decision has to be based on the rulemaking record taken as a whole. So if it's in the rulemaking record, it sort of has to be considered. You can dismiss it, but you have to consider it. You have to, you have to think about it. Um, the, the, now the distinction is gone. Um, all ex parte communications uh, will become part of the rulemaking record. So if you can get a commission, a meeting with a commissioner after the record is closed, you can submit new evidence to that commissioner. Um, uh, no one else will have an opportunity to comment on that evidence, and it will become part of the rulemaking record. Uh, that seems deeply problematic. Um, it would be, in effect, a back channel to provide new information to commissioners without allowing public comment. Um, and actually, it was, you know, the, the, the rule that was changed here stems again from the 1980 Improvements Act, uh, when Congress specifically required the commission to have a rule about ex parte communications with its staff. And in the public comment period on that rule, um, notice they used to have public comments on their rules. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, it was proposed that all communications with commissioners should go on the rulemaking record. 
Um, the Perchuk Commission, the Carter Administration Commission, rejected that idea. They said that would create a privileged status for meetings between commissioners and outside parties. And that's exactly what the current commission has done. So this is a recipe for more political control, less public input, probably slower rulemakings, although that remains to be seen. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I look forward to comments. Thanks, Susan. Um, so I want to start just by saying a little bit about who Lena Khan is and what her views are. Uh, because I think it's important to understand what she wants to do with the rulemaking power, not just uh, uh, wh whether they have the rulemaking power and what procedures they have to use. Uh, uh, um, she is a, uh, a prolific young scholar um, who has published in many of the, at the top line uh, law reviews she is not bashful about uh, uh, sharing her views, and her views are pretty easy to generalize. Uh, I, I don't think there's a single feature of our current antitrust law that she doesn't hate. I mean, she, she just really goes through and, and rips it apart. Uh, and you know, you can agree or disagree with her, but there, there, there's no question what she wants is to change everything. Uh, um, in, in really massive ways. Uh, and, and she wants to use the rulemaking process to, to accomplish that. Um, so uh, let, let me back go back to the sequence of actions in 73 and 75 that both Maureen and Howard have, have, have referred to. Uh, just review those. 73, the DC Circuit issues this then quite surprising opinion that says for the first time that the FTC has the power to uh, issue legislative rules. That's the rules that are that have legally binding effect. Uh, uh, and that it can do so using the notice and comment process. Well, the notice and comment process is pretty demanding, actually, and time consuming. But you can complete a, a notice and comment rulemaking in, in, in one to three years uh, uh, pretty well. Um, so 1975, Congress passes the Magnuson Moss Act, and uh, it, it has about, I think I counted 18 mandatory procedures to the, the straight notice and comment uh, 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 procedure. And uh, as, as Howard mentioned, that caused the FTC to give up most of its uh, rulemaking uh, efforts uh, uh, for, for good reason. Uh, the the Estimated average duration of a rulemaking under Magnuson Moss is somewhere in excess of eight years. And uh, so that just doesn't make any sense. You have to commit tremendous resources to it. Uh, well, what, what Chair Khan has done is, is two different things. Uh, one thing she's done is she's issued all of these uh, um, guidelines that Howard described nicely uh, that are designed to streamline the Magnuson Moss rulemaking process and, and, and make it possible for the FTC to use it and get a rule out in less than eight years. Uh, uh, um, and, and I agree completely with, with Howard. Uh, I, I'm extremely skeptical that they will be effective and there's a very good chance that they'll backfire and, and uh, uh, make it much, much harder for the FTC to defend whatever output they have from that process. And, and I think that, that the commission would be foolish to go down that road at all uh, uh, because it is so unpromising. Um, uh, but the other thing she did this, at the same time is say, well, a lot of people have misinterpreted the scope of the Magnuson Moss Act. And so she refers to this, this one provision of Magnuson Moss that, that uh, uh, Ma Maureen referred to that is I must say, I've read a lot of statutes and, and, and a lot of weird stuff. Uh, this is the most bewildering language I've ever seen. I have no idea what Congress intended, actually. She believes that Congress intended to say the Magnuson Moss process applies only when FTC is issuing a rule to define an unfair act, whereas the straight rule notice and comment process is to be done much more quickly and with 
fewer resources, uh, that that still applies to um, any uh, attempt to use rulemaking to define an unfair method of competition. Uh, well, I, I share Maureen's skepticism that that uh, view will prevail in, in, in court. I, I, I share her um, uh, skepticism that the Supreme Court today would uphold the 1973 D.C. Circuit opinion that got us started down this, this track because the D.C. Circuit used a method of statutory interpretation that no court has used in the last oh, 20 years or so, and the Supreme Court has never embraced. Um, and I uh, share Maureen's skepticism that this really strangely worded provision uh, has the effect of carving out unfair methods of competition and saying it's just fine to use straight notice and comment rulemaking to define uh, unfair methods of competition. But I cannot say with certainty that that will be the result uh, if and when that those legal propositions are, 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 are tested. Uh, I, I think there is a chance that her views would prevail in that. So what I did was uh, uh, I, I, I tried to test the viability, likely viability of her plan by imagining four hypothetical rulemakings. Uh, now, as I said, she, she wants to change everything. Uh, and so I just identified uh, four contexts where she had been quite explicit in saying she, she, she wanted to use rulemaking to change the law, to make the law completely different uh, under the, the uh, rubric of unfair methods of competition than it is under any of the antitrust laws. And uh, so I, I, the, the three I looked at were, um, she'd like to, to use rulemaking to create a, a right to repair your own product or have an independent service provider repair your product. She'd like to use rulemaking to change the definition of predatory pricing. She absolutely despises the Supreme Court's definition, which includes that you, you have to show, the, 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 the agency or plaintiff uh, has, has to show that the uh, company has a reasonable prospect of recouping the losses that they intentionally incur. Uh, and, and she thinks that's just horrible. And so she'd like to uh, issue a rule that redefines predatory pricing um, uh, to, to eliminate that requirement and say that uh, uh, under, under the rubric of, well, that, that's an unfair method of, of competition. Uh, and then she would like to um, issue a rule that makes it at least presumptively illegal to um, have a reverse payment uh, settlement of a dispute between a manufacturer of a prescription drug and a prospective manufacturer of a generic equivalent of the prescription judge drug. Um, and, and so I go through each of these, these three, and, and I wind up concluding there is no chance, zero, zero chance that she, she could ever get the courts to uphold these. And, and the reasons are quite simple. The, the Supreme Court, in, in most cases, unanimously, this is not one where, I mean, you know, everybody talks about Bob Bork, the evil person, and thank God for Steve Breyer. Steve Breyer was with Bob Bork 100% of the way when, when Steve Breyer taught antitrust at Harvard and wrote an antitrust. You'll find all the same views in his, okay? And, and, and you'll see 9 0. Supreme Court opinions in many of these contexts say, no, no, we don't believe this. Now, what she thinks is, uh, since it's a different statute, it's got different language, unfair methods of competition versus the language of all the various uh, uh, antitrust statutes, she thinks that she can sell it to the courts by saying, different statute, different outcome. Uh, well, what shows that the, that the folly of that, that view best is, the sequence of decisions defining predatory pricing. Because initially, uh, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court was dealing with a bizarre 1960 uh, precedent that, that basically said, anytime anybody cuts their prices, it's predatory. Uh, that was really strange. But, but in, in any event, the Supreme Court looked at that initially uh, under the Sherman Act and said, um, no. 
That's nuts. Uh, and, and came up with a new test. And the new test clearly requires that, that uh, the plaintiff or, or, or uh, enforcement agency has to prove uh, a reasonable prospect of, uh, that the defendant can recoup its losses in the post predation period. Uh, and so she thinks um, she can come in and say, well, yeah, but that was under the Sherman Act. Uh, this, this statute is different. It's unfair. And what people tried to do, plaintiffs tried to do in the wake of the Supreme Court decision that announced that test was file their actions, not under the Sherman Act, but under the statute that was the basis for that bizarre 1960 precedent. And so they'd go into court and people would cite the Supreme Court opinion on the Sherman Act. And then they say, irrelevant, irrelevant. That's not the, the act we're talking about. The only precedent under this is, and what the Supreme Court is, is get out of my face. I couldn't care less that there, you know, this is, this is the, the subtle difference in the language. Who cares? This is the test. This is it. This, okay. And, and it's the same is true in the other three contexts. And, and, and so there is zero chance that she can change antitrust law uh, through this method. Now, the fourth case, though, that I looked at uh, hypothetically is suppose they, uh, FTC used notice and comment rulemaking to issue a rule that says you cannot include non-compete clauses in contracts, employment contracts applicable to uh, low-wage employees. Okay, uh, as uh, I'm sure many of you know, uh, that that non-compete clauses used to be used only in certain narrow circumstances. Now they become, I mean, to be a hamburger flipper. If, if you want to change jobs for, from one uh, hamburger flipper employer to another, you can't do it because of the non the, the, the non compete clause in the, in the employment uh, uh, contract. And uh, suppose they they uh, use the, the uh, uh, notice and comment process to issue a rule uh, that says you can't use non include non compete clauses in low wage contracts. Uh, I think that that would be upheld assuming they have the power to use notice and comment rulemaking at all. The difference is really dramatic. It's always been illegal to have a non-compete clause unless you've got certain justifications. There's no possibility that a firm that hires hamburger flippers can come up with any justification for it whatsoever that fits with The only reason that there's not been any real law uh, created on this is that the enforcement agencies long ago concluded that uh, they could rely safely on state labor law as a means of keeping these clauses in, confined to their appropriate. And, and what we now know is that has not worked at all. Okay, so uh, I, I think that they, they survived that. Now, I still think that they'd be better off using their traditional combination of tools, interpretative rules, policy statements, and strategically selected enforcement actions I think it would be more effective, uh, quicker, and, and it avoids the risk that at the end of the process, they'd be told, you don't have this power a, at all. But I have to say, I was I found compelling Bill Kovacic, my, my friend and colleague's uh, uh, argument the other day, that this might be a good context to test uh, whether they actually have that, that power. So it's a, a flip side to that, that uh, argument. Uh, now, the, I just want to close with one point that... Um, while I don't think there's any way in the world that uh, the FTC under Chair Khan can make the kind of dramatic changes in, in antitrust law that she would like to make, uh, I think there's plenty of room for her to join hands with a whole lot of mainstream uh, 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 legal scholars and economic scholars who see flaws, particular flaws in our uh, antitrust system, gaps and now, let me just give you one illustration. Uh, when, when the Supreme Court rejected unequivocally the FTC's attempt to uh, get them to announce that there was that all of these reverse payment settlements uh, were presumptively illegal. Okay, nine justices said no to that. Okay? Uh, the five justice majority opinion, written by Steve Breyer, by the way, uh, uh, says no. You, you have to apply rule of reason. Here's the problem with that. Uh, I, I just read uh, an opinion. It was at, well, it was issued in 2021 uh, by a circuit court in which the court said, we conclude 
uh, after all the motions and trials, et cetera, et cetera, through application of the rule and reason that this reverse settlement payment was, the, the settlement was preposterously high, that this was nothing but a thinly disguised agreement not to compete and to share the, the, the uh, uh, gains of the monopoly market. Here's the problem. That opinion was issued in 2021. The generic, uh, what, what they attempted to market the generic in 2006. So 15 years later, we find out that what they did was anti-competitive and illegal. We gotta do something to streamline the application of the rule of reason. Uh, and there's, that's just one illustration of a lot of areas in which you know, it's easy to find incremental improvements in antitrust law that can be made uh, in the direction, the general direction that Chair Khan wants to go uh, to. And I, I've just been hoping that that's the direction that DOJ and FTC uh, choose. Only you weren't so shy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I right. did not use the F word once. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you so much. That's a terrific transition because um, I think I want to step back for a moment and think why they want to engage in, in, in rulemaking. I think we are in a, in a, in a trade-off here between regulation and adjudication, as Maureen referred to the opportunity cost. You cannot do everything with ex unlimited resources. So there's a fundamental trade-off between regulation, you, pro you preserve competition through antitrust enforcement, judicial enforcement, or through regulation. And I think the main reason they want to go for uh, regulation of competition is the transformational shift from exposed antitrust enforcement to ex ante rules of regulation. And that, referring to the 2015 statement, is in itself an attack on the rule of reason. Just to uh, so, I think the current uh, um, chair and the current majority, uh, which is not the majority yet uh, at the FTC, um, is against the rule of reason. And by being against the rule of reason, you're against the judicial balancing, the judicial reasoning, and thereby you're against the efficiencies defense that you can bring in court. Uh, that's the fundamental issue. You, they want regulation in order to impose per se rules of illegality so that you can impose per se rules of legality and get away with a rule reason which inherently integrate efficiency defense or innovation defense, things like that. And the only understanding we can have is just perhaps to paraphrase Justice Stewart in the 70s when he said that the only coherence we can see is that the governments always win. The thing with adjudication is that you may lose. The government may lose, the plaintiff may win. With regulation, you always win. And, and, and I think that's the, that's the major, uh, major uh, drive behind regulation. The thing that you don't have to spend all these 15 years or 10 years, which I totally agree, sometimes it's just too long. So we have to find ways to streamline the judicial process while using the rule of reason, right? We can quicken the pro judicial process while using the rule of reason. What they want to do is to take antitrust away from the courts. And I refer to that because that's the title of uh, uh, Roosevelt Institute report, which said taking antitrust away from the courts. So it, it is more than just some rulemaking, and we can go, go into this section 6G and the uh, arcane of the FTC Act. The, the philosophical and fundamental shift is an attack on not only the courts, the judicial process, the evolutionary perspective of how antitrust has, has worked for a century, and more specifically, it's an attack on the rule of reason and any efficiency defense and then thereby an attack on the economic analysis of antitrust laws. So that's the, the rational. So just to echo uh, what Maureen uh, said, I think they don't have the authority, even if you, if you, uh, if you argue in that sense. Why? Uh, it's very hard to interpret the uh, Federal Trade Commission Act of 1914, but I think one way to interpret it is precisely to look at the legislative history. And one proponent of the FTC Act 
was basically President Wilson in 1912. And President Wilson, when he suggested the uh, creation of a commission uh, to, to Congress, he basically said that we need a commission first to help the antitrust division in the Department of Justice. So it was an assistance to the enforcement. So like, let's have some experts because the, the antitrust division is going to be overwhelmed. So he, he foresaw, foresaw that. But also, he see that as a clearing house. And I use clearing house because that's, that's exactly his word. As a, as a matter of information and publicity, we, he said we need experts to publicize unfair method of competition, to publish it, to make reports. And recently, the FTC has made a report about ICP providers, which is totally fine, uh, about past acquisitions by large tech companies. That's totally fine. It's about informing the public. It's about having a participatory process, thereby the businesses can have greater certainty, and also enforcers can just perhaps identify it incipient practices that are potentially anti-competitive. So it's a publicity, information sharing, and knowledge sharing institutions, mostly, aside having a judicial enforcement uh, uh, aspect, uh, which is to help the antitrust division. So that's the key thing. And if you look at the history, uh, legislative history, what does the Supreme Court say? Well, right after the passing of the 1914 FTC Act, we have one decision from the Supreme Court, which basically said, what is it about Section 5? The Section 5 unfair method of competition, the Supreme Court said that clearly it is for the courts, not for the commission, to define what is unfair method of competition. So it is that clear. It's the, Grat, the FTC versus Gratz case of 1920, where the Supreme Court has unequivocally said that it is for the courts, not the commission, to define unfair method of competition. But if you start from that, and we don't have other Supreme Court because the 19, uh, 1973 National Petroleum Court is a DC Circuit Court, so we don't have any other decisions from the, uh, from the Supreme Court. If you, if you start from that, then it means that there is no rulemaking authority in terms of substantive rulemaking authority. There is the ability for the FTC to interpret and to make sure that they can tackle unfair methods of competition through prosecutions. That's the interpretive rules or procedural rules. But there's no ability to issue unfair methods of, to issue orders defining uh, unfair methods of competition. So it is very unlikely that they have so, but as you just said, Richard, maybe perhaps a good, uh, a good occasion to clarify uh, the fact that they lack uh, unfair methods of competition we'll see in many years in the court. But should they engage in unfair methods of competition, right? What would be the economic consequence? What, what is the economic rationale? I just said that it's a, it's a disregard for the rule of reason and, of course, for efficiency considerations. But I think the more fundamental analysis, and if you look at what the so-called neobrandisms have said and from the House report where they called for U.S. antitrust laws to mimic European competition law with abuse of domain positions with, uh, you, you ha also have the New York antitrust bills which precisely want to integrate uh, European competition rules um, and, and approach to US antitrust. I think the fundamental discussion here is uh, going for ex ante rule of competition where you have antitrust which is no longer a judicial enforcement tool but an administrative, administrative tool such as it is the case in Europe. And, and the thing, what they, what, they, what they want with the rulemaking is precisely to mimic these rules of the games, these do's and don'ts, which is precisely uh, made clear in the current Digital Market Act by uh, the European Commission. The idea is to not pursue, not prosecute, not adjudicate anymore, but to have exempted rules so that you just regulate entire sectors of the economy, or in Europe, the digital uh, market, but what is digital? Every company has a digital channel now to reach uh, consumers to to identify these exempted rules so that you just give up on adjudicating and you find you break up uh, companies in a in a in a, in a very timely uh, manner. So the at the end of the day, it is very much mimicking the exempted 
approach that is already taking place in Europe with the, with the Digital uh, Market Act and the idea to not use the court system anymore so that you can impose fine quickly with some time, um, uh, uh, the, the, the aspect of a fair trial that can be contested because there's, uh, of course, a conflict of interest by prosecuting and being also one side of the, of the, of the jury. And, uh, and that is very fundamental. I think we have to acknowledge that it is about also aligning U.S. antitrust law to what is uh, EU corruption rules and the administrative process and the shift for ex ante rules of competition. And, and it, there will be a massively unintended consequences in a sense that we will uh, prohibit some time, some pro-competitive rules. You just say non-compete clause. Well, non-compete clause are prohibited for centuries from the English common law. From the first case, first known case, it's 1414, the case of John Doyer, when precisely there was a, a dyer from a hairdresser going to, uh, uh, leaving this hairdresser going, uh, wanted to open up its own shop. And this was prohibited from the non-compete clause. And English courts just said, no, we, we, this is unreasonable. So the English common law and the, and the evolutionary process of the law is precisely defining what is reasonable and what is not reasonable, this balancing exercise. And with regulation, with ex ante rules of per se illegality, it's not about re reasonableness anymore. It's not about this proportionality agreement. It's just blanket preemptive rules of illegality. And of course, the net may be too wide. It will just catch up a lot of pro-competitive and pro-innovative conduct. We already had that. We already had that in, in, in the US. Uh, if you look at the robinson Patman Act in 1936, you have a wide range of practices that are very clear, but just almost unenforceable because a lot of these obligations and prohibitions are pro-competitive, pro such as price discrimination, for example. If you want to have lower price for students or for families, yeah, that's good uh, for competition, for innovation. You just target better your customers. And that's why the robinson patman Act as an exemptive rules of competitions is virtually and enforceable. And that is perhaps what they want to do with these ex ante rules of competition, uh, even though they don't have a mandate according to the FTC um, uh, Act and also according to uh, the Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence. Well, thank you, panelists. That was um, great. And I actually, I've got a couple questions. I know people in the audience here, and we already have one virtual question. But first, let me give you an opportunity to um, comment on what each other have said. And our re retiring flower on the end, <laughs> D D Professor Pierce. <laughs> so um, I, I noticed that Lena Khan is not here, and none of her disciples are here. And so, so I, I, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes doing what is partially an expression of my views and partly a devil's advocate because I think it's important for people to understand where she's coming from because she her views are very widely shared. In fact, there are a lot of there are a lot of Republican politicians who share her views. So it's important to understand them. Okay. But first of all, ex ante rules, uh, I'm all for ex ante rules as long as you're absolutely sure that they produce net benefits. And I'll give you an illustration of one we got right now. Uh, horizontal minimum price fixing is per se uh, unlawful. That's an ex ante rule. Uh, and there may be circumstances in which it, that rule has bad effects, but since it, it has good effects in the vast majority of circumstances, I'm all for that ex ante rule. Now, here, here's the problem, the, the definition of net benefits. I tend to define them, and since for the last 50 years, the Supreme Court has defined them uh, in economic terms. Uh, and so we've gone to the economics literature to try and figure out uh, the answer to the question of are there net benefits? Well, if you look at the legislative history of every antitrust statute, what you find is, yeah, there were some people who thought that way and enacted the statutes because they, 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 they actually read some economics most of them didn't. Most of them were really concerned about sociological and political uh, 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 effects. 
And that's where a lot of this is coming from. And if you if you take a net benefits approach and you and you throw in things like I strongly favor small business and giving people lots of opportunities to grow, create, and and thrive as small business people. And I really don't like it when there's half a dozen firms that have massive private political power to say, for instance, Donald Trump doesn't get a, a, a voice. This, you know, Joe Biden does. Okay, uh, if you define it that way, then it it gets it gets to be a more complicated question. Uh, and I, I don't want to do that. I, I see a lot of these other non-economic problems, and, and I keep saying, well leave them to be addressed by other areas of law. we got enough of a complicated mess in antitrust law. We don't need all this heaped on top of it to make it. But I, I, I think it's important to understand that's a lot of where they're coming from. And there's a lot of members of the public uh, with, with, with widely varying ideological views who share that perspective. Thank you, Dick. Anybody else have that was actually going to be one of my questions is, would people be a devil's advocate? But other comments on each other? I, I just had one brief comment. I, I, I think Magnuson Law's procedures for rulemaking are workable if you do it right. Uh, the commission in the original binge that led to eight-year average rulemakings did not do that. Uh, it wasn't clear about its theories. It wasn't clear about its evidence. The rules where it was clear, uh, the eyeglasses rule, 18 months. Uh, the R value rule to require uh, dis uh, disclosure of a measure of insulating ability on different insulation products, uh, less than two years. Uh, if you're clear about what you want to do and what the basis is and what's really in dispute, um, it's not a particularly onerous process. If you say, we'll tell you later what we're actually thinking about, uh, yeah, then it takes a while. Um, uh, because nobody quite knows uh, where to focus their comments. Maureen? Yeah, so one of the, I think, the overarching issues that we need to keep in mind as we're talking about this in the U.S. system is we have a government set up with separation of powers. Uh, I hear a lot about, well, there's frustration, Congress won't do this, or it would be more efficient to have these prohibitions because it's costly to bring enforcement actions. You know, we, we kind of hear that. And um, Aurelian talked about their disdain for the courts. We, we've heard that. I, I thought it was very interesting when the FTC lost the AMG decision unanimously in the Supreme Court. The response from the FTC was, oh, the Supreme Court... Um, sided with a bunch of scam artists, right? Like no sort of like self-reflection of, that was a 9-0 decision. Uh, there's a reason they really, really don't like Justice Breyer is because he pays very close attention to what are the institutional capabilities. So one of the things I think we really need to keep in mind through all of this is our government is not set up to maximize enforcement efficiency. It is supposed to be set up to maximize and protect liberty. And as we are allowing sort of these pragmatic concerns, let's be more like Europe, they can do it faster. We can do, uh, you know, I think we need to keep these constitutional principles in mind. So I think the FTC, there's going to be separation of powers issues, non-delegation issues, major questions doctrine. And then we get to things as, you know, like seal the law, right? You've got the reason that the FTC was carved out from Humphrey's executor was because it essentially wasn't a rulemaking. It was a case-by-case -case enforcement uh, regime. And as it moves away from that, some of those precedents are very much at risk. So I think there are these overarching issues that really will, co will come to the fore here. Okay, yeah. thank you. Aurelia, thank you. I, I can be on what Maureen just said, the importance of separation of power. What, what does it mean with, for rulemaking? It means basically that you need congressional money to do anything. Otherwise, it's just... Uh, the, the the job of, of the courts. If you if an agency uh, can do something, it's only because he has been mandated by the by the Congress to do so. And we have that with the Magnuson Moss Act with respect to consumer protection. We don't have it with uh, antitrust. And I think that that's a, a real issue because if you just overstep and just disregard the the lack of congressional mandate, just think of 
um, because I think that's uh, what's going to happen. I think there's a major, not only opportunity cost of regulations over education, there's a major reputational cost of a judicial backlash in some years. And I mean, reputation cost, we already see it uh, very recently uh, when the FTC has filed a case against Facebook and the complaint was dismissed, uh, uh, not even accepted. So I think it's, it's valued and valuable to take time to make good complaints, to prosecute companies with well argued uh, 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 complaints. And I think uh, that's very important. Otherwise, there will be a reputation cost. If the FTC engage in rulemaking, issue some rules, and it, take, it will take some years. Uh, but then those rules are struck down by the Supreme, by, by the courts in, in many years, then there will be a major reputational cost because the businesses precisely won't have the legal certainty that the FTC was supposed to give. That's the, that's the basis of the FTC, uh, what President Wilson uh, said, to provide businesses with greater certainty. And I think, I'm afraid that we may provide businesses with weaker uh, legal certainty. Thank you all. So now we're going to turn to Q and A. Um, for people in the room, don't pose your question until a micro until you have a microphone. Um, and I think we'll have Mike soon. Okay, we are. So um, the gentleman in the front row has would like a question, and I'm, I'll alternate between virtual and people in the room. And also, if you're in the room and would you rather pose your question to Slido, we'll, we welcome that too. I, thank you very much. I I really learned a lot from this. Uh, what I have is more of a comment than a, than a question. It follows on to what uh, Orlyan was saying and a little bit to what Dick was saying. Um, the, the, I think there's an ironic sense in which the FTC exists because of the impossibility of rulemaking. Um, and the, the stories I always tell it would be the following, that, that of course in the, in the days of the original Brandeisians, which is to say Brandeis, um, <laughs> the you know the the debate was between the sort of Teddy Roosevelt view which was which was hand on hands on political control by the executive branch of everything that went on in industry um Brandeis believed that uh, what is what what the neo Brandeisians believe in a certain extent that that all you have to do is control anti-competitive practices because if you control anti-competitive practices then everything will thought will be fine so the idea that Brandeis had began to push under under Wilson, and he was the power behind the throne, of course, for all of the Wilson stuff, was that we're, all we're going to do is, is, is enumerate. And in fact, there was a guy uh, who became the first uh, uh, chief economist of the FTC who wrote two law review articles enumerating 14 different anti-competitive practices. And they were all either torts or crimes or things that today economists think are, are perfectly efficient. But um, they they wanted to have this in the legislation. But once the legislation, the early legislation got out, it was a disaster because they didn't really understand any of these anti-competitive practices. And their constituencies, including small businesses, were were horrified by the things that they were they were proposing. So they had basically had to back off. And so Brandeis convinced Wilson that he needed to have a commission, which he didn't want to have. And so Wilson wanted to call it a Sunshine Commission because he was opposed to a commission because that was a, a Roosevelt thing. Um, but in fact, the reason for having the commission was because you needed an agency to interpret the rules because you couldn't write them out. Because if you tried to write them out, people would scream bloody murder when you wrote when you wrote out the rules. And so that that was to be the job of the F, uh, that was to, to have been the job of the FTC was to case, is case by case explanation and information about what anti-competitive practices are because we can't do rulemaking. And the FTC Act has to be, of course, interpreted together with the Clayton Act because the Clayton Act was this ambition of listing this. So it was only going to be the Clayton Exactly. The, the job of the Clayton Act was to kind of list these practices, but we, we know that it was unlimited there were more practices and and i think that's very interesting that you bring brandeis because the brandeisians may not be that brandeisians if you look at it uh because brandeis was for the rule of reason that's the chicago trade board I mean, brandeis articulated and advocated for a rule of reason and i think this is in the 2015 
statement uh, of recession, saying that we shouldn't tie it up Section 5 to a rural reason. It's very, you would say, anti Brandesians uh, for, for neo Brandesians. I think the rural reason is precisely uh, identifying some potential anti competitive conduct, but at least accepting that there might be some efficiency differences. And you balance that out. And, and, and Brandeis has never been against this judicial process. I mean, he was a lawyer and he, was, he has made his fame in court. Uh, he hasn't made his fame in, 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 the, in, the, in the Federal Trade Commission. He was later on at the Supreme Court. So I think it's very important to, to remain attached to the rule of reason, even if you're on the Brandeisians or neo-Brandeisians. Okay, I have, um, let me read a question from um, an anonymous question. How do you expect the FTC may use its rulemaking authority to jointly address privacy and antitrust, for example, on social media? So there are several petitions uh, pending before the FTC with the encouragement that the FTC engage in rulemaking using its unfair methods of competition authority to prohibit targeted mm -hmm. advertising, follow on uses of data, things like that, uh, which are traditionally um, unfair and deceptive acts or practices kinds of kinds of concerns, right? So the FTC has brought a lot of enforcement cases uh, and brought settlements involving, you know, privacy violations, unfair uses of data that harm that harm consumers. Um, one of my concerns is that there's going to be this idea that a way to get around Congress's careful guardrails in the Magnuson Moss Act is to say, aha, these are really unfair methods of competition. We have notice and comment rulemaking. We're going to kind of run, run through a rule that way. Um, so I, I, said, I think there are concerns about like what will be sort of the, the method that the FTC chooses to do this. I mean, it's entirely possible the FTC could come out with some sort of proposed privacy rule under un, um, unfair and deceptive acts or practices, but that's a more um, uh, deliberate Kind of kind of approach, um, so so that's my my thought on that. Other are the thoughts from panelists. I can add a little bit that uh, I that I, I think antitrust is not a good point of entry to address privacy problems, and there's there's even uh, reasons for concern that some uh, of the more effective potential antitrust remedies would, would exacerbate privacy problems. So I'm, I, I don't see them as uh, well connected at, at all. The problem is that if, if you are concerned about privacy, and of course most people are, um, uh, we don't have a statute that's appropriate for that purpose. Uh, and this gets to my biggest concern about the future of the United States. We do not have a legislature that is created, that, that is capable of legislating. The, you know, every once in a while, if, if you come up with a statute that says, I will give billions to every congressional district, then maybe you can eke out a majority vote in both both houses. But that's it. Uh, and, and so uh, I, uh, I think we have a far more fundamental problem that, that helps to explain why, you know, we, we need a statute that says we're concerned about privacy, defines it in some way, and gives some agency some power to do it. And we're never going to get that. So could, could I weigh in on that? I mean, there have been serious conversations in um, Senate Commerce Committee about privacy. I've actually testified on it several several times. So um, I, I, while I'm, you know, would certainly be, you know, foolish to express unbounded optimism that something's going to pass. Um, I do think that there is, um, you know, the, the possibility that the sort of the forces, uh, the stars can, can align because I think there are a lot of concerns. Actually, I think a lot of the concerns that are being raised in the antitrust cons, um, uh, side of things really could be addressed a lot more directly through, through a privacy law. So I, so I agree with, with, with Jake about that, but I, uh, I also think Congress, you know, 
can do its job and is is trying is trying to let let's hope that they can get across the finish line. Yeah, just to build on uh, privacy and antitrust, I think you're totally right, Rich, Richard. Uh, privacy cannot be an antitrust issue if you are concerned with privacy. Just let me tell you in one sentence. Antitrust, at the end of the day, is about the large corporation we have, which have some market power or large market share, right? But if you're concerned with privacy, you're concerned with privacy from any business, large and small. What if your privacy is respected by large businesses because there is this antitrust in, in inceptions in privacy, but then there's no privacy standards for small businesses? I mean, as a consumer, you basically don't care if your privacy is violated by a small business or by a large business. You want, perhaps, to have some privacy standards irrespective of the size of the company. But antitrust is all about, at the end of the day, the size of the company. Uh, so that's why the privacy advocates should really advocate for privacy standards irrespective of the size of the company. So that's one point. The second point is we always think at the federal level. but it doesn't mean that privacy doesn't take place at the state level. Uh, we have a number of privacy legislation at the state level to precisely regulate uh, uh, privacy and just ensure that there's no abuse of privacy. So not to have also a, a federal law of privacy or of federal action on, on privacy doesn't mean that privacy is not respected in the United States at different levels. Howard, yeah, I was going to say, you you focused on privacy at the FTC, so you may have... Yeah, I was just going to add a, 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 a different twist on the conflict. Um, a lot of privacy law is about sharing information, and whoever collects the information can do pretty much whatever they want with it, uh, but restrictions kick in if you give it to somebody else. The logical implication of that is privacy problems would go away if we had a monopoly, <laughs> um, no, everybody, nobody would share, <laughs> be no need. Um, and unfortunately, the, um, you know, and just to some extent, that's what the privacy restrictions are doing uh, in GDPR and California is pushing out the little guys who compete with the big guys uh, by collecting information and pooling it. And for the people who don't need to pool because they're big and have lots of information, that's great. Um, but it advances neither privacy nor antitrust. Okay, thank you. We have another question in the back of the room here. Hi, uh, great panel, by the way. So this question starts, is it Arlene? Okay, I'll start with you, And but it's for the panel. You made a comment, you said that the issue regarding the FCC proposed a complaint against Facebook and it never made it to the court and it was not, it was rejected. It has been okay. accepted now. Can you expand on that? And then oh, yeah. with, with, with the panel as well, with their opinion of that statement, think, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I think it's, it wasn't about the case itself. It was more about the repetitional cost of the yeah. FTC bringing cases and too hastily and, and losing cases. I mean, the complaint very quickly was re rejected because of the lack of um, the unconvincing market definition uh, that the FTC has made in the in, in the case where it was considered that Facebook was a monopoly and was not competing with TikTok or Snapchat and uh, Twitter. Uh, so this market definition was so narrow uh, in the social networking services uh, market that um, the judge said that, please, bring another complaint uh, that, uh, and I mean, take time, uh, just for the takeaway for this uh, panel, it takes time and it takes a lot of resources um, to adjudicate and prosecute. So if you just hasty and go quick because of some elections, uh, uh, sometime you, you've seen very lately some lawsuits brought a few days before uh, elections. So if you tied up antitrust to political timeline, uh, then you may just be too quick and, and lose on the uh, on, on the uh, argumentation or the power of argumentation of, of the lawsuit. So it takes time to bring cases in antitrust, and, and that shouldn't be a defect, that shouldn't be a bug, but it's part of the judicial process. If we don't like that, let's burn the courts. Uh, and I think it's part of the judicial process in any case, in, in, in criminal cases, it takes years, if not a decade, to bring a criminal case from the investigations to the, to the end point. 
and in antitrust case, it's pre pretty much the same thing. So my word is a word of caution and, uh, and taking time and not to be impatient in finding or breaking up uh, some companies. Uh, you may do it, that's fine, but take your time. And I, I, I would just say overreaching has consequences. Um, overreaching in the 70s rulemakings uh, led to substantial restrictions on the agency's authority. Uh, it went unfunded for a period of time, literally unfunded. Um, all we could do who were there was engage in the orderly termination of activities. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, uh, it, it, it overreaching had um, consequences in the AMG decision. Uh, the commission's authority, they for the, for the last 10 years or so, they'd been busy asserting that they had authority to get money for any violation of any statute they enforced under any circumstances. The statute clearly doesn't say that. Uh, we wrote an article in 2013 that says this is an overreach and you could lose this authority entirely, and they did. Um, uh, it has consequences politically. It has consequences in the courts. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it is uh, whether whether... I mean, there's there's a lot of stretching, um, but we haven't seen what the reach is going to try to be or whether it's an overreach uh, or not. So I think we have a question in the front here. And if you have questions over here, signal me. And if you're part of our virtual audience, do submit questions to Slido. Thank you. Um, and yeah, great panel. Um, my question initially is for Richard and Aurelian and then the rest of the panel as well. So uh, Aurelian mentioned it and then Richard, I think, indirectly mentioned the Robinson Patman Act. Um, and you, uh, Richard was talking about predatory pricing and that Lena Khan basically wants to get rid of the idea that you have to show that you can recoup the losses after. And that would basically be going back on the, or she would want to go back to the Utah Pie decision, which I think that all economists think is basically the worst court decision of all time. Um, and so, I mean, this is just sort of outrageous. So I would... <laughs> Um, and uh, basically, she would want to, uh, you know, undo the Brook Group decision, which is one of the better decisions, right, because it remedied that. Um, so my question to you is, because I was on a panel last week at the spring meetings, which was, is, could there be a revival of the Robinson-Patman Act? And my question to you is, do you think that with um, Chair Khan around, that there is a non-zero chance that there will be an FTC, the Robinson Patman case brought. Thoughts? <laughs> I, I, I can start on it. I, um, it. It wouldn't shock me if they go in that direction. It would shock me if they enjoy any success. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the courts, the courts killed the Robinson Patman Act 50 years ago. I mean, this, yeah. this statute's deader than doornail on the finding. You know, you're certainly not going to find uh, five Supreme Court justices who say, oh, that's a great idea. That's not going to happen. I think we've seen some op-eds and reports uh, over the last days and over the last weeks calling for a revival, revitalization of the Rubens and Patima Act. So, I think it's just available uh, for the brandisms, and I cannot think for them not to use it. Uh, it's just here, it's a dead letter, and they want to perhaps make it like a zombie. Uh, so they want to revitalize it, and they, they're they going to use it, for sure. Um, who should they, would there be a, a judicial backlash? Uh, I think it's very likely. Uh, and, and just to, to uh, I, I, agree, I agree with all that. Uh, but if you look at like the the merger, the R, request for information on the merger guidelines, a lot of the statements that have been put out, they are looking back to all the old case law, right? And so th the fact that it maybe became a dead letter 50 years ago is no, you know, d doesn't seem to it's enter into the. <laughs> they they keep referencing old old case law, and you know they want to get rid of the consumer welfare standard. And we've got, you know, case law that makes it very clear that that is what antitrust law is supposed to be pursuing. So I, I do think that we could see this sort of like, well, let's kind of pretend that didn't happen and go back to the old, this, what the statute says and old case law interpreting it. 
I think as President Biden uh, said for the executive order on corruption, we've been through supposedly a 40 years experiment. So everything that is older than 40 years is great. And everything that has been done within the last 40 years is just, should be just uh, uh, put into in, in, into the bin. Uh, so I think the idea is the older, the better. Uh, and they really want to go back to the 30s or 40s. And everything that's been done for the last 40 years is sus suspicious and, or seems skeptically. Except for Magnus and Moss, where they're trying to reject the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> so other comments from people in the room or questions? Um, and I don't see one um, from our virtual audience either, so I will um, pose, a, I have, have a couple questions, some of which you've addressed. But one is, if, if the FDC is going to be conducting APA-style rulemaking the way many executive branch agencies do, should their rules be subject to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs review and Executive Order 12866? And for antitrust people in the room who don't know what I'm talking about, um, this, this office in OMB reviews the um, significant regulations of, of executive branch agencies. And the role is several fold, but one is to coordinate across agencies. Um, and the other is to provide what President Obama called a dispassionate and analytical second opinion on the agency's rulemaking. So Howard, I think that might people might say that would be make it more political because that is part, it's a White House centric review. But on the other hand, it um, may mean better analysis, better evidence and better explanation for why they're doing what they're doing. Um, I, I think um, regardless of the procedures, it ought to be subject to OIR review. Um, the exclusion for independent agencies was a purely political choice. Um, the, there's, there seems to be fairly clear legal authority uh, to extend the requirement um, to um, the independent agencies, the so-called independent agencies. Uh, that was the opinion, there's an OLC opinion from the Carter administration's Justice Department that says that, that's been reiterated a couple of times. Um, um, I've been part of various, um, um, uh, I don't know, failure, failure to thrive transition efforts uh, <laughs> for uh, Republican administrations, and that's been a consistent um, recommendation for regulatory reform is extend this to the independent agencies. Uh, and, and and do that regardless of procedures. And could could I mention this concern that's also being raised, which is how independent is the FTC these mm -hmm. days, right? Uh, we a lot of the changes that we've seen are moving it more towards being a single-headed agency than a commission, right? We see that in those changes. Uh, that were done last summer. Howard talked about some of them. There were other changes that were done, which um, uh, sort of concentrated the authority into the chair's office to open investigations. You know, do, do, you know, get compulsory process. Even the FTC website that used to have all the pictures of the commissioners up together. <laughs> that's not the case anymore. It just shows chair con and then you have to go several levels down to find the pictures of the other commissioners um and we've seen close coordination with the white house on the executive you know chair con being in the audience being up on the the stage very unusual that really has not been the norm and i as a long time ftc you know commissioner staffer you know observer that this is really kind of standing out i remember when bob potofsky got you know, the, some eyebrows raised when um, he showed up in the Rose Garden when the violence against children report was was uh, announced, uh, a marketing violence to children report, I should say. Um, so again, I think that weakens the idea that for some reason the FTC's, mm -hmm. you know, independence means it doesn't need to have these rules. And Dick, do you have any thoughts? Because I know certainly one of OIRA's roles is to look at the Ben encourage agencies to understand the benefits and the costs before issuing, and you commented on that. Uh, yeah, let me take a crack at this. There's, there's actually about eight issues, I think, embedded in all this. Well, uh, the, in terms of OIRA review, I've, I've always thought that. And, and you know, when did Peter and, and, and uh, uh, Cass 
uh, write their first articles uh, 30-some years ago, I think, saying, of course, a lot of and, and we know from lots of empirical work that that uh, agencies that are subject to OIRA review uh, tend to develop uh, better economic staffs that do a better job of economic analysis than agencies that don't. So I think it's a no-brainer. But as you know, the reason it hasn't happened is Congress concern that, I mean, the, the, the independent agencies have never been independent of the government, for God's sake. That would certainly be a violation of the Constitution. They have been somewhat more independent from the president and somewhat more dependent on the Congress. And so the Congress has, has uh, rather liked that. And so the concern with every administration, uh, when, when smart people say you should do this, is eh, backlash in Congress. We're, it's going to make it's hard enough for us to get anything through Congress now. Don't make it worse. Uh, and, and then in terms of what, you know, the, the, the source of the independence to me is the requirement that there be no more than a bare majority of the commissioners of each of these agencies or boards uh, who, who are members of the same party. And uh, uh, wow, that in, in, in our day, this world of hyper-partisan uh, uh, politics, you know, that, that just creates circumstances like we have had at the FTC and the FCC for, what was it, nine months, 10 months? They didn't exist uh, because there was no majority from one one party. Uh, and uh, uh, in, increasingly at every independent agency, it's very easy to predict. You know, FEC has been this way forever, except they have six commissioners. So every decision, three, three. Okay. Uh, and um, I, I don't know what's going to happen in that area. I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a constitutional law mess, and it's a political mess, and uh, it, it's going to continue to be the source of lots of controversy. And could, could I weigh, could weigh in on that? Because so when I was the uh, acting chairman of the FTC for 16, 17 month period, it was just myself. I'm a Republican and my Democratic colleague, Terrell McSweeney. Uh, and we brought lots of cases. Uh, we agreed on most things or a couple of things we didn't agree on. Um, and I think that really spoke to sort of the strength of the agency when it's run in a bipartisan fashion and when it's run based on legal principles that are well established in the case law, in economics, and we could agree on things. And as we're, what we're seeing at the FTC is a real rejection of that. Um, and I think it does create these problems of administrability down the road if you do end up in a situation where you, you don't have, you know, a majority that you, what, what actions can, can you take when you have, I think, you know, an, an enforcement approach that's based on precedent case law that is not out of step with what other antitrust enforcers like the DOJ are doing, you can have that predictability and continuity and the ability to continue to operate uh, without, you know, being paralyzed because you're not in the same political party. There is the changes in the confirmation process uh, and the appointment process have really made a significant difference. Um, it used to be, and, and, and I remember being part of this, it, it used to be the president actually made an independent choice of the minority commissioners. Uh, and I remember looking for uh, people who would qualify as Democrats or independents uh, that would work with uh, Republican commissioners who were in charge uh, that the president could appoint and get confirmed. Um, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, because of problems in the confirmation process, a deal was struck that the minority party, uh, from the point of view of the presidency, um, uh, you know, the senior, the senior um, dissenting party, minority party in Congress um, could choose whoever they wanted and the president would nominate them. Uh, for a while that worked uh, and we got fairly bipartisan commissioners appointed. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, in the beginning of the Trump administration, it was no, we're, we're going, we're going pure partisan. Uh, 
Uh, it shows up in the appointments. It shows up in the decisions. It shows up today in the process. I think that... So the, the good illustration is precisely today with the FTC, the politicization of the FTC yeah. as leads to the non-confirmation of the last commissioner. So we can see the, the correlation between politicizations and the lack of efficiency or efficacy of the FTC. The, the, the more you politicize, the less likely you're able to bring bipartisan consensus and move forward. Well, that is a very depressing note to end on, but we're going to have to. So, or again, we have a, a coffee break now before our, our next keynote. Thank you. Let's thank you very much.
All right, thank you all for coming back into the room here and for everyone joining us online again. Um, as noted in the introduction to this event and from the speakers we've heard from already, antitrust is clearly at the forefront of policymaking. And an inter integral part of that is the process for review of mergers and acquisitions. I know our keynote speaker at the beginning of this emphasized that a lot. So hopefully we can really dive into that topic here with this panel. Uh, first, we'll start with a few introductory remarks from our panelists and then questions between our panelists from the audience, and I'll try to throw in a few as well. My name is Bryce Chenault. I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager at the GW Regulatory Study Center. I hold degrees in political science and public policy from the University of Wisconsin Whitewater and George Mason University. And I look forward to being a student again today as we learn from this distinguished panel. Uh, we have uh, three here up on stage, and then we're also including uh, two people virtually. Um, as a reminder for everyone in the online audience, you can submit questions via the Slido link available wherever you are watching this from. Uh, so to start with introductions, Diana Moss, is, uh, who is joining us online, is the president of the American Antitrust Institute, where her work spans both antitrust and regulation policies across a number of industries. Diana previously served in the Office of Economic Policy and Office of Markets, Tariffs, and Rates at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. She has testified before Congress and regulatory commissions at both the federal and state level. She has published research in a number of academic journals and is the editor of Network Access and Regulation and Antitrust. Diana holds an MA degree from the University of Denver and a PhD from the Colorado School of Mines. And again, she's joining us online. Ginger Jin here, um, seated in the, in the middle, is currently professor of economics at the University of Maryland College Park. She previously served as the director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Economics. Most of her research focuses on the ace, information asymmetry among economic agents and how to provide information to be, overcome that information problem. Her research has been published in leading journals and is she, she is currently co-editor of the Journal of Economics and Management Strategy, associate editor of RAND Journal of Economics, advisory council member of Journal of Industrial Economics and board member of Industrial Organization Society. Ginger received a PhD in economics from UCLA. Julie Carlson is Associate Director for Antitrust and Innovation Policy here at ITIF Schumpeter Project. Her work focuses on advancing a dynamic framework for competition policy in which innovation is a central concern for antitrust enforcement. Julie has published articles in academic journals as well and previously worked for 14 years at the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission. Before joining the FTC, she was an Associate Professor of Economics at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. Julie received her PhD in economics from Michigan State University. Lisa Kimmel is also joining us online. She's a senior counsel at the antitrust group at the Crowell Law Firm here in Washington, DC. Lisa's practice focuses on the mergers and civil investigations, as well as a variety of competition policy issues, particularly policy issues involving intellectual property. Before joining Crowell, Lisa spent five years as an antitrust and competition advisor in the office of the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Lisa holds both a JD and a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. And last but not least is Christina Di Pasquale. I hope I got that right, it was close. Okay. Is an associate professor at the Cary School Business School at Johns Hopkins University. Her primary research interests are in law and economics and health economics, particularly at the intersection of firm decisions and antitrust consequences. Christina also teaches and conducts research in the area of sports economics and is currently co-authoring the second edition of the textbook Sports Economics, which I'm going to try to read that here at some point. <laughs> Very interesting to me. Yeah, Christ <laughs> <laughs> Christina has a BS in economics from the University of Florida and a PhD in business economics from the University of Michigan. So with that, um, at an at random order that we have, I'd like to turn it over to Diana to um, have her opening remarks. Well, thank you very much and hello to everybody um, online and also um, there in person. My apologies for not being able to join you in person. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Boulder, Colorado, where I uh, live and commute to DC. And I wanted to um, first commend um, the development of this program and, and specifically this panel. So uh, I think the topic of how we account for dynamism in merger analysis is very timely. And I would just like to lend some perspective to that, uh, 
to that topic and what I hope will turn out to be a robust debate uh, on, a, on a few items, about four to five uh, top line topics. First of all, um, no disagreement, none whatsoever, that innovation drives competition. It is a critical uh, driver of, um, uh, of innovation, uh, not only in the US, but uh, in an increasingly globalized economy. Uh, so it makes us ask really the fundamental question, where are we on the pace of innovation? And, and there's, I think, some troubling statistics. Um, certainly investment in the US in uh, science increased from about 1970 to 2010, but total factor productivity, which we all know to be one metric of, of innovation, really started to stall out in the 1970s. And business R&D expenditures have fallen 30% from 1985 to below 20% in 2015. Um, so just a red flag there in terms of the, the statistics. So what is the argument for competition, but not concentration in driving innovation? Um, I think it's well known that more competition, um, uh, the more competition we have, the more firms engage in new product development to steal sales from rivals. Whereas with less competition, new product development increases the risk that dominant firms and oligopolies will cannibalize their own sales of existing uh, products. Dominant firms also have strong incentives to exploit intellectual property, uh, their patents, their copyrights, to control or shape competition outside the scope of, that, of those IP protections. We see it in generic pharmaceuticals with pay for delay and product hopping. Uh, and uh, increasingly in other sectors. Um, I think it's also true that the symbiotic nature of the digital business ecosystems model with the VC-backed startup model creates weird incentives to innovate. There may be innovation, but uh, that pathway of innovation is somewhat distorted uh, because it is designed to maximize acquisition prices for, for founders and funders. Um, at, to the extent that the VC back model is increasing in frequency, we're starting to see it outside digital business ecosystems, we should pay attention to that. Finally, um, there's really no sign that, that we have uh, gales of creative destruction or serial monopoly. We have large entrenched firms and oligopolies in major sectors, food and agriculture, healthcare, airlines, telecommunications. Um, so we're not seeing the displacement the rapid displacement of, of entrenched dominant firms. Um, so what are the implications for merger control? Well, the merger guidelines, as we know, talk about R&D rivalry. They note competition often spurs firms to innovate. That's really important. Um, but we're seeing increasing theory and evidence that mergers do stifle incentives to innovate or lead to lower quality innovation. We've seen it in, um, in agriculture, the USDA Agricultural Research Service has produced lots of good research on this. Um, uh, uh, Mike Scherer and Bill Komenor in their work on, on uh, branded pharmaceutical mergers note that technical progress is best achieved when there is widespread dispersion of R&D initiatives both across companies and within them through the exploration of multiple technical pathways. All right, so elimination of parallel path uh, R&D programs is of grave concern. Finally, um, on, on what does it mean for merger control? You know, 40 years of weak merger enforcement based on, on error cost analysis, where uh, more weight is given to the risks of over enforcement or stopping pro competitive mergers versus under enforcement or not stopping harmful mergers, has really set back the course of Section 7 enforcement um, significantly. And we're now seeing the evidence uh, uh, of that and dealing with the damage and the cleanup strategy from years and years of lax uh, enforcement. Uh, and you know, the debate around rising concentration and whether it's uh, actually observable in uh, antitrust markets, relevant markets, um, uh, uh, is another discussion entirely. But suffice it to say, there is credible evidence that antitrust enforcers should be paying very close attention to that debate. So moving on, well, do we have the tools to address, um, to address uh, the importance of innovation competition and what it means for merger control? And I think the answer is yes, mostly. We have the tools. Let's take a look at the consumer welfare standard. You know, big subject of debate has eaten up, you know, scads of time on conference panels over the last few years. Uh, my view is that that debate is largely rooted 
and a fundamental misunderstanding of what the consumer welfare standard does and what it can do, mostly by a group on the far left of the ideological spectrum that, um, you know, not, not legal economic policy analysts uh, who have really interpreted the standard uh, in a very narrow way. But the bottom line is the consumer welfare standard, um, I think is broad, I think it's deep, but it has been underutilized, unfortunately. And the progressive view, there is a progressive view, by the way, it's in the middle of the spectrum. It's not Chicago and it's not Neo Brandeisian, it's progressive. And AAI has been at the forefront of that for the last 25 years. And progressives advocate for stronger enforcement, revitalized enforcement, stronger standards, we do not advocate for an overhaul of the uh, and a redo of the antitrust laws. So the consumer welfare standard has been underutilized. It absolutely can go to price effects and nice non-price effects like quality and like innovation. The consumer welfare standard can address market power on both the buy side and on the sell side, which means it can really be applied in any market in a supply chain. And so if you interpret the standard as um, uh, 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 targeting um, uh, output effects, right? Reductions in output. That means the standard can be applied in any market, including, you know, most relevantly input markets or labor markets, where absolutely you can have an effect on trading partners and, uh, in other words, the competitive process. All right, so the standard seems capable. It's just been underutilized uh, by focusing almost exclusively on price effects, but the, the capacity is there. Um, second problem or implication for tools, um, efficiencies, looking at merger related efficiencies, that is turning out to be a bit of a horror show. We now have lots of evidence of past mergers that have failed to prove up the efficiencies. Uh, I will cite AAI's work on airline mergers. We just sent a letter in to DOJ on, on the uh, what I call the Spontier merger, Spirit Frontier, also potentially JetBlue and Spirit. But uh, we see uh, evidence that, that past efficiencies claims have not been uh, delivered on. And that's really important because in litigated cases, if merger challenge merger cases go to court and they're litigated, that burden shift becomes really the focus of, of the whole show uh, in federal court. And, and that's where efficiencies get most of their airplay. We now know that AT&T Time Warner failed to prove up the efficiencies and those were mostly longer term dynamic efficiencies around innovation and developing new targeted advertising models. And we know that because AT&T has abandoned its merger with Time Warner, not three years after it was consummated and are spinning, and, and are spinning off Time Warner to discovery. Okay, so we've had a very narrow application of the consumer welfare standard on the competitive effects side, but a very expansive application on the efficiency side where uh, enforcers and courts have accepted expansive claims of not only short-term static cost reductions, but also very um, um, nebulous, longer-term dynamic consumer benefits. Um, uh, another issue uh, around the tools issue, do we have the tools, um, is the elimination of nascent rivals. And I know others will talk about this here in a minute. Um, that is a critical theory of harm, a, a critical uh, a topic that is coming up in merger after merger. Uh, business models are important in this regard. Digital business ecosystems grow mostly through acquisition. We have a new study out on that, but antitrust is woefully far behind on, on evaluating acquisitions of nascent rivals. And finally, remedies. Um, we now have a growing list of failed remedies, Safeway Albertsons, Hertz Dollar Thrifty. We have massive remedies taken, for example, in Bear Monsanto, largest remedy ever. And including the divestiture of R&D pipelines, um, we need to look more carefully at why remedies are failing and how that factors into whether a remedy fully restores competition lost by a merger. And I also mean competition uh, on innovation in that, in that context. So finally, merger policy priorities, what are they? We need more standalone innovation cases brought by the agencies. We've had a few, Tokyo Electron and others, uh, but we need more. And I mean standalone. I don't mean innovation claims tacked on, for example, to price effects uh, in, a, in a complaint. Um, we need to absolutely begin discounting long-term unverifiable efficiencies claims that are made in highly concentrated mergers. Stronger standards 
for blocking acquisitions of disruptive innovative rivals. Uh, and we also need to start accounting for uh, unique economic phenomena like network effects, information asymmetries, a massive scale and scope economies, say in cloud infrastructure, uh, as well as leveraging theories uh, as theories of harm. And so I think those priorities, priorities are important. And as we consider merger control, we also need to consider other policy tools. For example, the intersection between intellectual property law and competition and start addressing those tensions there. So I'll stop there. I'm over my time, apologies, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, we'll shift back here into the room and uh, Ginger, if you wanna take it over. And thank you, Bryce. Uh, I would like to thank GW and ITF for including me in this wonderful conference. I truly enjoyed the last panel and look forward to interact with panelists and audience in this panel. Um, I would just want to take this time to share with you some of the findings we had in recent research, um, just and, and some thoughts I have in this area. So first of all, um, we noticed that venture capital and the startup investment play a very important role in technology in technological uh, innovations and acquisition is one of the success exit strategy that investors are very keen to pursue. So any merger policy reforms that aim to promote future innovations must keep venture capital in mind. That's my point number one. My point number two is that our um, Research have shown that incumbent acquisition of technology startup is widespread across <laughs> industries, across types of acquires, not just concentrated in the few digital platforms that ongoing policy debates tends to focus on. Just to give you an example, in the data from Standard Pool Global Intelligence, GAFA, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, this is so-called GAFA, um, have completed almost 600 majority control tech acquisitions from 2010 to 2020. That may sound a lot, but it accounts for less than 1.5% of all tech um, MA deals recorded in this data. And the average value of GAFA deals, which is about 1.5 billion based on the now missing values in the data, is not higher than, for example, that from the top 25 tech acquisitions, excluding GAFA. And their average is about 1.5 six, eight billion conditional non-missing values. So uh, I think just looking at those data, it does not suggest that the acquisitions made by GAFA is very special as compared to the rest of the MA deals and, um, and therefore warrant um, special legislation or enforcement. So that's my number two position. And number three, if you look at those acquisitions, a large fraction of those acquisitions actually target adjacent or non-related areas away from acquirer's core business. And this is partly driven by acquirers trying to differentiate from the increase of competition in their core business. And merger reviews tends to focus on very narrow market definition based on acquirer's core business. That seems to miss that picture. And, and I think that some lessons should be learned in the future. And just to give you some example, if we just look at GAFA acquisitions, over 80% of those acquisitions are actually away from their core business area and targeting adjacent and non-related area. And those acquisitions should be regarded as entry by itself. When we talk about market competition, when we talk about entry, it's not just organic startups that started in that area, but also um, other incumbents that try to enter that area. We have seen many examples where acquires or incumbent entry into a new area have bring disruptive innovations that have made that market more efficient. So uh, in that view, we also find that more and more incumbent enter into the same business area through acquisitions, okay? And presumably they are gonna compete in those area and therefore the competition should incorporate not only the startup competing with the incumbent, but also incumbent with incumbent or startup with startup, okay? And um, it's very important to look at both the anti and pro-competitive effect of a merger just beyond price and beyond the immediate and short run effect. For example, we have seen literature showing that discouraging, uh, discouraging incumbent from acquiring tech startups may be able to limit the potential and the competitive effects in so-called killer acquisition or kill zones. But at the same time, such discouragement could also stop incumbents from entering into new areas 
and reduce the prospect of successful exit in the eyes of future entrepreneurs and venture investors, and all of which could have tremendous negative impact on future elevations and future market competition. And how to balance these two effects, I think, is a crucial for us to determine what kind of policy or what kind of legislation should be in place for this area. I, I think one thing that I do notice is that um, we see the technology or data-driven business have become much more scalable than before. Um, so in light of that, I would propose that we should have a lower reporting threshold for merger review and more resources should be devoted to close monitoring of MA activity beyond just case-by-case -case merger review above the HSA um, threshold. A number of academic research have shown that a lot of acquisitions were below this um, threshold and could have potential and the competitive effect. And, and if we just look at the deals above this threshold, we're missing um, majority part of that picture. And some of the cases brought by um, FTC, for example, it's sort of, to some extent, it's hindsight 2020, right? That we're looking at today and looking back and we're thinking, okay, maybe um, the previous decision on those mergers were, um, were not exactly um, predicting the future. But of course, we're now um, in that, we observe the exact reality happen and then um, we try to say, okay, we were wrong. But I think the question is, how can we be more proactive looking into the future? How can we prevent such hindsight <laughs> happen again, right? And um, I think a lower HSR threshold will be a starting um, point for that. Of course, you can argue that, okay, well, the agency is already short of resources. Uh, how can we deal with tons of more materials coming in this way if we lower the threshold? I would argue that it's not this, we don't have resources is we need a new mentality of how to use those resources. Um, if we just have like um, say armies of lawyers and economists reading page by page manually, and of course I agree that we're not gonna have enough resources despite um, maybe the Congress would eventually decide to um, put more millions into FTC or into DOJ. Um, I, I think there are technology um, driven methodology um, that could be um, really improve the efficiency. For example, we should have AI based uh, algorithm to read merger materials. We should have automatic alert system on consumer complaint, which can give cues on what cases to look into. We should have a more systematic system to allow businesses to file their complaints, including uploading the key commercial materials at question, for example, the contract. And maybe we even should have some similar law like HSR that would sort of allow FTC or DOJ to look into the core business materials. All that should be backed by technology driven and surveillance of the agencies. We can't just rely on manual uh, work. And that is not enough in my view. I think another um, important piece is that we should develop a robust theory of harm. We can't just say, okay, let's have a blanket regulation based on one or two cases, and therefore all that behavior should be per se illegal. I think we need a robust theory of harm, and we need those robust theory of harm based on the data-driven approach that we have seen in those data, right? That's a theory of harm by definition is theory, but to how to make sure that's not speculation. It should have back and forth between the evidence from those tech-driven um, material reading and this development of theory of harm. And I would argue this is much more cost-effective than having a blanket regulation or having even a shift of burden of proof and then let the court system to figure that out. The court system is very costly, right? Every case brought under ambiguous language may cost millions of dollars, and then it may create a lot of uncertainty and eventually still go back and forth on what exactly what those two words mean. And I think having a robust theory of harm developed in the agency backed by the technology-driven um, data will be very much a much more effective way to, to deal with this kind of difficulty. I will stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it here uh, on the panel in person. We'll turn to Julie. 
Um, great, thank you. I'm really excited to be on a panel with many of my former FTC colleagues today. Um, so a lot of things, or, or a lot of what I'm going to say will complement um, some of the great research that, that Ginger and her co-authors have done, but I really want to focus on um, this debate that we're having right now about um, acquisitions of nascent competitors. And, um, you know, I often hear things like, oh, we need laws like this uh, Platform uh, Competition and Opportunity Act to uh, promote innovation and preserve the startup ecosystem. And a lot of what I'm seeing um, and hearing, you know, we throw this word innovation around, like it just sort of means one thing. And um, without really sort of thinking about the many ways in which innovation can both occur and what innovation looks like. And so I thought I'd start there and um, talk a bit about um, how acquisitions do provide incentives for innovation and, and, and be a little bit more specific what I mean by innovation in that context. So there's, I think you can sort of think about innovation in two ways, sort of this very like radical disruptive innovation that's intended to displace incumbent firms I think of Amazon's business model as that kind of innovation, right? Retailing was very bricks and mortar. Amazon came along and introduced an entirely new business model that says we're going to sell things exclusively online, right? Um, but innovation can also be incremental. So um, as an example of incremental innovation, so innovation that's not intended to disrupt the incumbent necessarily, um, but that might build on some of the capabilities that the incumbent already has in place. I really like Waze in that category of innovation, right? Waze did not invent turn-by-turn -turn mapping, right? Okay, Google already sort of had that um, established, but Waze brought in this innovation of crowdsourcing traffic and information. I love that, right? Um, but, you know, in order for... Uh, a, a company like Waze to um, compete head to head with Google, right, for this incremental innovation, right, they have to sort of reproduce all of the assets that Google has. And that's very costly, right? Um, and so um, Luis Cabral has this really um, great paper. Um, I think it's called Standing on the Shoulders of Dwarfs. Um, where, you know, he puts down this theory model, which I think is very persuasive, that um, this ability to be acquired, right, is more profitable for these incremental innovators than this sort of radical disruptive innovation, right? And so when we um, sort of squash that channel of innovation funding, right, then, then we're also going to have less of these uh, incremental innovations. And so, you know, when we're talking about, you know, um, about acquisitions of startups, um, and I, I love that, that Diana just sort of raised this at the very beginning, you know, you know, she talks about how this is just really designed to promote acquisition value. And I think, wow, that's great, right? Because the higher that acquisition value is, right, that's the funding for the next cycle of innovation. Um, and we sort of have this uh, virtuous cycle of, of, um, of, you know, recycling venture capital into the next generation of startups. And so we have this virtuous cycle of innovation and economic growth. Um, we hear a lot of talk about killer acquisitions. And so in that sort of spirit of what do we mean by these things, let's talk about what that killer acquisitions paper is actually about. So first it's about pharma, okay? Um, an important space that we should be looking at when we're thinking about innovation and competition law for sure. Um, and so they define a killer acquisition as one in which when an acquirer with a substitute drug project ceases development of the acquired drug project. Okay. From a competition standpoint, that seems very, very bad. 100% agree, right? We don't want to see that. Um, so this is really a focus on what I would call radical innovation, right? This is a drug that's going to disrupt 
the, the acquirer's drug product. Um, I think it's important to note that in their study, they all, of all the acquisitions that they look, only about five to 7% of those are identified as killer acquisitions. So even in pharma, in a space where we think of most of the innovation as being radical innovation, this problem of killer acquisitions, I think is pretty small. Um, and I think importantly, what they find is that most of these acquisitions, and this uh, ties into what Ginger had to say, most of these acquisitions are below the HSR re reporting threshold. So the agencies aren't even seeing these. Okay. Um, for a lot of reasons, I think that this um, analysis, this killer acquisition um, uh, uh, theory is, is not really applicable to the GAFM acquisitions that, that Ginger was talking about, right? A lot of technology innovation tends to be more incremental building on other innovations than being radical innovations. So Alberto Galasso and Mark Shankerman have this really great paper from a number of years ago looking at what happens when courts invalidate patents and what happens to follow on citations from those patent invalidations there's no change in, in follow-on citations in pharma, right? Which just sort of speaks of there's not incremental innovation really happening in pharma, but the significant increase in patent citations in sort of technology-related um, patenting space. So it's kind of speaking to that, there was some blocking of patents, the patent was invalidated, and now this spurred additional in, innovation when, when, when the patent was invalidated. So you can't have killer acquisitions without this displacement threat, without this threat of radical innovation. And so um, I just don't see that as a, as, a, as a real threat in the technology space. And I think that the research that Ginger and her co-authors have done really support that, that most of the acquisitions are not in the GAFM's core business, but they're in these adjacent, adjacent business areas. So I'll just um, end by um, talking about the, the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act that I mentioned at the beginning. So this is a bill that's in both the Senate and the House right now. It's still in committee, so who knows what will eventually happen with it. Um, but it creates this covered platform designation that um, targets specifically, not by name, but by the, by, the, uh, by the requirements, targets the GAFM firms, but excludes other large firms, right? So it includes Amazon, but for example, it excludes Walmart. Um, and so a covered platform must show that it's not acquiring a direct nascent or potential competitor, that it's not enhancing a market position, it's not enhancing its ability to maintain a market position. And here's, I think, a really important piece. The, the Senate version of this bill exempts acquisitions valued at or below $50 million. Why is that important? So some may have noticed that the FTC put out this study last year on GAFM acquisitions and of their non-reportable acquisitions. And if you read that study carefully, 93% of the GAFM non-reportable acquisitions, excuse me, of the, oh, excuse me, 93% of the non-reportable acquisitions were below the size of threshold excuse me, size of transaction test, okay? 93% of, of the acquisitions below the size of transaction test were valued at less than $50 million, okay? So 93% of these non-reportable acquisitions are below the threshold at which the Senate bill exempts uh, the acquisitions from this new set of obligations, right? So, the Senate proposal is only going to capture 7% of the GAFM acquisitions that aren't already captured under HSR, right? So unfortunately, though, the bill has these burden shifting requirements that will apply to all of the GAFM acquisitions, right? And so consumers are going to be not denied the, the pro-competitive benefits of some of the synergies we get from, from um, acquisitions. 
um, and really limit this important source of funding for startup innovation. So I'll just end by saying I don't think the theory and evidence shows that the, the Gaffin firms are engaged in these killer acquisitions. I think the, the legislation that's being proposed to address this is going to be ineffective, but at the same time, it's going to be very harmful for competition and innovation. And, you know, I would agree with, with Ginger that um, really um, what we should be looking at is instead of throwing out rule of reason, um, to evaluate mergers in, 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 in favor of some sort of per se like uh, rules that we really should be taking a closer look at the, at the HSR thresholds. So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, next, we'll, we'll jump back online. We'll bring uh, Lisa into the conversation. And Lisa, thank you for being able to make it here. I know it was a bit of a last minute thing for you to get everything in order. So we're, we're happy to have you join us and we'll turn it over to Great. you. Well well, th thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, the um, as, as I said, that's a last minute accommodation to um, let me join online. So um, my thoughts are um, on these issues are a little less well organized and developed as some of the other panelists. I'm a practitioner these days, not an academic, but I'm going to share some probably a little bit random thoughts I have um, on uh, some of the merger, uh, the activity, policy activity that we're seeing both on the legislative and at the agency front on merger, merger policy. And, and let me say initially that I agree in large part with everything that's, that's been said so far. And particularly, I agree in large part with um, some of the comments that Diana Moss um, opened with. I don't know how to label myself. I definitely not a neo-Brandeisian. I don't know if I'm a progressive or what I am, but I, I generally agree in particular that it's really important that antitrust policy remain focused on the competitive process and uh, the consumer welfare standard and not, you know, get sort of um, pulled into as a tool for other social reforms. I think antitrust uh, has enough on its plate right now, and it's a very imprecise tool. And so trying to use it to achieve other social goals, political goals, um, uh, workers' rights goals, uh, valuable, however those may be, antitrust is not the place, the place to do that. Um, uh, with regard to the relationship between competition and innovation, as um, Julie uh, explained very articulately, innovation is, is, is a term that's tossed around and it doesn't mean one thing. And it's been um, quite a long time since I read all the research on the relationship between competition and innovation, but it's something I remember looking at quite a, quite a lot um, long ago. And I don't think the fundamental research has changed that much that um, the relationship between competition and innovation is a little less certain than the relationship between competition and perhaps price and other, um, you know, maybe quality. So um, I think that we, we, we need to be a little cautious about, you know, we can assert, you know, if we like, that um, competition always drives innovation, but I think we should, you know, be, you know, a little humble in, in making that comment because I think it's a more complicated issue as Julie was mentioning. It really depends on the kind of innovation. There are factors other than market factors. If you go back and look at some of the work that was done by folks like Oliver Williamson on organizational form that there are internal inside the black box of the firm that you have to think about when you're thinking about innovation too. And that clearly falls outside the realm of antitrust law. But I think innovation is a complicated subject. So I, I don't think we should be glib about that relationship. But with that said, to the extent we have to pick, I generally think competition is a good thing and that we should, uh, we should use antitrust policy to encourage um, competitive markets. And so I think to the extent we have to uh, pick a way to go that we certainly don't want to, in my view, we don't want to encourage monopoly in the hopes that it's going to drive innovation. I think that would be unwise as well. Um, let me see what else I have to say here. Um, so um, and consistent with the goal of um, protecting consumers and consumer welfare, which I do think should be the lodestar for antitrust. Um, I'd like to see the agencies, there's a lot of attention and, you know, we're, you know, for, for good reason, focused on innovation and particularly in the technology sector. But to the extent that we do care about consumer welfare, I think it's really important that the agencies stay focused on those sectors of the economy that constitute the largest part of a consumer's budget. And I think we can all agree that is probably not Facebook and Google. 
Um, although the, they raise important competition policy issues, it's not affecting consumers' budgets that, that much, particularly in these difficult times. I think it would be wise for the agencies to retain a focus on healthcare, energy, uh, food and agriculture. If we care about consumers, we wanna care about where consumers spend their money and not go chase, chasing bright, shiny objects. The agencies have limited resources. So um, I think it's important to keep that in mind and to keep the consumer in mind, and that includes the consumer budget. Um, with that said, I, I, enforce, I, I support the um, agency efforts to enforce the, uh, to review and infor uh, the enforcement guidelines. I think there is some important work that um, could be done there. I don't want to preempt the, the next speaker, but I do think that the agencies have never really focused in my time at the FTC. I don't recall ever focusing on the impact of a merger on um, labor markets. Um, buyer power, uh, we, we certainly looked at cases where there was uh, issues of buyer power and the impact of a merger on um, how that would affect input markets. I don't recall ever those input markets ever including um, labor markets. So uh, maybe that's because it just, you know, wasn't an issue or, you know, we, we you know, that it, 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 you know, the labor seemed that there was very com competition in a particular sector and it, the merger was unlikely to affect labor markets. But I think when the agencies do um, uh, work on the guidelines, that looking at that and creating some new tools to think about the supply and the demand for labor and how you define markets for labor and treating it just like other input markets, but maybe giving it some more emphasis and making sure we have the right tools to understand that would be, um, would be a, a valuable addition to the, 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 um, the, uh, the merger guidelines. Um, and let me just, let me close up a little bit with some of the Ginger's comments and Julie's comments on um, startup acquisitions and killer acquisitions. Um, I think this is a, a very challenging area, obviously. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknowns. When I was at the agency, some of these transactions that are being criticized now were under review. And it's a lot easier to look at it in retrospect than at the time when you have emerging technologies, maybe m many, many small players, undefined products. It's really, it's a ch very challenging exercise. So, I mean, it's easy to be critical of the agencies if, you know, you aren't there at the time trying to actually do the work and thinking about whether you can actually get a case into um, court. So, um, I also, so I, and, and I share some of Julie's concerns about the legislation that we need to think about, particularly when we're thinking about the um, technology platforms that um, oftentimes, if we really are concerned about um, uh, some of these nascent acquisitions, all, all, Oftentimes, uh, the best party, you know, it may be the case anyway, you know, I don't know, I haven't done any research, but it can often be the case for the reasons Julie said, that the party that may be best able to take on an incumbent in a particular area may be somebody in an adjacent area. So some of these tech, tech uh, merger bills that will uh, uh, limit mergers based on the size of the platform owner, I think could be very counterproductive because it might take out some of the firms uh, that might be most well positioned to take on an, in, an incumbent in their core area. So I think oftentimes, as Julie was saying, it may be the adjacent area that creates synergies that might actually uh, improve competition. And one, one final remark, um, and this is um, in response to a little bit to Diana about the agencies and, and lax enforcement over the years. And, you know, we can all criticize um, the agencies for maybe not bringing as many cases we would like or being maybe timid in the area. But I think we should also recognize that, that uh, the FTC in particular has had some real successes. And I would point in particular to their work in hospital mergers as an example where they developed the tools and they created the research and they've had an extremely successful record in an area that has a real impact on the, the you know, on healthcare costs. And so I think we should, you know, take that into account that, that the agencies have not been, I would say, asleep at the wheel, but then they've certainly had some successes in some very important areas. So I, I just wanted to end with that. And then I'll um, look forward to discussing some of these issues with the rest of the panelists.
Great. Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, before we go over to our, our last panelist, I'll just as a reminder uh, for anyone watching online, you can use submit questions via Slido. I'll try to pull them up here. And uh, for everybody in the room, be sure to ask, uh, get your questions ready because I'm sure there should be many of them. So with that, we'll turn it over to, to Christina. All right. Thank you. Um, of course, thank you to GW and ITIF for having me. And particularly, um, thank you for thinking of me, having me on this great panel um, going last. Tough act to follow. Um, but thank you for Lisa for actually introducing some of my ideas. As she um, alluded to, I am going to be talking about employment. And actually, I'm going to be particularly talking about employment in the context of hospital mergers. Um, all of my research uh, does deal with hospital mergers. I really haven't looked at mergers in any other context. Um, so that's what I will be talking about today. Um, but how I even got started thinking about this, I'll sort of first take you back there, is because I was just sort of fascinated with that classic textbook question about the persistence uh, shortage of nurses. Um, so if you ever sort of open up any textbook, basically has been written, I think, in the past you know, 70 years, you're going to always find when you flip to the monopsony chapter that the explanation um, about the shortage of nurses is that there's monopsony power in the labor market. Um, but then if you actually turn to the empirical literature on monopsony, um, people have tried to look at that, and the research is not super convincing. So I started trying to kick around a few ideas of how could I actually look at this, because I do believe that monopsony power is the explanation for the shortage. And I started to think about, well, maybe I could look at hospital mergers. And that's how I got on to my research trajectory of researching hospital mergers. And so I thought that, OK, well, I'll look at hospital mergers and I'll see that um, you know, perhaps looking at hospital mergers would provide a nice change in concentration in the market. And if we see sort of the textbook um, change in market power, right, where you see that an exploitation of monopsony power, um, where the quantity of nurses hired goes down and the wages of nurses go down, then we can say, sure, great, right, this looks like um, monopsony power. And so what I did was um, I started looking at using American Hospital Association, basically the population of hospitals, and identified their mergers um, across, you know, basically about 25 years or so. And I looked at hospital mergers where the hospitals did in fact merge as using the definition of mergers by the AHA, which says that they now operate under one license going forward. Uh, going forward. You, you cannot um, disentangle those hospitals anymore. And these are two hospitals that when they merge, they do not close. So they still operate um, separate establishments. And I saw that when these hospitals merge, even immediately after, uh, the quantity of nurses, registered nurses, and licensed practical nurses decreased by quite a bit, by about 20%, immediately following the merger. And getting to sort of the dynamic question, those shortages, uh, those decreases in nurses were persistent. They, for as long as I looked at those mergers after, um, those shortages or those decreases, um, you know, followed. They never hired back more nurses. But what I wasn't seeing based on that initial, sort of that initial glance or cut of the data, was I wasn't seeing a decrease in wages. All right, so what can you take from this? You can maybe say, well, maybe this isn't a monopsony exploitation, right? Maybe that this is efficiencies. This is what the, the merging hospitals want to tell you. They say, look at us. Oh, we're super efficient now. We actually don't need um, those nurses. But that doesn't mean that, okay, even if you believe that argument, that doesn't mean that this isn't a negative welfare effect, right? Because these are people who don't have jobs anymore. So this maybe opens up a complicated welfare question that you might still want to think about when evaluating a merger. But then I started thinking, OK, well, I'm not really thinking about the actual market conditions that are going on in the market. So then I started classifying the markets as concentrated. What if I looked at when there's a change in concentration in already concentrated markets? And actually, you then do start to see what one might describe as monopsonistic exploitation when there is a hospital merger in concentrated markets. So you specifically see those when there is a hospital merger um, in markets with seven hospitals or less. 
you start to see not only is that decrease in nurses happening, but their wages are also decreasing. And those effects become more pronounced the more and more concentrated the market gets. And so that's what we might expect, right? And then that becomes particularly problematic, you might think, from an antitrust perspective. And that gets to a lot of what um, I think the rest of the panel has been saying, which is that we might want to think about having other things to consider when evaluating mergers, right? Because these effects might exist, right, no matter what your financial threshold is, right? Um, you know, this is, you need to be looking at the labor market conditions. Um, the way I, def uh, you might be curious, the way I define labor markets in my paper are using the component economic area, which is um, a market defined by uh, the BEA, which minimizes, it's based off of commuting patterns, and it minimizes um, people who work in one component economic area and live in another. Um, so it's, it is a, a version of a labor market, um, but my results are robust to basically other random definitions. So, you know, county or zip code, things like that. Um, so I spent time thinking about the labor market, but the nice thing is, is my results are robust to sort of random geographic um, definitions. Um, so that's one thing to think about. The other thing um, that I have researched besides labor markets and as Lisa had pointed out, not really something that she's familiar with that anyone has really actually used to evaluate mergers, um, is that when consolidations, we tend to use mergers to refer to just in general consolidations. And since HSR is used, those could be mergers, meaning that as defined by the AHA, that they operate under the same license going further, or those could be system joiners, which just means that you join the system, and those might be identified under HSR and subject to review by the FTC. Now, when I split those up as identified by the American Hospital Association into mergers and system joiners, I actually find that those mergers are, or those consolidations are fundamentally different. In fact, and I wrote them down because I can never remember exactly what the differences are. Well, I should say what goes up and what goes down. With system joiners, there are no significant effects. But with mergers, as defined by the AHA, you see a significant decrease in admissions, general beds, surgical beds, number of operations. You see increase in case mix, and you see an increase in ICU beds. But you don't see any of those changes in system joiners. Yet those system joiners are frequently scrutinized by the FTC. And we don't really see, though, the same exact effects that these mergers are. And all of these mergers, regardless of the financial, you know, whether they would qualify under HSR or not, are experiencing those effects. So that gets to Julian Ginger's point that we probably want something else besides HSR to be um, how we're targeting whether we should evaluate a merger. Um, and I think that was probably, oh, the, the last thing that I will end with um, before I pass it off for general comments is that, you know, there's also, I, I don't think I need to motivate people in this room to care about hospital mergers, um, but we always think of hospital mergers being in waves. And, you know, there's always some evidence that maybe we're in the downswing of a wave, couple years ago, it seemed like, well, we might be in the upswing again. There's some evidence, if you ask some researchers, um, that we that COVID might actually be spurring on more mergers um, in the next couple of years. So we might see a new wave of mergers again. And so these this might be time is, you know, of the essence more than ever. Okay, thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I hope everyone enjoyed those introductory remarks. I've spent the last couple of years only reading to my new daughter and newborn son. So I'm excited to be in front of a panel with real people <laughs> and talking about um, big picture ideas. Um, I, I'm, I have a feeling that our panelists may have some questions for each other. But maybe I'll start out with one to give you guys a moment to collect your thoughts on those after our, all of those presentations. Um, and we, we had the pleasure of hearing from Patty earlier at the Department of Justice. Uh, I came across an article talking about uh, Jonathan Cantor at the Department of Justice, and who described the last few decades of merger policies as a, quote, failed experiment. 
And then he offered support for remedies over settlements with a bias towards structural remedies, not behavioral remedies. And his office has suggested that there will be a four to seven times increase in lawsuits going forward. And I was just curious, um, perhaps maybe we could start online because I know it'll be more difficult to pick up on non-verbal non cues from our online participants, what your reaction might be to uh, some of those comments from a lead regulator in the Biden administration. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, take a shot at, at uh, answering that question. I, you know, the, the bottom line on remedies is that they have to be effective and effectiveness uh, goes to the ability of the remedy to fully restore or maintain competition lost by um, an illegal merger or illegal conduct, right? So the restoration of competition is really central to, to the remedy. I, I think a lot, even in the antitrust community, people tend to forget that the most effective remedy in many cases is for the government to move to block a merger. Let's just talk about mergers. So, uh, that, is, that is absolutely um, the most effective remedy. Uh, is to move to block a merger, especially in cases of highly concentrative, highly concentrative mergers that violate the structural presumption, uh, which you know has not been well enforced for, for many years. Um, AAI has really tracked the data on uh, how the government goes about um, dealing with challenge mergers. There's two pathways, as we all know. One is to is to challenge a murder, merger and simultaneously file a consent order containing remedies. The other is to challenge a merger. And or and and go to court, federal court, to to get an injunction to to stop it. Um, we've over time, say the last twenty years, um, the the there about fifteen percent of all challenge mergers have been settled. Um, more than fifteen percent have been settled with remedies. Then have been um, the, then the government has moved to block. So there's a gap there, right? The government absolutely historically has chosen to settle uh, challenge deals rather than move to block them. I, I mean, the reasons for that are obvious. It's costly to go to uh, court and challenge mergers. The agencies have, have uh, the capacity probably to litigate only a few major cases per year. Uh, those are scarce resources. And, and the government doesn't like getting um, hammered in court, right? That, that's not a, not a great outcome. So these are, you know, it's all about risk. But I think what's going on in the Biden in the Biden shops, the antitrust chiefs, is a signaling that they're willing to take more risks. And you know, the the position is, if we need to, if we need change, if we need stronger enforcement, more uh, invigorated enforcement, which AAI strongly supports and has advocated for for almost 25 years now, um, the whole risk assessment has to change. It has to change. There has to be some um, uh, acceptance. Uh, at the public and private enforcement levels that enforcers are willing to take more risks. And so that gap between, cha uh, between challenge mergers that are settled with remedies and challenge mergers there where the government goes to court, that gap should be closing. And um, you know, we, we're, we've been part of the debate uh, encouraging creative ways to do that. And I, I think part of the risk taking is that the government needs to find creative ways to litigate these cases and creative theories of harm in bringing complaints in the first place. So that's how I interpret what's coming out of, out of uh, the various shops, more so on the DOJ side. Great, thank you. Uh, Lisa, did you wanna add anything to that? Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, you started out with um, his, uh, uh, Jonathan Kander's remarks about structural versus behavioral. And I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, I think this is really about only a, a, an issue with vertical mergers. I don't think the agencies have ever, you know, been fond of behavioral remedies and horizontal mergers. So the behavioral remedy issue was usually an issue with um, vertical mergers. And on the um, on the structural remedies, I mean, I, you have to remember too, a lot of mergers are, you know, may have one or two business units or product lines that raise an issue in an otherwise very large, non-problematic, either pro-competitive or, or benign merger. So I think you have to, I mean, you don't, you know, you, I think those, that's an area where, where structural relief and divestiture seem, seem appropriate and not a good use of the agency resources, you know, to, if they can solve 
you know, a, a, an overlap in, in a particular business line. This happens all the time in pharmaceuticals in particular, where it may be a large pharmaceutical merger with one or two product lines that are creating the issue. And so I would hate to see the government, you know, litigate cases like that. I don't know how well they would do. But I certainly agree with Diana that, that there have been some failures in structural remedies, some, some notable, some very high profile ones. So I think the agencies can, can certainly do a better job with um, uh, vetting, you know, vetting the divestiture buyers. I, I remember the rental car case was kind of a fiasco at the FTC. And um, uh, Julie probably remembers that as well. And uh, so I, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not so simple. You know, I mean, the beginning of a new administration, we saw this at the beginning of the Obama administration with the tearing up of the Section 2 report. Uh, report. And so I think it's very easy to make these very bold statements. I think the agencies, you know, it's certainly they should be looking closely at their structural remedies and making sure they're effective. But I also think, you know, the agencies need to be judicious in how they're using their resources and pick their battles. And we certainly wouldn't want to see them challenging large deals with a couple of problematic overlaps. I think that would be uh, uh, not a good use of their, their, their resources. And as to vertical mergers, that's a very complicated issue, how to deal with um, vertical mergers and whether behavioral remedies are effective. And I haven't seen the research. Maybe Diana knows something about the, the research on, uh, on, that, on those issues. Um, you know, my reaction to um, uh, Cantor's remarks is best of luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, my um, most recent experiences with the FTC and I mean, to have that kind of ramp up in um, litigated merger challenges, that's a very, very resource intensive um, undertaking. And it's not at all clear to me, no, it is clear to me actually, um, that at least at the FTC, they don't have the budget to do that. Um, that may change. Biden's proposed a significant increase, but as we all know, it's Congress who does the appropriation. Um, and it requires a lot of staff. Um, and I just, I don't see that as even, as even feasible. Um, um, things might be different at the Justice Department. I can't speak to that. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the failure of remedies, but we've not said anything about the success of remedies. So given how resource intensive litigation is and how expensive it is, when there are easy structural remedies to undertake to resolve competition concerns, then I think the agency should be taking them. And, you know, a number of years ago, the FTC actually went back and studied the effectiveness of their remedies and found that the structural remedies were actually pretty effective in resolving competition uh, concerns arising from the merger. I know in my own experience, um, you know, you do get to work on very exciting things when you're at the agencies like truck stop mergers. And, you know, in, in that case of a merger of national truck stop chains, you know, there was no concerns for long haul trucking fleets that traveled in the southern United States because there was this really um, aggressively expanding truck stop chain you might be familiar with if you do any uh, uh, um, you know, travel throughout the country called Loves. And we're expanding aggressively. They started in the South, we're expanding aggressively there. They weren't really present in the North. And so when we talked to long haul trucking fleets that mainly operated in the Northern part of the country, they were really concerned about this deal. So a really easy fix and one that I think was super effective was divestitures to Loves who got a whole um, um, package of truck stops and because they were already aggressively expanding and already had plans to expand in the northern part of the country, we were able to preserve competition through that divestiture. And so I think it's important that um, when we're, we need to think about the trade-offs here. And, and I, I just add to something that Ginger said about, you know, how can we, we make um, the agency's review process more effective um, by introducing things like AI into the merger review process? You know, the parties that propose these deals already do that, right? They're already using these tools. And so the agencies starting out of the gate are already undermatched. Um, and so to say that you're going to litigate more and 
are going to do so with fewer people, less money, and worse tools, I think it's, it's just a losing proposition. Can I just jump back in on the remedies issue? I don't want to belabor this, but I, it's really important, and I think it's a central component of invigorating and strengthening merger control, which uh, you know is really the first line of defense against rising concentration. If you if you allow mergers and you allow markets to concentrate, you're going to have a higher incidence of the emergence of dominant firms and tight oligopolies. Look at airlines. Look at wireless telecommunications. Those are you know leading examples. Um, but but on the on the remedies front, uh, you know I don't think the problem should be underestimated in terms of the failed remedy. Uh, look at what happened in Live Nation Ticketmaster last year, right? Right. So the government takes you know they they negotiate a consent decree on a merger that involves Ticketmaster that has an eighty percent market share. That's a monopoly by any 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 definition, right? Um, the 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 merger has horizontal and vertical components. Uh, DOJ allows it to go through. Um, they take some behavioral remedies, basically non-discrimination remedies, and, and then they uh, require the divestiture of a tiny little asset, ticketing asset. Well, you know, 10 years later, here's DOJ, you know, filing a motion to amend the consent decree because they've done an investigation showing that Ticketmaster has threatened and harassed, you know, rival concert venues for 10 years. So ineffective remedy, massive failure of a remedy. Instead of, instead of uh, bringing a consummated Section 7 case to challenge the deal, which has been done, the FTC's done it many times, instead of bringing a Section 2 case uh, uh, for monopolization claims, the, the Trump DOJ decides to amend the consent order and leave the conduct remedies, the ineffective conduct remedies in place for another five years. That is a massive failure of antitrust enforcement. I would also point out that the FTC's policy, and this is nothing against anybody on this panel, the, the, the FTC's merger policy in pharma is, is been a massive failure. The FTC has approved 67 mergers um, with divestitures. They have really never blocked, moved to block a merger. So what we have is a shrinking pool of branded and generic drug firms that are trading assets around through merger and divestiture. And guess what? A non-trivial per percentage of those drug companies, branded and generics, are now the subject of federal price-fixing indictments, private cases, pay-for-delay cases, all sorts of stuff. That is not a good record on, um, on merger policy in the pharmaceutical sector. So I think this is a top-line issue for enforcement. I just want to make a comment. I don't think it's wise to aim number of cases brought to the court as the goal of an agency. And that seems in fundamental violation of rule of reason. Like, for example, if the deterrence effect of effective enforcement is so much that you sh sh don't need to bring any case, right? And that would be against the goal of the number of cases you want to brought. So, so I, I really don't think that should be the goal of the agency. It should be based on um, the facts of each merger. <laughs> And to respond to Diana's um, point about pharmaceutical mergers, uh, I remember uh, FTC had a case suing um, Crestcore for um, kind of example of killer acquisition and, and Crestcore eventually um, settled with FTC. I think that's a case actually below the HSR uh, reporting and FTC looked at that case in spite of that and, and was able to find out that it was trying to um, kill a um, parallel elevation that would eventually um, hurt competition. So, so I think I mean, FTC have done cases like that um, to try to restore competition in the pharma area. I mean, of course, we can debate on different cases and whether FTC have done enough in this area. But to say that FTC has done nothing in this area, I, I don't think that's fair to FTC. Yeah, I want to add a couple things. First, I think um, Ginger is exactly on point that the goal should not be just to bring as many cases as possible. That um, I think would be bad, bad policy. Um, second, I was I did not have a chance to read the Canner interview, so I was just looking it up here. Um, so I wanted to be clear that 
was he calling the failed experiment antitrust policy in general or specifically on mergers? And he is referring specifically to mergers. I wanted to mention sort of just a small anecdote. I was on a panel, I guess it was about a month ago. I had mentioned to you that the DePaul Health Law Panel, I don't know if any of you were in the audience for, um, for that symposium. And on my panel was general counsel for the American Hospital Association. And she was very, very pro-merger. I did not realize that the AHA general counsel would take such a strong position um, on this. I'm not sure if that was naive on my part, but apparently the American Hospital Association, it must be public knowledge because she was advertising this, um, hired out um, Charles Rivers to do a, um, a study on mergers for, and apparently just mergers are fantastic. Prices, you know, prices decrease. They're Maybe if there are employment effects, oh, they're wonderful and everyone who's employed is happy. And I mean, you, she just couldn't say enough about how wonderful mergers are and how every anyone who argues against them are crazy people. Um, so I thought that was very interesting that AHA is running around saying that hospitals should be merging and this is great for healthcare, that patient outcomes are fantastic. Um, Second, and this is only sort of tangentially related, but thinking about, you know, if in general, is, has antitrust policy been a failed experiment in the past few years? I mean, it sort of depends the perspective that you're coming from. And I don't want to seem like I'm some like pure Chicago school person, but I thought that Lisa made a fantastic point by saying, going after Facebook and Google, I mean, this is not really what they should be doing, right? Because from the perspective of, you know, what are consumers spending their money on? I always think to myself when they're going after these cases, um, what are the what's the price, right? Are they monopoly pricing? Well, it's free, right? I don't think it's hard to argue that a product that I pay that I use all the time that I don't pay a dime for, right, is that harmful to society. Um, so I agree that you know if you know they shouldn't really be going after. I know that from a mainstream perspective, everyone thinks of these companies as, you know, maybe the big bad wolf, but, and obviously they can't get very far going after them. Um, so if they want to continue to feel like antitrust policy has been a failed experiment, sure, keep going after them, right? I mean, that's going to sort of be this like self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so I, yeah, I do think that sort of they're wasting their time on, on those aspects. Uh, just one small thing to add to, to what Christina said. And um, something that um, was mentioned earlier, maybe Patty mentioned it in, in her remarks about the executive order on competition. And one of the areas that the executive order mentions is, I don't know if it's, it's healthcare or hospitals specifically. I think it does mention hospitals specifically. But, you know, when I think about the um, enforcement portfolio for the Federal Trade Commission, if I had to pick one space that the agency has been most aggressive in enforcement with respect to mergers, I would pick hospitals. <laughs> um, so I was a little bit taken aback when I saw that in the executive order. And I think what's a little bit missing from this conversation about more aggressive merger enforcement is exactly how the FTC came to be so aggressive in hospitals. And it's because they were losing cases. <laughs> And they had the foresight to say, let's figure out why this is happening, right? And so they did a merger retrospective study in hospitals and on that basis brought a consummated merger challenge and won and successfully demonstrated to the courts that courts, you've been using the wrong standard all this time. Here's the right standard. And the FTC doesn't win them all, but has been wildly successful using that approach. And I think what's missing from the conversation now is if you think that the agencies are losing too many cases or aren't bringing cases because they anticipate losing them because of the current precedents in the court, then I think that you need to show that those precedents are wrong, right? That you need to do the work to demonstrate that the courts are getting it wrong and here's Here's the right way um, that enforcement should proceed. OK, great. I, I... Oh, Lisa, did you want to jump back in? Oh, no, I was just going to I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. I mean, I think in particular, 
um, you know, I think to the extent, you know, everybody, everybody has always loved to focus on innovation effects. I mean, this isn't really new. I mean, this has been an issue for, for ages. It's very, very sexy and it, it's interesting. And there may be some there, there that the agencies are missing. But I think if they really want to focus on it in a serious way, they need to go back and do just what we were talking about that they did in hospital mergers. You need to do the work and develop the research and find the right test case. And you need to do it in a serious way. And I think some of these, I mean, I'm, I'm frankly very, you know, particularly disappointed with, with the FTC. There's a lot of wild and very aggressive statements and they're, and I, I, I don't think it's gonna help the agency in the long run. There are very, very good and serious people there, unfortunately, Julie left, <laughs> but that can, that can do the kind of research and work to help advance the agenda, just like they did in hospital mergers. But these are very aggressive statements that are coming out of the FTC that aren't backed by anything is not gonna help the agency in, in, in the long run. And so I, I, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed to see Jonathan Cantor moving who I thought would be a little more of an adult in the room, possibly, you know, following that same pattern, although I still have some hope for John. <laughs> so that's my, that's my rant. <laughs> okay, great. I, uh, so we have about 15 minutes left. So if anybody does have any questions, feel free to, to offer them. I, how about maybe I'll try this. We'll try to just do a quick one where you say <laughs> yes or no, or you say yes, like higher or lower level. So this, this is tough, but maybe we'll try this. So the White House is requesting an increase of funding of $227 million towards the FTC's Competition Bureau, which would get $139 million, and the DOJ's Antitrust Division, $88 million. I'm pretty sure I have those numbers right. Anybody feel free to double check me on that. Um, and as, as Patty was mentioning earlier, a lot, that would go towards um, it, um, hiring, right? That would bring more people to it so that then they can turn around and then do more. Is that the right amount of money, too much money? Um, how should Congress react? Um, yes, but, um, so the bite is, um, you know, Patty mentioned the enforcer summit that happened, um, last week at which, um, a question was posed to Lena Khan about her legislative wish list. And on that legislative wish list was structural presumptions, because in order to bring all this litigation that Jonathan Canto wants to bring, that's expensive. But if we have structural presumptions, then we don't need economic experts. And those are a very expensive part of bringing uh, enforcement actions. And so I would say, yes, if we do not also at the same time introduce structural presumptions, because apparently you don't need that money um, if we're just going to go by the numbers. Yeah, I guess I will offer yes, but as well. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Julie's but, but let me provide the second but. Um, I, I really think that um, more resources have to be sought systematically of how to use those resources. If those resources just used to make the uh, wild statement and without evidence backed up or structural presumptions that without any theory of harm or um, or evidence, then I would argue that more resources would be worse. That's, I, I really want to push for technology-driven um, overhaul of those agencies' tools and, and really back that up with robust theory of harm. You, you can't just sort of pull things out of thin air and say that this is the direction we're going and let's throw all the money towards that direction. What if that could be wrong? What if that generate tons of um, detriment to the society. I, I think we have to sort of evaluate in this direction, the right direction, and that evaluation has to be based on data and on unsensible theory, not just the magical thinking, I guess. Um, I, I'm happy to jump in on that. I, I think the, the answer is a hard yes. Yes, the agencies need more funding. And uh, but, but uh, you know, as the others have said, there's some qualifiers. Um, I, unfortunately, I think my comments about the agencies taking more risks and being more aggressive about bringing cases was interpreted as, well, let's just bring more cases and go to federal court. That was not the interpretation. The interpretation is for the agencies to take additional funding, to think hard about how their agencies can run more efficiently, how they can improve um, you know, the quality of their staff, which is already incredibly high. You know, these are incredibly well-respected, talented career uh, FTCers and DOJers. Um, but to, to, to begin to, you know, expand the scope, uh, it's not just law and economics anymore. It's law, economics, and engineering, 
and, and you know, sociology and business disciplines like marketing and strategic management, the agency should be thinking about a multidisciplinary lens and bringing on those resources and improving and modernizing their data collection standards. And all of this will channel into bringing more creative cases and litigating, learning how to litigate cases more creatively and effectively. It, it's, it's also tied up in agency guidance. I mean, you know, the merger RFI, for example, that, you know, we, AAI is planning on, on you know, obviously submitting comments, but th there's a lot that the agencies can do to modernize and clarify the merger guidelines, which will then give transparency and predictability to the business community. Uh, how about revising the merger remedies manual for all of these failed remedies? That would be great guidance. That would be a great way to signal out to the business community what the agencies intend to do and how they intend to proceed. So it's not all about just taking the money and bringing more cases and rolling the dice. It's about doing it in a coherent, constructive, and, and smart way. I'll, I'll just thank you, Diana. I'll add on that. That may have come from my prompting of the question. There was from an article was from uh, one of someone that worked in Jonathan Cantor's office that suggested four to seven times increase in lawsuits. So that may have been the impetus behind that that reaction. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Christina. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add. All I would say about the 227 is that um, I have no idea if that's the right amount of money, right? I mean, I, I would say much more informed people uh, in theory, right? I Who knows if they're more informed or not I came up with um, came up with that amount of money. Um, and I will take them at their word that that is at least the amount that we can afford to give them. But yeah, any amount in theory is better, right? We have monotonic preferences. And and Lisa, should that should there be that much money? To, should Congress say? I, yes? I, I mean, I I I I don't know enough about the current agency budget and the percentage. I mean, I think the agencies, you know, could definitely use more resources in litigating cases they face. Um, very well funded um, uh, private parties with you know the cost of experts. I remember was just. One of the more challenging. So yes, I guess if we if we institute presumptions, those costs would go down. Although I don't think we should do that um, cautiously. But um, I think more funding is is a good idea. And I agree with Diana that a more um, you know to bring on into more a more interdisciplinary approach to sort of keep up with um, uh, the developing business models, particularly technology business models in healthcare. I think. Um, you know, more resources are 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 certainly justified. I, I don't I don't have a good take on a particular number, but I'm not worried about giving them too much money that they're, you know, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> um, can I add a point just to extend Diana's point? Um, I think money in the agencies definitely would help, but on the other hand, the agency probably want to think about what other resources they can leverage on. Right? For example, that's some of the um, bold statement from um, DOJ and FTC have actually generated fair amount of academic research trying to search for evidence, search for a theory of harm. And I think many academics probably are willing and much happy to help those agencies and so I think those are the resources that could be uh, leveraged on by the agencies and not necessarily consume um, the dollars allocated to those agencies. And same, same argument apply to, say, computer scientists, sociologists, or many, many other disciplines that could contribute to this area. Great. Okay. Um, so I, one more idea for a question. I think we're down to our last you know, seven minutes here. Um, and I know Julie wanted to spend a moment talking about maybe the benefits of mergers. We had, had brought that up earlier. Um, and in Jerry Ellard's book, uh, Schumpeter would argue that large firms are better able to finance R&D expenses, spread innovation risks, attract more human capital, and exploit innovations. You know, is that, should we be leaning more towards that? Or is the, say, Tim Wu, who's special assistant to the president for technology and competition policy, who, you know, made... Uh, Justice Brandeis's curse of bigness, um, very well known as a phrase. Uh, should we be? Should we want to lean towards big firms, or is is big an issue at all, or is there a curse of it, or not? And how how mergers play a role in that? Um, sh sure. So I I was surprised. I I wasn't wasn't present, but I I had heard that um, the current uh, director of the Bureau of Competition at the FTC stated, or I didn't state, but was asked. Um, at the ABA meetings last week if there were any benefits to mergers and it sounds like she struggled to come up with any, um, which I just um, am flabbergasted by that. Um, 
So I think, you know, I think that we should, we should um, steer clear of size-based thresholds, right? Small firms can be innovative. Large firms can be innovative, right? The Gaffham firms that we were talking about earlier last year spent over $100 billion on R&D. That's a lot of R&D, right? And so I think, um, I think the size-based thresholds are really problematic. I'll just give one example of a merger benefit. Um, I think it's helpful to have some sort of illustrative examples. So um, in 2016, Walmart acquired Jet. If you haven't like ridden on the DC Metro, the only way I learned about Jet was from their advertisements on the DC Metro. But um, so Jet was supposed to be like this discount alternative to Amazon. I'm not even sure how you charge lower prices than Amazon, but this was their business model. Um, and they were acquired by Walmart in 2016. And at the time, Walmart, or like in the year prior to the acquisition, Walmart maybe had around $14 billion globally in e-commerce sales. As a reference point, Amazon's e-commerce sales at that same time, just in North America, were about five times that amount, right? So in terms of e-commerce, Walmart was nothing, right? Certainly a powerhouse in brick and mortar retail, but in e-commerce, it wasn't happening, right? After they acquired Jet, right, their e-commerce sales increased on average by about 40% for the next three years, right? Um, I think uh, in the, I don't want to include the pandemic because that sort of screwed up e-commerce sales for everybody, but um, in a good way. Um, but I think in the year before the pandemic, they had something like $30 billion in e-commerce sales just in North America or just in the United States. And so I think if you think about innovation, right, innovation is not just I have this new shiny thing that didn't exist before. Innovation is also business model innovation. And Walmart could have probably built up that e-commerce business without the acquisition of Jet. It would have taken longer. It probably would have been more costly. And they would have been a less effective competitor to Amazon in the e-commerce space. And we all would have been a lot worse off during the pandemic, right? And so I think it's important to realize that there can be these sort of in these, these kinds of innovation benefits for mergers that um that are really important and that we shouldn't discount just because it's a large firm acquiring a small firm. Uh, great. Uh, Lisa or Diana, would you like to chime in on that at all as well? I mean, I'll just very, very quickly. I mean, I, I agree um, wholeheartedly with, with Julie on that. I think that some of the legislation, um, I, I'm very, I, I dislike the um, size based thresholds as being used as a burden shifting device, because I think, as Julie just said, oftentimes the best competitor to an incumbent may be somebody who's very large in another space. And there are certainly, um, you know, there are certainly uh, efficiencies that can be associated with size. I think we should avoid making general statements about the relationship between size, Schumpeter notwithstanding about the relationship between um, firm size and innovation. I think we need to look at that on a fact specific basis, but I think having presumptions based on the size, solely on the size of a firm to deter mergers would be a mistake. Okay, great. Uh, perhaps maybe for a final question, um, it, was, it was brought up during and Patty's comments. Uh, right now, the merger guidelines are up for perhaps a renewal. There's public comments. I, I think there's it's up to about 4,000, Patty. I thought I looked on regulations.gov this morning. I don't know. Yeah. Yep. So I, th I think it was just shy of 4,000. But I, I may have looked at it. I looked at it quickly earlier. But comments are due in seven days. Um, so obviously, this is an opportunity for the public and everyone sitting here to chime in on that. Uh, are there... Any any last minute advice or uh, what people should put into comments for something like this? Um, how might and maybe as a as a last parting shot, uh, Richard Pierce, who was on the panel earlier, he's written about this in the regulatory review. Updates in administrative law may cause courts to be more skeptical um, of 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 a merger stoppage stoppages based on like recent court court cases. Um, but I was just wondering what what might the agencies do to update those and how how they should uh, react to comments on those today. 
And maybe Diana, if you want to start too. Or... Sure. So, you know, good luck to the agencies processing. Processing, you know, a mountain of comments. When I was at the FERC and working on the open access rule, um, we we had a similar number of comments, and it took the agency two years to weed through comments, to digest them, to organize them, and to respond to them in the final rule, uh, which is required, you know, under regulatory um, requirements. So um, that's going to be a big job. At the same time, and it's going to take a lot of staff resources. At the same time, the agencies have committed to uh, engaging in more aggressive uh, enforcement. So, you know, good good for the increased funding levels for, for, for sure. Um, I, you know, AAIs, uh, we lay out our principles, what we think are good uh, merger guidelines, um, you know, of general applicability that have widespread um, applicability across different industries. Uh, they should delineate uh, settled principles, right, uh, and agency policy, but they should not be prescriptive or embody aspirational principles, for example, that attempt to broaden or change sta existing standards and frameworks and bring in non-competition uh, goals or aka pro-social goals. I think that's going to be really important. And, and there are other sort of general parameters and principles. I, I think a major risk here is that if um, these revised guidelines uh, do do some of those things and move away from you know, settled principles, um, a, a focus on effects-based analysis, uh, incorporation of different types of evidence, uh, some modernization of, of what's in the guidelines, I think the risk that a, the next administration, if the administration turns over, it is extremely high that those guidelines will be pulled. They will be pulled back, much like the vertical merger guidelines were pulled back. Um, that actually creates an enormous amount of disruption and discontinuity, um, not only for the business community, but also for the advocacy community, right? And for other government agencies. So it, the goal here is not to create guidelines that are such a departure um, that they will be immediately pulled back and it will be a do-over and a start over, which will then, you know, suck up more agency resources and divert divert resources away from the business of enforcement. And so, you know, I hope that theme uh, comes through in the comments that the agencies are getting. Um, I'll echo a lot of what Diana said. Um, let's be clear: the agency doesn't have to issue any guidelines. There's no requirement that they provide the business community with any guidance as to what their enforcement intentions are. This is. Um, a benefit that the agencies provide to the business community. Um, I think in order for it to be most effective, as Diana said, I think it should reflect agency experience in bringing merger cases. I think it should reflect the agency's enforcement intentions um, and should not be aspirational. Um, I think if you, as Diana said, um, move away from those things, it does uh, create a lot of uncertainty and um, you know, potentially is uh, deterring um, pro competitive innovation enhancing mergers. Great. Uh, any last thoughts on that, Lisa, before we part ways? Um, I, I just, I, I'll just echo what, what the others ha have said. I, I think it's unfortunate that we're starting to see, I mean, the, you know, guidelines, agency guidelines, um, ideally are bipartisan <laughs> to, to have any effect. I mean, they've, you know, I, I, I think until recently, that was always the case. Certainly, the, you know, they've always been bipartisan. The merger guidelines in the past, unanimous, bipartisan. Otherwise, you do, just as Diana said, they get pulled. And, you know, if you do want to use the guide, you know, the guidelines are often influential in the courts. And to the extent we're starting to get this up and back and this partisan, you know, split over the guidelines, I think, you know, I'm worried that they'll lose their impact in the court. So, I'm a little concerned with how this project, because I don't see them coming out with something that's going to get a 5-0 vote uh, at the FTC and unanimous support from DOJ. So, you know, I, I, you know, on the heels of withdrawing the vertical merger guidelines, you know, I'm, I, I'm unfortunately, um, like many things today, not optimistic <laughs> that we're going to reach a rational outcome here. Well, great. I think we covered a lot of ground there. I think we ended up with a lot of agreement, but also some uh, differences of opinions along the way uh, after 
everyone got the opportunity to learn from this panel. I hope you go add your voice on the comment, Roger, so uh, Patty and everyone at DOJ and elsewhere can, can read them and, and take your insights in. Uh, one thing I want to follow up on afterwards is uh, AI, how you might AI might be incorporated into this. That perhaps to be a future topic for you guys here. Um, and I'll, I'll end with, uh, so it, we're the, what brought this together was Jerry Ellard's book. And um, for anybody that knew Jerry, uh, I, we all very much miss him. Um, one of the questions I know he would ask with this is where's the harm? So, I, you know, I hope regulators always define that. Um, but we're going to do a commemorative or a memorial event for him in George Mason University on June 9th, which you are all welcome to attend. Uh, details for that on our website. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, panel, both online and in person. And uh, it was great to be here with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Time for lunch.
All right, um, welcome back everyone from our delightful lunch break and um, welcome back to those who are uh, with us online today. I am um, delighted uh, to moderate this next panel on IP innovation and antitrust tools reconsidered. Um, I have a great group of panelists to talk about this uh, this afternoon. So I'm gonna briefly introduce them um, and then we'll sort of dive right into the discussion. Unlike the previous panels, I'm not going to let them give opening remarks. We're just gonna dive into questions. And um, so I'd like to remind um, folks in the room, but most importantly, people viewing online, you can ask questions of the panel um, using Slido. So if you just go to slido.com, and the hashtag is ITIFGW antitrust, and you can pose your questions there. I will see them here, and I will um, be more than happy to pose them to our panelists. Um, <clears throat> so speaking of our panelists, um, today we have with us uh, Dr. Chris Stomberg. Chris is a director at Mira Economic Consulting. He's an economic expert with deep expertise in healthcare and life sciences. Um, he served as an expert witness in several matters and has focused on a range of issues, including pharmaceutical pricing, intellectual property, and antitrust. Um, next to Chris, we have Richard Langua. Richard is a professor of economics at the University of Connecticut. He writes and teaches primarily about the economics of organization and about economic and business history. He's the author of The Corporation and the 20th Century, which will appear later this year from Princeton University Press. And then next to Richard, we have uh, Megan Brody. Megan is a partner at Cooley. She regularly counsels clients on a variety of topics, including pricing practices, mm -hmm. licensing of intellectual property, and other distribution issues. She has experience in matters before the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission and state antitrust authorities, as well as in federal court. So I'm really excited uh, for this panel today. Um, unlike the last panel where um, I had a lot to say, um, I'm really excited to, uh, to learn from our panelists today um, about an area of innovation that um, I have considerably less experience in. Um, but before we sort of dive into that, I just kind of want to set up um, some background for our conversation. So um, over the last 10 years or so, um, this narrative has taken hold, largely promulgated by what I'll call progressives, what um, they themselves call themselves neo-Brandeisians, um, that large dominant firms are holding back the pace of innovation and growth in the US economy by limiting access to their intellectual property and to their patents in particular. So Matt Stoller, who's the director of research at the American Economic Liberties Project has written that today, American intellectual property is locked into dominant firms who spend large amounts of money making sure no one else can use it. Um, Lena Kahn, current chair of the Federal Trade Commission, while a fellow of the Open Markets Institute wrote, concentration of economic control undermines growth because dominant firms can hold back the pace of advancement. Today, a handful of companies across sectors wield outsized control over key technologies, Monsanto over genetic traits, for example, or Intel over semiconductors. Many of these businesses have come to monopolize these tools primarily through rolling up competitors and their patents. While patents are vital for promoting innovation, they are also routinely abused to weaken rivals, as well as to stunt development by fencing off corporate estates. And last but not least, um, Barry Lynn, who's the executive director of Open Markets, suggests we resolve these concerns by breaking open the corporate patent vaults, writing while he was a fellow at New America, which vaults of patents should we crack open first? The fact is we don't know which ideas will prove useful to us over time. Now, those that now seem most promising might not pan out. Others less glitterly, glittery in their infancy might yield wonders. The only way to find out is to drag the ideas into the light and let the public pick through them and play with them just as we did in the golden age of American prosperity. So 
I'm going to start with Richard. Um, so this quote that I just read from Barry Lynn suggests that cracking open the patent vaults is not a new idea. I was hoping you could uh, talk about when in the past have we heard this call to open the patent vaults and what happened then and, and what were some of the consequences? Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm not a, an intellectual property person and not a a person who's worked like many many of you here in the in the agency, so I'm I'm actually delighted to be here to listen to uh, what people have to say as you, uh, about these these things that I know so little about. Uh, as you see, I'm I'm mainly a business and economic historian these days, and so I'm taking sort of a longer view and a much up higher um, higher level view of these things. Although, there, there, I guess as a disclaimer, there's one thing that um, Julie left out of my bio, and that is that um, just like Lena Kahn, I was once the the editor of the student newspaper at Williams College. So, so although I've never I've never been at on, at the FTC, I, I'm certainly qualified to be there. So, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, One of the things that we've heard several times in, in the last session, especially, is that is that some people believe that the last 40 years were a mistake in antitrust policy. Um, it's not clear to me that that's true, and in fact, it's not clear to me that, that the, the, the period before that wasn't a mistake, because it's, it's very hard to find very many triumphs in the period of intense antitrust um, Starting with the New Deal and and continuing into the uh, into the interwar periods, um, and so the claim the claim that that uh, Julie was citing is that the large firms today are are kind of hoarding ideas internally, um, and that's sort of interesting from from an economic history perspective because what actually happened in the 20th century was that before the Depression, there was a very active market for uh, for uh, acquisitions and new ideas. So, uh, in fact, large firms didn't even have yet developed their own research and development labs, and they would buy stuff on the market, and that was actually their business model, right? So the, so the way we create new ideas in the country is we have all these people out there creating these new ideas, having patents, and they maybe, but certainly like little startups, and we we... Uh, we acquire them. That came crashing to a halt with the Great Depression, partly because of the Depression itself, because it uh, it, it made it very difficult for small firms to get um, to get financing, which which increased the relative abilities of the large firms. But it was also true during the uh, during the during the New Deal. Um, Patty said this morning that now we're, we're, there's a ferment of antitrust that we haven't seen since the since the Sherman Act. Well, that's sort of not true actually, uh, but that, that it was it, it was probably much more ferment even during the, the New Deal. If you list, read some of the things that were said, uh, you think some of the things that, were, that, that are being said today are outrageous. You should go back and look at some of the things that the, that, that the administration was saying back during, the, uh, the, uh, during the, the New Deal. The Secretary of the Interior said that we were threatened with a big business fascist America and that sort of, that sort of thing. And, and the but uh, of course, the issue in those days was unemployment. So big business was 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 blamed for um, was blamed for unemployment. So there was a, there was a, a very strong antitrust policy. I'm go that go into detail if people want on this that, that started in the New Deal and continued through the post-war period, and it was made it essentially impossible for firms to do very much. Um, for the big firms to acquire new, uh, smaller firms, uh, that was we were you know by the '60s in the era of the, you know the Vons grocery era, where even any any kind of tiny concentration was considered uh, was considered bad. So so what happened? Well, what happened is the firms did things in house, right? So in fact, what what we observe in the in the 20th century is that is that not allowing firms to buy ideas on the market led them to internalize and, and hoard ideas internally. So if you can't trade for ideas in a in a market, then what are you going to do? Well, you're going to do them, you're going to uh, engage in these activities internally. And in fact, your, your research and development may well be biased as it was towards systemic proprietary technologies that could be 
handled by large research and development labs and could be and could be undertaken in house. So in a sense, it's just sort of sort of the other way around. That and and I think that's something that needs to be kept in mind today in the de in the debates about. Uh, you know, killer acquisitions and 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 so on. If you've got, if we want to go back to a regime where you can't buy any little firms at all, uh, then what that's going to mean is the big firms are going to get, they're going to do things internally and they're going to hoard ideas internally. And that may not be because it's in a patent vault. It might be trade secrets and it might be, right? It might be tacit knowledge. It might be a lot of things that are inside of the firm because I mean, you have to keep in mind is there are always, Firms always figure out ways to substitute. And somebody, maybe it was you, made, mentioned organization. I think that's terribly important that firms can innovate along an organizational margin as well. And so they can internalize transactions when they can't buy them in the market. And if they can buy them in the market, then they, they might, um, they might e externalize them. Um, what about intellectual property? And as I say, I'm not... Uh, I'm not really an intellectual property person, so I, so I see this from a very high altitude it is certainly the case that i think that i uh, or you could certainly make the case that economists are pretty negative about patents um that a lot of economists don't think they're worth the candle um but people make a distinction uh well dick nelson and bob Murgis made a distinction between um scientific based for uh, inventions like pharma where, and I think we talked about this this morning, where, the, where it really is a whole new idea. You're coming, coming up with a whole new molecule. Um, that fits the traditional economist model of patents very well. But you also have complex systems technologies like cars or, or computers or things like that, which are made up of a lot of complementary products. And in that case, it's not clear what the patent that the patents are playing exactly the exactly the same role here and, and i'll want to let the other people talk because they know more about this uh, uh, than i do but uh, i would at a very 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 high conceptual level um i would make the case for thinking about patents as property rights and you might say well of course they're property rights there's actually two two schools of thought about patents. One is the, that patents are a privilege. That was an idea that was very popular starting in the, I forget the guy's name now, starting in the New Deal, that patents are not property rights, they're a privilege and we can take them away anytime we want. And the other view is that property, that they should be seen as property rights um, that are, that are how the, you know, they're like other property rights. And, and I'm very big on the, on the ideas of the legal scholar, Henry Smith, that some of you may know, he thinks about property rights in terms of the theory of modularity, which are that property rights a way of modular, modularizing ideas or modularizing physical things um, and to reduce transaction costs and allow, trans, and allow uh, trading on markets. And I think the, the way to think about it, and I don't really have the answers, I say that's not my, my main area, but I think the, the, the way to think about it is to think about properly scaling those property rights, to think about uh, intellectual property rights as property rights, as things that are modules that can be traded among other, uh, that people can trade with one another. How long to create, how long they should live is a question, right? Uh, Murgis and Nelson um, argue for narrow scope of patents and don't, don't make patents too to the scope of patents very um, very big because then you can get you can get blocks and and so on if you make the patents lower than people can trade but so so there's a negative story about patents that gets told you know uh, um uh, anti-com patent anti-commons and and those kinds of stories but i think on the other side of it if it, there is something to be said for creating ownership structures in intellectual property. So in, in semiconductor design, for example, she mentioned semiconductors here, actually patents are not terribly important in the semiconductor industry um, because they move, too, they move too fast and Intel is no longer very successful in the semiconductor industry. Um, 
but in design of semiconductors, they have these 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 uh, intellectual property blocks for designs that can actually be traded, and designers can actually trade pieces of a design among one another, sort of like MP3s, right? So, so you buy you buy this guy's MP3 and you, you plug that into your into your design. And I think if we think about it, intellectual property that way, that's more of a facilitating role for creating property rights rather than a blocking role for creating property rights. But I look forward to hearing what the real experts have to say. Um, I assure you, Richard, you're a real expert or we wouldn't have invited you today, but thank you. <laughs> um, um, so um, I'd like to turn to Chris next. So. Um, Suppose the Neobrandeisians get their wish um, and we crack open the patent vaults and all the jewels come spilling out. Um, should we expect another golden age of prosperity, as Barry Lynn um, suggests, or is there more to the innovation story than just patents? Um, yeah, I'll actually answer that in sort of two ways. Um, I think the thing to, so I'm going to look at this more from the pharmaceutical industry perspective where intellectual property plays an enormous role and those rights are crucial to the innovation. And we can talk more about that later. But, you know, so imagine these patent vaults in the pharmaceutical companies, um, they're cracked open all the time. Um, if you look today at um, the typical prescription that you pick up at the pharmacy, nine times out of 10, that will be filled by generic pharmaceutical. That is an off-patent drug that has at one time been a patented pharmaceutical. It was probably very expensive at the time. In fact, you go back to the New York Times from 1990, you'll probably see that drug feature on the headline about how expensive it was because it was covered by a patent at that time. Um, the generics industry in the United States has actually been um, very successful at moving products from patent products to um, generic products. And so much so that this has been uh, you know, sort of for decades, uh, something that frankly the, the patent holders worry about all the time in that industry. And, and you know, again, come back to that nine out of 10 prescriptions are generic drugs today. That wasn't always the case. If you go back to pre-1984, when the Hatch-Waxman Act was passed, Hatch-Waxman Act creates special patent rules for generic drugs in the United States that enable manufacturers, for example, to start practicing the patents before, they, before the patent has expired. That's unique to the industry, and it also shortens the amount of time required to get them onto the market once they've either litigated the patent and knocked it out of the way, or if they waited till the patent has expired and come onto the market. There are a number of other rules, hatch wax and act. You go to any antitrust conference and talk about pharmaceuticals, people will talk your ears off for hours about that. Um, but that was Congress's way of balancing you know, the needs of, in, of innovators to protect the rights that they need to get the returns that they need for the investments that they, the very risky investments that they make versus transferring the benefits of that eventually to consumers in terms of, of lower priced products. So in one sense, right, in the pharmaceutical industry, we, we, we've got this mechanism that Congress came up with that opens the vaults all the time. Um, but I think I'll turn now also to sort of the second part of my answer to that question, kind of looking at, you know, current events. You know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. And I think there, um, an important part of, of the question here is what do we mean by intellectual property here? Um, and I think Dick actually touched on this a little bit. Not all of it is patents. And in fact, in, in a lot of these cases, Increasingly, it's not about the patents. It's about other sort of trade secret technologies that bring the product to market. And this is sort of evolving. There's a lot of technological innovation that is making this so. So once upon a time, all our drugs were what we call small molecule drugs. And these are <clears throat> fairly, they're literally small molecules. You can write down on a piece of paper, what are the atoms that go into this thing? And that, you know, any skilled chemists can basically synthesize that and create it. And so there's this huge industry surrounding creating these things. Barriers to entry are quite low. Um, and uh, in fact, some of the, you know, today large generic pharmaceutical companies started in someone's garage. So this is, you know, in some sense, not a hard technology to master. 
but you get to modern technologies like the mRNA um, technologies. There are probably hundreds of patents that sort of create all the enabling technologies to create these products. And that's just the starting point. Um, once you have this, you then have to make it. And the making of these things is not trivial. Um, biologic drugs in general are, you know, I had one person liken it to brewing beer as opposed to synthesizing a, a chemical. And um, the process requires a number of very precise um, interlocking um, manufacturing steps. And those are almost never patented. And they're almost always trade secret. So you can hand someone the patents. So you can unlock the vault and hand it to them. And they will be not able to do anything with it. Because the, you know, probably millions of man hours that went into enabling that patent to become a product um, still isn't there. And so it's, you know, it, it sounds really basic, like let's just give everyone access to this patent. And the answer is you kind of, that's not enough in some sense. And yet, if you go to the next step and say, well, then you also have to give all the trade secret technology over too. Well, then you're basically asking the company to say, go out of business, you know, and, you know, give everything you have to these potential competitors. And so I think that's why you see resistance from the industry on these things, because they they do have to stay in business. We want them to stay in business because they are hopefully going to bring more products like this to market. So I think this is the tension with, with these, these kinds of ideas. Yeah, and presumably the profits that they earn is providing them some incentive to come up with these new uh, molecules in the, in the first instance. So the patents don't just fall into the vault like manna from heaven, presumably. Um, so, um, Chris brought up mRNA, so I know this is not going to work for the people at home, but um, if you look at a recent issue of Nature, there's this neat graphic that has all of the patentees uh, for mRNA and all of the licensing relationships which exist. It's, it's pretty complex. Um, and so... Um, I think just to sort of echo Chris's point, that in some sense the vault is open, mm -hmm. right? People are using one another's um, one another's technology. But I want to talk about sort of RMNA, excuse me, mRNA. Um, as um, so, my background is in technology spaces, not in pharma, which is why I'm really excited to have all these sort of pharma um, experts to talk to. But um, you know, I've heard some talk that. Um, mRNA is sort of shifting to be like sort of what I would think of as almost like a platform technology in the pharma space, um, something that other things are sort of built on top of. And, you know, my experience in, in thinking about sort of a platform or a standard in some sense is, is in technology and specifically in, in, um, in communications technology, thinking about cellular standards and Wi-Fi standards. Um, and so to sort of bring this conversation tie it back into antitrust. Um, I'm wondering, so like in, in the technology standards, right, we're, we, we say to firms, you can effectively collude over technology choice, but in return, we're not gonna let you exploit um, the market power that you've gained through that collusion, right? So we have these sort of antitrust safeguards. That doesn't mean that it all goes swimmingly. There's lots of disputes and, and, there's, and there's concerns there as well. I don't know, Chris or Megan or, or, or Dick also, if, if mRNA becomes standardized in that way or becomes sort of like this platform technology, so how do you see that these licensing relationships continuing? Um, what's the role for antitrust here in ensuring access to the, to the platform or to the standard? Um, anyone have thoughts on that? Okay. Uh <laughs> Sure. Okay. Oh, my mic is live. Um, yeah, I mean, this is interesting, right? So this this sort of brings in the whole concept of like standards, essential patents, um, and you know, this has you know, been disputes for a number of years in the cell phone industry, for example, over the role of Qualcomm's technology being used in cell phones, and how is that technology licensed among the various firms that need to compete in the cell phone business using that technology? And um, you know, so I think. Without getting into sort of the antitrust 
questions that go specifically to you know those types of cases, I think there may be some analogies here in the in in the pharmaceutical industry. And mRNA is just one area where I think you see, especially with the the advancement of technology, um, it is increasingly hard for any one firm to in-house all of the technology required to bring any product to market. And so they're relying on technologies that may be not exclusively licensed. And so then what is the role of the firm that has that, that patent that they're licensing across the industry? And if it becomes a technology that's embedded in everything, at what point do we sort of see that as being a concern? I don't know. I mean, this is sort of not something that I think has really come up in the, in the industry. Um, but I think you could see a future where maybe that that is something to think about because, I mean, there are other therapeutic categories where there are technologies or molecules, um, methods of discovery um, that I think um, are shared by the industry and, you know, licensed uh, from, you know, sort of the same underlying organizations. And so I think that maybe um, we'll see more of that. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting problem in pharma where traditionally licensing was very much focused on the drug itself, right? It was the product was what was covered by the license because they were these small molecules, super easy to make, and you needed that intellectual property right to make the research that came to discovering it worthwhile. Whereas these are the licenses that you're talking about now are more process, right? They're more on the how do you make the drug, not the what is the drug. And that's a brand new concept a little bit because of the evolution of technology in the pharmaceutical space. And I mean, once we get there, once it is a how do you do the, how do you create the drug, I think we're going to have a lot of the same problems that we do see in the standard essential patents. So we are going to have the hold up and hold out because those are economic incentives and those are not, they didn't exist in pharma before because the intellectual property was to cover the drug, not the process. But I think we are going to see a lot more of that on a go forward basis. So, you know, bringing up sort of these hold up, hold out concerns, I just, in the, um, you know, in the, in the tech space with the standard essential patents uh, for communications, for example, right? So a lot of that, you know, it's sort of mistakenly referred to as standard setting, but really it's standards development, right? And so um, a lot of these technologies that ultimately end up in standards, firms are actually actively developing these while sort of the standards development process is going on with the understanding, right, that if their technology then gets incorporated into, into the standard, right, yes, they're making some commitments that they'll accept a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory royalty for it, but that there's going to be a huge licensing market, um, and so and so for I think for those firms, right? There's this there's this trade-off. I'm accepting a lower price, but I'm going to have more licensees, and so you can sort of see that that sort of profit incentive to to engage in, in that process and in that in that innovation. I'm just sort of wondering in the pharma space where there's not that ex ante commitment, right? So how do you sort of trade off? you know, I'm, I'm, I'm innovating with the explicit intent to hold up, right? Because that's how I'm going to get remunerated for the investments that I'm making in this process. Um, sort of what's the role for antitrust there when you don't have those ex-ante commitments? So, so I think that's a phenomenal question. If you're not, if you don't have the firms working together, then it's pretty hard for anyone to have a commitment before that. So does antitrust have a role in a scenario where you have a single firm who mm -hmm. has invented something that allows it to become a monopolist? And I, I'm not sure what role antitrust has there because that is very much the competitive process working the way that we believe the, the competitive process is. If you created something that is a new market, you should be able to benefit from that. I mean, I think some people would say Illumina very much is there today um, as a company that invented NGS and they are doing very well for themselves. I think they're having a lot of trouble buying up and down market as we've all seen um, from the antitrust authorities. But in NGS themselves, that, that, that is a mechanism to do something. That is a mechanism to, you know, the, or, uh, the, uh, sequence the genome. And so 
in that way, if, if that had required multiple companies to come together to generate that technology, then I think we would have, we would start to see scenarios where we are putting together um, standard setting organizations because then we would have a standard. But where you've created the standard yourself, I don't know that antitrust has much of a role there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, in some sense, right, we're speculating a little bit because this is sort of a very, you know, new area. But I think, uh, you know, certainly one one clear distinction here is that um, is that of interoperability, right? There's you know, in in markets where you need technologies that can kind of interoperate among, you know, possibly competitor uh, offerings, you know, but using the same underlying technologies, which is a sort of economically inefficient thing to do. Um, yeah, I think this, there's sort of a difference here in pharma in the sense that it, you know, what we're talking about is more of a shared technology, um, but not necessarily a standard that enables the competition in some sense. Although maybe it, it does in the sense that, you know, these technologies are, um, you know, they, they're enabling technologies for classes of products that might get, you know, come into the market through different organizations and then compete with one another so that you do want to see you know, these innovative technologies sort of spread and you want to see that multiple licensing happening. I think that does bring you know, more competitive um, pressure and, and that's probably good. At the same time, you know, there's probably, you know, again, these are all private, or, you know, private negotiations. So uh, you know, what's in the sort of long run interest of the firm that's done, that made the invention maybe um, not to spread it widely, but to spread it narrowly. Again, you know, I think it's just very sort of fact specific. And I think at this point, you know, unclear exactly how the analogy works in pharma. Um, but I think it's, I think it is, you know, as we've seen technology move, I mean, it sort of raises some interesting questions along those lines for sure. Um, I don't know. I'm just curious to, I'm, as I've mentioned, I'm not very close to the farmer space, but is this, is, have you, like, has there been any advocacy towards moving to that kind of system? Is there, is there any, anybody really pushing for that or, or is pharma's just going to keep doing pharma's thing? <laughs> I mean, there's certainly a lot of litigation. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, over who owns the rights to what. Um, and, you know, at what point in the value chain are they located and what, um, what aspects of, um, you know, value generation downstream should create value generation for the, the holder of the underlying technology. And there may be disputes among who, whose technology that actually was. So there's, so it, the courts are very actively involved. Um, and I think that that's, I think that's very important. Um, you know, there have been some very, um, in, you know, big litigations over the last several years over, for example, what do we mean by, uh, you know, what you know, did the, you know, does the patent cover something? Can I keep you out of this market because it infringes my patent, but the pat does the patent I have actually describe exactly what you were doing or is it too vague? And the courts are trying to work that out. Um, and again, it's very sort of, it, it's very specific to the science of, you know, what does the patent say and how is, you know, where, do, where does that right end it, for me and begin for you <laughs> in some sense. And I, I think that that's uh, you know, very fact specific for each of these technologies, honestly. Um, that's helpful. So um, we've been talking a lot about the complexities of licensing in the pharma space as a way to um, diffuse innovation. Um, Megan, I'm wondering, maybe you could talk a little bit about what other tools um, there are for promoting innovation, particularly in the pharma space, and, and especially what role um, there is for acquisitions. We've talked a lot today about killer acquisitions. This feels very much like the time to really take that issue head on. Um, um, and, you know, maybe more generally, if you can just talk about how the agencies think about innovation and as, as you've been before them in, in the context of merger review. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I, I think what we're asking about is patent acquisitions. And I think that's a, not necessarily a well-known 
definition. So I just want to level set before we go down this road on what a patent acquisition is. And here I'm referring to the wholesale transfer of the right to exclude someone from making, using, or selling an innovation. Um, and this includes patent assignments as well as exclusive licenses, um, but not ex non-exclusive licenses, which is what we were just covering here. Um, and I also do want to, this is not pharma specific, but I do think that an important piece of how the agencies today are thinking about patent licenses is the introduction of patent assertion entities, also known as PAEs. Um, the FTC and its 6B study define PAEs as, quote, businesses that acquire patents from third parties and seek to generate revenue by asserting them against alleged infringers that PAEs monetize their patents primarily through licensing negotiations with alleged infringers, infringement litigation, or both. In other words, PAEs do not rely on producing, manufacturing, and selling goods. So they're not, these are not operating entities. These are entities that entirely make their money on acquiring a patent and then enforcing it. Um, and so because of that, their intensives are quite different and they've presented a lot of really novel issues that the agencies are grappling with today. Um, and so, First question is, can patent acquisitions be pro-competitive? And I think there's lots of ways that they are in that they, um, there are lots of firms that have the capability of creating new inventions, but lack the means or scale to effectively monetize. And this is particularly true in the pharma space. Um, and so a patent assignment would allow that firm to effectively monetize their R&D effort by providing the patent to a firm that can effectively commercialize the invention. Um, it also allows firms to prioritize what they're good at. So if one firm is really good at ideas, but really bad at commercializing, then a transfer is better for all of us to move it to the company who is operationally excellent, but perhaps less innovative. And let's be realistic here. We are all people, and we've seen in our day-to-day -day lives that there are people who are really good at ideas, and some people are really good at keeping their trains running on time, and firms are operated by companies. And so that's just a reality of the world we live in. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, actually, patent acquisitions democratize the um, innovation insofar as it means the little guy can be doing R&D in their garage and then have a path out to make that a worthwhile endeavor. Um, so there's, I think we need, I would say, I would argue that we all need to accept that there are benefits to patent acquisitions. Um, so the question becomes, are there potential harms from patent acquisition? And of course, the answer to that question also is yes. Um, a DO, uh, DA, AAG, Jonathan Cantor, actually recently discussed um, anti-competitive moat building strategy as one of the big concerns coming out of the DOJ. And he there he was focused on digital markets. And he defined moat building as, quote, erecting barriers to entry that protect the core monopoly itself, um, even if it doesn't mean that they're leveraging a dominant position in a current relevant market. So that includes acquisitions of nascent competitors, and including their patents that are not purely horizontal or vertical, but just sort of like start to expand the conglomerate. Um, and he, it does seem quite akin to the idea of a patent thicket, which I'm sure Julie is quite familiar with, um, that there are like mo multiple overlapping patents and just gets really hard to innovate in this space. So I think he, we're moving towards that direction also in the acquisition space and getting to those types of concerns. We've also seen these types of concerns voiced at the FTC and the White House. Um, Lena Khan announced that um, her big tech study saw that the um, large companies are devoting tremendous resources to acquiring startups, patent portfolios, and entire teams of technologists. And they were able to do so largely outside of the purview of the FTC. And we'll get to that question. Um, and the White House executive order uh, that came out in July 2021, which is been discussed is that too often patent and other um, laws have been used to misuse to inhibit or delay for years or even decades competition from generic and biosimilars and Chris will quibble with if it's been successful <laughs> um, <laughs> and denying Americans access to lower cost drugs. Um, so that gets us to I think what is the real relevant question for this group and for our discussion um, and what should be the balance between allowing patent acquisitions so we can get all of those great benefits um, versus making sure that we are not allowing or protecting against um, acquisitions of patents that result in the harm to competition. Um, and so I think that, and 
most, uh, uh, most of the answers can actually be found in the existing US antitrust framework um, under which state federal agencies as well as private plaintiffs have a robust, robust set of tools to choose and private plaintiffs have substantial incentives to use. Um, leading to all the litigation that Chris was talking about. <laughs> um, so, and that's not to say that I believe that the level of enforcement historically, or even under the current administration appropriate, but like, let's just focus first on what are the tools that are available. So looking at it from a statute perspective, a lawyer nerdy hat perspective, um, first we've got the section one of the Sherman Act, and that's where an anti-competitive patent acquisition can violate sec uh, section one or multiple partners uh, patent holders were to form a patent pool. So everybody gets together, they form basically a joint venture and the patent pool, uh, pool acquires it. Um, if that effectively creates a monopoly or is otherwise exclusive, that could violate section one. Um, section two, a anti-competitive patent acquisition can also violate section two where a patent acquirer becomes a monopolist by that acquisition. So that seems like for all of the big tech concerns, that seems like a very obvious pre-existing tool that we could use, uh, that the agencies could use to protect against those concerns. Then there's section seven of the Clayton Act. Um, and there, if an acquisition substantially lessens competition, um, then the HSR Act would consider that a, that would be a violation of the Clayton Act um, and because of that, the HSR Act, which is the procedural piece that requires filing with the agencies, does consider patent acquisitions to be reportable assets, including exclusive licenses. And indeed, one of the ways that the agencies have tried to address perceived failures to police this area of law is in 2013, the FTC revised the HSR regulations to require reporting of pharmaceutical patent licenses, conferring all commercially significant rights, um, even where the licensor retains some co-development, co-promote, co-market. So like this was what the FTC was saying, like, well, we're missing all of these uh, exclusive licenses. And there was a mechanism, and I think an entirely appropriate mechanism to start to capture those and say that the agencies will start to look at these functional tra transfers of assets. And then last, and perhaps most controversially, there's the Section 5 of the FTC Act. Um, and there's a big debate we won't spend much time on today about whether that can uh, capture conduct that goes beyond the scope of the antitrust laws. But at a minimum, it would cover an invitation to form an anti-competitive um, patent pool or otherwise. And it is it has formed the base of one of the cases that I'll be talking about in this discussion that I think is worth mentioning for. So. I think a reasonable question one might ask here is, sure, those are the relevant statutes, but is intellectual property really something that we govern the same rules as other assets? Which I think is exactly what Dick was getting at. Like, is IP an asset? Is IP um, property? And I, I agree that I think that that's a fair question. And there are fundamental differences between the right to exclude, which is what a patent is, as opposed to a manufacturing plant, which is the ability to manufacture widget X. Um, but I don't know that it changes the standards that we should apply. I think it still is fun fundamentally an asset or fundamentally property. And there are different aspects of it that we need to contour our analysis around. But that does not mean that we need to treat it differently under the laws. And I think the DOJ and FTC understand this in their current IP licensing guidelines, which at least for the moment do not seem to be on the chopping block, um, have... <laughs> have considered this issue. And those guidelines say that the agencies apply the same general antitrust principles to conduct involving intellectual property that they apply to conduct involving other forms of tangible or intangible property. But they also, even these old guidelines, recognize that there are distinctions between IP and hard assets. Um, and there they introduce the concept of a technology market. And they define that as the market for intellectual property that is licensed and is close substitutes. So using this concept, we can think we can wrap our heads around what is a market for IP and we can employ those tools to assess the competitive effects. And so if a acquirer effectively obtains a monopoly over the technology market, meaning that they and they buy up all the patents to do in order to, I don't know. Uh, manufacture wireless mics, then that would be a monopoly over the technology market for manufacturing wireless mics, even if that person or that entity does not actually manufacture the wireless mic. Um, there's also all sorts of other potential harms, but I will move on so I'm not monopolizing this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I want to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then I think there is one other really great benefit to the antitrust laws um, of using the uh, historic um, frameworks is that they're incredibly flexible. And there have been all sorts of different concerns over all of our careers about what the misuse of patents in um, different industries or in different methods. And that, um, and while we want to encourage innovation, I mean, this entire panel and this entire um, program is about encouraging in innovation that moves the economy forward. The reality is that firms are also going to innovate business models that make them more money. Um, and so they're going to find ways to get to that um, organizational innovation, as Dick put it. So in 10 to 15 years ago, we were seeing a lot of interest in acquisitions that resulted in SEP abuse. There was NData, where basically um, NData bought National, who had committed to a um, standard-setting organization that it would license on FRAN terms. And NData was like, well, that was a bad deal, and basically was <laughs> reneging on that commitment. And the FTC settled with them under Section 5. So again, query, but it at least established the concept that there was a cognizable theory of harm there. Um, and then the DOJ and a bunch of smartphone patent acquisition cases uh, investigated the same basic theory and got comfortable that because the acquirers had committed that they would abide by the commitments, then that was not going to be, that was not going to result in a harm to competition. But then fast forward 10 years, we've got these new companies, these new uh, PAEs, um, and this is a whole new business model that's drawn interest from both the DOJ and the FTC, and the concern that many private plaintiffs are having is that, hey, you bought up all of these um, patents, and now I'm stuck paying you a ridiculous, from the implementer's perspective, a ridiculous license, a ridiculously expensive license in order to um, use these technologies, and that's anti-competitive, otherwise unfair. Um, and and what we've seen so far is that the DOJ and FTC have submitted statement of interest in these case, cases, and they're saying, look, maybe nor, and, and what um, these PAEs are saying is that the enforcement of their intellectual property right, regardless of how they purchased it, is protected by Nor Pennington because this is one of those, um, this is petitioning the government functionally. And the FTC and DOJ are submitting statements of interest saying, yeah, maybe the enforcement of the patent is covered by Nora Pennington, but the acquisition of it is not necessarily covered by Nora Pennington. And so there is a space for antitrust here. Um, so, And so we've seen that in the intellectual ventures versus Capital One case, as well as um, Intel against Fortress. And in, um, in the Intel versus Fortress case, what Happen, what's, what's happening is that they're actually failing at defining the relevant market. So going back to what I was talking about earlier, intellectual uh, IP licensing guidelines say you have to define a relevant market that is a substitute of patents, um, and that needs to be a cognizable market. And in the Intel case, what did they do? They defined it as um, a electronics patent market, which, of course, is incredibly <laughs> broad. <laughs> And so they lost, but that doesn't mean that the theory of harm is not a theory that was workable. It just means that they needed to do a little bit of work on their market definition. So <laughs> I'll leave you with that. Um, I've got like a whole list of questions now. Um, I'm not sure where to start, but perhaps I'll start by saying those of us watching from home um, are welcome to ask questions via Slido. So please um, submit those and I'd be happy to direct those to the panelists. Um, I'm really delighted to hear somebody besides the authors of the PAE report, of which I was one, has read the PAE report. So um, that was sort of worth the price of admission for me today. Um, but so maybe starting from my earliest question based on, on things you've said, um, Megan, um, so I'll note that the FTC referred to these entities as patent assertion entities and not patent trolls, um, <clears throat> somewhat intentionally because there, there is, that's a bit pejorative. Um, so I guess, do we think that, um, you know, through these acquisitions that the PAEs are making, is this really sort of technology transfer and diffusion of technology, right? That, you know, 
this is is this Barry Lynn's cracking open the patent vaults and and operating companies were just sitting on these patents and they'll be useful to other people and so this is a really efficient way to transfer technology or is this really there's some rents to be made here and I'm going to go get uh, nuisance value um, out of some implementers. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that is an incredibly difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and I think a lot of it um, is based on how the, I think either could be true and it really does come down a little bit to how the PAE or the vault opener behaves, right? Like, so if, if they, if they are all profit maximizing entities, which they probably, most of them are, then you're, they are going to be rent seeking because that's, that's literally their business model. Um, but I do think that there is some, and I, I think probably what's realistic is that most of what they're purchasing was not that the current operating firms were sitting on. It's probably patents that were from other companies, right? So like Intel's not selling all of its patents to some PAE because they know that they're just going to turn around and sue them, right? It's those uh, other, um, other that they were probably unenforced patents. And so to the extent that that's what they're buying up and then forcing them, they're unenforced and unused patents to the extent that that's the type of patent that they're buying. Um, I don't know that it's going to be, I, I don't know that that is the opening of the vault. That <laughs> I, I'm trying to understand what the inefficiency is of the, of the patent troll. So you've got five patents and that, that, that are needed to make wireless microphones, and suppose there's no patent troll, then they're all owned by five different companies all over the place. And then the patent troll buys them. Why is that more inefficient than them being owned by five different companies? That assumes that all five were actually, that the person making the wireless mic was actually paying a license to all five of those companies, which I think is a, an assumption. <laughs> so that some of them just weren't being asserted they existed, but they just weren't being asserted. So, the, so the troll is making money by doing what was legal, could have done, been done legally before, but just wasn't being done it, it, legally. Is that, is that the way? Of yeah, I mean, I think in some sense, right? That's just rent shifting, right? It's I was earning some profit, not licensing the technology. Um, if I included the licensing of the technology, I might still be making a positive profit. I, I make less when I license the technology. I give that to the to the PAE. Um, so it, so I don't know that it's. I mean, there might be some transactions costs there, right? But um, compared to universe where the five uh, patentees were all demanding a license, it might be more efficient. Right now, I only have to deal with one party instead of dealing with five. Um, there is an issue, though, right? And so I, I want to get back to um, something else that you raised about these statement of interest that you said the agencies are filing in these in these um, PAE cases. Um, I'm I'm curious, right? So there's this issue of, and and this is a little bit what I had raised on the earlier panel. Um, about substitutes and complements, although they didn't quite put it that way, right? Is that if I have a PAE that's assembling a portfolio of complementary patents, so the five patents that I need to, to run my wireless mic, right? I can't run it with just three of them, three of them right? If I, if I have the wireless mic, I'm infringing all five. It's not like I can either choose these two or I can choose these other two or whatever, right? So they're all they're all necessary, versus a PAE that um, assembles substitute patents, right? So there was this is not quite the same story, but right, I, I'm sort of I'm not I'm gonna, not going to get the details quite right, but right, there was some like LASIK patent pool or something, right, where it was substitute patents and and basically they were entering into these exclusionary exclusionary. Um, uh, uh, agreements. But I guess my question is more, um, you know, you were saying that the agencies say, oh, well, the acquisition of the patents is, um, is, is what's um, where antitrust can reach. And so I'm just wondering, is the argument that they're making that these are a collection of substitute technologies? Um, and if so, I know you said that DOJ had reviewed some of these bigger patent acquisitions um, in the past, but are these just not getting reported? I don't know if you, uh, this is, this is, 
I'm enjoying being a moderator of this panel because I'm learning a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if you could provide any color on that. I, I do think there is um, a level to some of it is not being reported because um, outside of pharma, if the licensor retains any rights, then it's a non-exclusive license and it doesn't have to be reported. So I do think that that's partly part of it outside of um, the pharma space, which is regularly reported and I report pharma exclusive licenses all the time. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that is probably a piece of it. And then I think it's also... I think the market definition, where I sort of mocked the one case at the end there, I think it is harder just because there's less, there's a lot less out there of how do you define a technology market? What is a substitutable patent? It's, it's easy when it's really fundamental um, technology, but there's all of these little incremental improvements and when does that become a substitute? And that those are really hard questions that I think the agency would struggle with. Um, yeah, and so having done valuation of some of the patented technologies, I can tell you that it matters whether you're looking at it today or tomorrow or the next day too, because as these as these patents go through a process of development, some turn out to be you know, spectacularly valuable and some turn out to be complete duds and some are somewhere in between, maybe it's leaking license out to someone else. Um, but it matters very much where in that process you are. So it could look a lot like something else and be completely different from a sort of a value perspective, which tells you something about sort of what's its commercial potential and things like that. So I, mean, I think that there's, I think this sounds like a very difficult test. <laughs> you know, what are the substances? I mean, and in that valuation, is in, in a lot of areas of valuation, you look at what are the comparables and let's look at, you know, sort of what was the, the, the transactional value of that comparable technology and in pharma that's very difficult to do because literally every every product could have a completely different value just depending on you know, sort of where in the development process you are or where whether it's marketable or where it's marketable how, how much of the problem of hold up in in patents is is just ex post regret rather than inefficiency because if if it, if you hold somebody up then you're just transferring rents from one party to another and not changing the pie Whereas if people anticipate that the holdup is going to occur, then they might use a less efficient technology. But if, if it's, a, as you say, a surprise, that all of a sudden, oh, this patent turns out nobody thought was very important. Now it's really important now. Well, we don't want to pay that much for it, right? Is, that, is there really any inefficiency there? Or is this people just complaining because all of a sudden they have to pay, they have to transfer rents to people? I do think the intellectual property laws are based on the premise that Everyone knows that the patents exist, which is not, I mean, which I don't think is how the world plays out, but like the, you do have to make your patent public, right? And so the idea is that patents will not come up on you as a surprise. And so I think that like the IP, maybe it's an IP law problem, but the idea is that that fact pattern shouldn't exist, that we should have perfect information about all patented mm -hmm. is my feeling that. Yeah, and I'll just say from experience, I think companies make different choices as to how deep down, how far, how aggressive they want to be about sort of clearing the runway for their own product development cycle. And there may be some technologies that say this is really unlikely to be infringing and, you know, we'll contest it if we need to down the road. So I think that's, I mean, there's, there's, there's commercial decision making that goes into how they think about a lot of that stuff, I think, as well. And I think, um, so outside of the pharma space, um, in uh, sort of technology standards, right? As Megan suggested in patents more generally, like in theory, there shouldn't be holdup, right? Because they've they know holdup can happen. And so they've designed mechanisms through the standard setting or standards development organizations to limit that occurring. Um, that said, <laughs> um, there are, you know, potentially instances of ex post holdup um, I think there are potentially, um, there can be some real costs um, when that happens in the following sense. So I designed my mobile phone um, with all these really cool features under the assumption that I'm going to get the technology, understanding that this is vague, at a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory rate, right, with all the uncertainty that it, it, that involves, right? So I've made some, you know, forecast about what I think my, um, you know, royalty obligations are going to be based on that. I designed my phone 
and then that turns out to not be the case, right? And so if we think of sort of current profits as sort of funding the next wave of innovation, I take the profits from this phone to sort of fund the R&D for the next generation. What's, what's the cool thing, right, that's going to go in the next phone that now isn't because my return was less than I had forecast? I mean... The as I, there's a lot of hand waving there, as you notice, I'm waving my hands while describing this 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 outcome. But this is sort of the argument that gets made, um, sort of by the downstream players. That what I think of as the implementers in 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 the um, in the telecommunications space um, about even though in theory there shouldn't be this ex post holdup that 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 it occurs and that there can be real consequences because of it. So. Um, I want to um, return to an earlier thread um, that uh, Dick opened us up with um, and sort of loop it back into pharma though. Um, so, and that is, you know, sort of Dick, you, you laid out this sort of history for us that there was this history of acquiring innovation and, um, when antitrust enforcement got really aggressive, that was sort of taking, taken in-house. Um, but then we opened up the vaults, and so maybe the incentives to do things in-house are less. I don't know, Chris or, or Jake, if you want to comment, sort of like what does is, what is innovation look like in pharma today? Is it big companies taking it in-house? Is it we're acquiring innovation, some combination of the two, and, and, and what then maybe are the implications for innovation of this space from some of the proposals, opening the vaults or cracking down on acquisitions, et cetera. Yeah, I'd like to hear the answer to that too. But, but <laughs> in terms of opening the, the vaults, it, it is true that, that antitrust did open the vaults in the past, right? So, so you think you got, um, uh, well, people talk about AT&T, although that's a mistake because AT&T want, wanted to, uh, to open the licensing to the transistor be, uh, years before the, the years before the consent decree. That was always their business model because AT&T didn't make its money off of patent licensing. It made its money off of being regulated. So they did, and, and also they they knew they were going to benefit from giving the transistor out to a lot of people who could develop it, who could develop it for them. Um, but then they had a similar thing for um, for IBM, but IBM acqu uh, uh, acquiesced to the cross-licensing agreement because they want to get out of the business of punch cards anyway um, and get into the business of computers. And then there was the RCA consent decree so where, they, where it was a, 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 a zero um, licensing fee patent pool that if you put one patent in, you got to the right to get everybody else's patents for free. And so what, what RCA did is promptly go license all of its technology to Japan. So um, that's why you're an economist because of that, because of the because of the uh, the RCA uh, consent consent decree. Uh, so you know, so that's not that that's not new. I mean, the other thing I thought was interesting was the um, uh, thinking of thinking about patent pools as 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 monopolies, because of course that was seen as the solution rather than patent pools were seen as the solution, not causing, right? Not not creating monopolies, and in fact. Uh, when, you know, especially during the war, uh, companies were allowed to um, uh, cooperate with each other in research. They stopped that immediately after the war because they knew they were going to get into antitrust trouble if they start if they were cooperating. But all that, a lot of that innovation that you saw during the war, penicillin and all of that stuff, was all cooperation between these firms who were sharing who were sharing patents and and cooperative research. And then all that that's another thing that sort of came to a halt after the war because of because of tight antitrust policy and the companies were afraid of were afraid of cooperative research. And, but I don't know. Uh, I'd I'd like to hear what's what the story is today in pharma. I'll, I'll try to say something about that. Um, yeah, and it's very difficult to characterize, you know, such a large industry in, in you know, a few so short sentences. But I think, you know, Megan, you said something earlier that kind of really struck a chord, which is, it reminds me of Thomas Edison's quote, famous quote, um, you know, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And I think that's very true of a lot of these patented technologies in pharma that's, that's very 
very much the case. And if you look at the, the pharmaceutical industry today, and I don't, and this has maybe changed a bit over the years, but there's a very active uh, industry of relatively small organizations innovating um, all the time in a variety of different dimensions. The mRNA, mRNA technologies, for example, are, are an example of that sort of thing. These are not giant, um, giant pharma companies coming up with this in-house. These are small biotechs scattered all over the planet. Um, you know, BioNTech's a German company. Uh, you look at the United States, um, there are clusters of innovation in, in places like Boston and actually here in Washington, D.C., out in California, San Diego, Bay Area, um, and scattered in other parts of the world. And the important thing is that th these early stage technologies are extremely risky, right? You come up with the innovation, the, the sort of the inspiration. And the chances of that is something that becomes a commercializable technology are relatively small. So even if you get to the point of starting your phase one trials, you've got to go through three phases of trials before you go to the FDA with a product. 10% chance of getting out of that with an FDA approval. And then that's no guarantee that you actually have a commercially successful product. That's like another phase that involves whether people actually want what you've created. And there are many instances where that doesn't happen either. Um, and COVID is actually kind of an interesting example of sort of the two sides of that coin, right? We've all sort of experienced the spectacular success of, of the vaccines. I mean, we're all sitting in this room right now because we have vaccines, you know, because that has come through so rapidly and sort of it was kind of a miracle of science, right? But if you look at the treatment side of the world, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of wreckage on the side of the road in that in that part of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I have this chart that I love to show people. It's sort of like all the ways that a, that a product can fail in these in these uh, in these uh, phases of, of product discovery. And there's a lot of ways they can fail. And, and if you watch, I get sort of the JAMA news every day and there's like another trial that just went south and some other promising looking uh, treatment for COVID, you know, is, you know, burning by the side of the road. So I, th you know, I think progress has been made in that area more recently. But it is, you know, I think an example of sort of the two sides of how that, you know, sort of risky process sort of plays out. So th there's another dimension to it too, which is, um, I think it's safe to say it's a really complicated industry to be in if uh, you're actually commercializing a product and selling it. Um, there's a lot of scrutiny. The FDA pays a lot of attention to how you package your product, how you um, market it. Um, what happens to patients who are taking it after it's out on the market. You know, when you do your studies, you have, you know, a sample that is large enough to get statistical significance in your scientific studies. That's not millions of people. When you have millions of people, things may show up that maybe you didn't see in your trials. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong and spectacularly wrong, and they're very expensive. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, having done all of all of that work and gotten to the market right so there, there are these things that will you know possibly cause you to come like back out of the market and many of them are things that a smaller company might have no experience with uh, i've worked on a number of cases that involve the doj um, dealing with government payments so the false claims act um, if you've marketed the product in a way that is um, possibly considered um, spreading falsities about you know the particular characteristics of the product and the government is paying through Medicare, for example, for the product, they may have a claim. And that could be, you know, costing billions of dollars. Um, similarly, um, you know, there's lots of compliance that you have to go through in terms of your manufacturing facilities and so forth. Now, is a small biotech started by a professor um, up in Boston really capable of managing all of that? Well, maybe if they hire the right people. Um, I can tell you from experience that they don't always. Um, and so this is where I think, you know, sort of big pharma comes in and they play a really important role in a number of dimensions here. First of all, they have a very deep experience with all of these regulatory issues. Um, they also bring capital to, to the table, which is something these small organizations need to get from the inspiration. It, the other 99% takes a lot of money and a lot of time and, a, and an ability to spread that risk. Um, so, you know, you don't bet on one horse, you bet on multiple, right? This is, it's an investment process. So 
know, these, there's a lot of economics that go into why the industry sort of does things the way that it does. It has a lot to do with the fundamental risks and the costs of doing business in that industry and what it takes to get these things to market. So I, th I think I, you know, I sometimes worry a little bit, you know, when we start saying, well, you know, let's take a really hard look at how these acquisitions work because things can look like a killer acquisition that are just a dud acquisition. And, you know, it may not be as apparent um, until you look at the facts. And so I think that that's just a perspective. That's super helpful, Chris. Thank you. Um, I want to check. I don't have any Slido questions, but were there any questions from the audience? I certainly have more questions, but I would love to, to let others. Um, can we get a mic up front here? Hey there. Um, so, so far I've learned a lot um, and I actually teach business law and I don't don't know as much about IP as I should for teaching a class that includes it. So I'm going to be including some of this uh, next next time I teach it. Um, but I had a question. I've thought a little bit about method of use patents. And I don't know. I certainly come from the perspective that patents in general, certainly the baseline patents that we think of as, you know, like the genius patents, right? We've come up with this great idea and we need to protect it because we want people to think that their good ideas are going to be protected. Where though do you sort of fall on method of use patents and where they, you know, where does that fall in terms of competition and being good for competition and how many of these patents that you're talking about are they actually those type of patents? So I thought I was going to be an IP lawyer when I was a law student. <laughs> um, and I always thought of methods of, method of use patents just kind of bizarre yeah. um, because most of like the, the methods of use are very well known and there's no way that you could have an innovative concept on them. So I, in my practice, I do not see method of use patents that frequently is much more frequently like on the fundamental compound. So I don't really have a ton of real life experience with them. I had some law school school experience with them, which I, which I thought they were kind of silly, but I don't know if either of you have more on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I fall anywhere on that issue because I think, you know, these are questions that are very fact specific yeah. as to sort of what's the value of a particular um, innovation. But just you know, sort of one of the things sort of interesting about the pharmaceutical industry is that there's a long history of products that you know, were invented for one thing and then turned out to be really great for something else. Um, you know, Botox was, I think, originally designed for something completely different from how it's currently used. Its main, main commercial potential wasn't, you know, what it was developed for. Aspirin, right? You know, headaches, that was its initial use. Most aspirin today is used as a blood thinner. Um, so there's, and which is a side effect that was considered bad, and it is, you have to be careful with that, right? So the point is that there are, many, many incremental innovations in industry, and pharmaceutical industry is a good example of this, that may fall under method of use. Um, but you want people to develop them, and because of the regulatory process, it's not free. Yeah. You know, someone has to do those clinical trials and get that through the FDA, and that's not free. Um, so if it's not protected, and there isn't some, so there is some exclusivity that's specific to method of use, it's different from the core molecules. So that is sort of part of the law there is handled differently. Um, but it's still protected. And I think that there's probably good reason to do that. Yeah, because I think, um, yeah, and thank you for yeah making me think of it like that. Because I sort of just thought of it as, okay, well, we prescribe stuff off label anyway. So are people just doing this to make a buck, right? When you could just be prescribing stuff off label. But yeah, you could see a reason why you want to go through the formality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's definitely a commercial question, you know, whether to just let, leave it off label or to bring it on label. And you know, I think that may have some benefits to bringing it on label. Certainly, um, there are classes of doctors who won't go off label and things like that. So I mean, there's a lot of considerations I think that go into that. Thank you. We have a question from the online audience. Um, so there is a parallel discussion about data sharing and data ownership as a property right. What insights can we learn from IP and antitrust for these data issues? 
Anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> I, I think a lot of what we're talking about here is because we have a intellectual property body of law that is butting up against antitrust law. And I'm not sure that we're at a place yet where we have a property right assigned to data. Um, we, there are certainly plenty of cases like um, the multi-listing cases where someone has a bunch of data and that is proprietary to them. And then they, if they combine that with another very large data set, could there be a harm to competition there because they're, you know, there's no longer the two competing listing services for real estate. You know, I think that that is something that the antitrust laws have thought about. But I think, again, it kind of goes back to, is it an asset? If you have a lot of data, yes, it's an asset. Um, and so it should be treated like that. I'm not sure that intellectual property is where you learn that or if we were going back to just sort of the fundamental antitrust laws, which apply to all kinds of property. Yeah, and I'll just say that I think that it's fair to say that there's, I think, some dispute in the academic community over whether there's exclusion on the on the data. You know, if consumers are freely giving their their information to a number of organizations, it's unclear if that's exclusionary. And so, you know, we typically think of a property right as being exclusionary. So, how? It, again, I think it just raises questions that I think haven't really been fully answered yet. Yeah, and I would say there's this other tricky issue of what is the boundary of the property right? So, I mean, you do see this in IP a little bit, right? I think in pharma, a lot of the boundaries of the property rights are very, very clear because, you know, you can write sort of write down the chemical formula for something. But, um, you know, when you're looking at, I think, um, other spaces where um, technology, for example, um, you know, the, the boundary of the property right is less clear. And then you sort of, what is your right to exclude? Is, is this actually infringing or not infringing? Um, so I remember um, once upon a time, I was an advisor in uh, uh, Commissioner Kavasik's office when a lot of these uh, privacy, data and privacy issues were, were starting to become really salient. And we would have these conversations about like, well, what if I'm walking down the street to go to the store and I get picked up by, you know, one of the street cameras? that's my data, right? They now know that I was walking down the street. And so it's a little bit like hard to know sort of where you draw the line of, is it only things I consent to? Is it everything about what I'm doing? Like where I feel like at least in the, in the case of intellectual property where we might not always get the boundaries right and the courts tell us when we haven't got the boundary right um, but I feel like with data, it just, it seems like that's, that's a harder line to draw. I don't know. I very much agree with that, but I'm not sure that it's a competition or an antitrust right, question. Right, right, um, right. Like we need the data privacy experts to tell us what the property is. Right. And then we can fight about if there's a misuse of it. Right, right. <laughs> then, then, we can, then we can say if you have market power, that property right, and yeah. then, and all the parade of horribles that come from that. Um, I'm sorry, was there another question? Yeah, perhaps. perhaps one quick question for Richard, perhaps. Uh, I think it's very important that you put the intellectual property rights uh, issue as an asset, and you, the discussion just um, revealed that. Um, it's an asset, that's totally true, and it's property. So it means that you have some sort of monopoly, pa monopoly power over your assets, which means a right to exclude. And in terms of intellectual pro property rights, it comes with this traditional or historical ability to have injunctive relief, like for uh, some uh, an implementer who will trespass or violate the property right. And we see over the last few years or perhaps a few months, um, a questioning or undermining of this ability to seek injunctive relief and of course to therefore uh, assert your property right over these assets. What do you think about this? This, this trend, and, and what does it tell, as a Schumpeterian expert, what does it tell of the value of intellectual property rights and the incentives to innovate in the long term, in the historical perspective? Yeah, I think, this, and that's exactly right. I mean, the whole point is that property is a monopoly, and, 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 that, and that's the way, uh, I think, a right way to, to, to think about it. You have it as, 
you know, as Maitland said, an absolute and despotic right over your um, over what you possess. But I think we need. It's, but intellectual property rights is also an artificially constructed right. It's, so I mean, you could argue that all rights are artificially constructed. But so, but <laughs> this one is we can see the wheels turning and uh, how the how this particular right is is uh, is constructed. So we might want to think about. Um, you know, scaling the right. This is a point that that Harold Demsetz made in a very very well, I thought, in a in a 1983 paper on barriers to entry, which I still I think is the best paper ever written on barriers to entry. He says barriers to entry are always property rights in the end, and what we want to think about is how high those property barriers should be. Sometimes we want them high for externality reasons or something, and sometimes sometimes we want them. Low, and I think that's what the right conversation is. So I tend to think that the conversation about a lot of things that are talked about under the guise of antitrust probably should be talked about under the guise of intellectual property. And antitrust is just a way to, is, is, is sort of a cheap political way to get at intellectual property instead of actually thinking hard about and thinking hard about intellectual property. Now, in terms of you, you know. Um, Prop, you're right, the property rule is one way to protect property, the, right? The property rule is the rule that says if you want my property, you have to negotiate with me and take the, uh, and, and before you can you can take my property. But the, but there's also the liability rule, which says you can you can take my property anytime you want, but you have to compensate me. So that's so licensing is a liability rule solution. So if you say if you say compulsory licensing, that's that's like you know uh, taking the little pink house. Right and, and paying, paying uh, uh, damages to the, to Suzette Kilo for the for the house because we because we have the right to, we have the right to take the property and we're going to force you to to take it. So, uh, you know whether that's happening more or less, I don't I don't know. But I would you know I would say I, I would be on the side of advocating for thinking harder about how we scale and define the property rather than saying. We're just going to take the property, or we're going to we're going to regulate it, because regulation is also a form of taking, right? So, so whether we're going to invoke some kind of a property rule, yeah, trespass of intellectual property right is a some is a sort of taking, right? It, it, the trespassing of intellectual property right, like violating intellectual property right over many months and years, is a way of taking, uh, because at the end of the day you you'll know i mean the infringer will know that you will be liable to damages only um right correct right there's another question in the back there uh, i like the way that you said that um and it reminds me the idea of eminent domain you know being able to go in and take away someone's property rights, but when you talk about opening the vault, eminent domain, who you know, who who are you opening the vault to? I mean, we know when the government does something eminent domain, that they've got to justify it uh, for some greater good. Um, having said that, um, as we have these discussions, I think that if people have not been in an, an innovative process, they really don't understand the sacrifices, the challenges, how much you have to think out and how infrequently that results in success. And so they think that the reward at the end of it is something that should be challenged or taken away, or that they should open it up so that other people can have an easier travel in some ways. I mean, I'm not in favor of, 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 of not creating an environment where we can sort of maximize what our inventions have been, but I certainly think a lot of this dialogue about opening the vault is really not um, addressing how much sacrifice people do when they go into invention and have no idea. They put their families at risk. They put their future at risk. And, and they drain their mind. So anyway, thank you. Um, great. I have one last question, but I just want to make sure there are no other audience questions before I turn to that. OK. so. Megan, you brought up the IP licensing guidelines, so I'm going to end there. Um, so, you know, FTC, DOJ have these joint IP licensing guidelines. Um, 
apparently it's fashionable now to revise guidelines um, and to withdraw prior guidance. So I just, maybe if everybody could just some final thoughts on um, what do we think the future holds for the IP gui licensing guidelines? Have they been useful to date? Do they um, deserve some revising? Um, and um, do we think that that's on the, on the table in the future? Well, at least from an exclusive licensing perspective, the IP licensing guidelines look very heavily to the merger guidelines, right? And so if, to the extent that the merger guidelines are going to fundamentally change, I think they're probably going to have to update that aspect of the IP licensing guidelines or else we're treating different property rights differently and that's inappropriate. Um, so I, I do see some risk there. Um, I don't think from a non-exclusive licensing perspective that there's that there hasn't been that much debate on sort of the basics of the IP licensing guidelines. And so I, I think that they're going to be low on the list um, of things to change. I don't think that there is as much concern about it. I, I think that you're going to see a lot more. Um, I think you're going to see like all the SEP, um, <laughs> DOJ business review letters and that sort of thing before you see a fundamental change to the licensing guidelines. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I've come across the IP licensing guidelines that much in my own practice, but uh, coming back to, I think, some, some of the comments of the panel before about the um, horizontal merger guidelines, I and mean, I think that that's I mean, I think most economists would look at that and say, yeah, there are definitely some things that need to be modernized there. But at the same time, I, I would echo some of the concerns about the, sort of the uncertainty that, that it casts over uh, a much broader area than just mergers. Um, there are you know, many people who reference those guidelines in all sorts of antitrust contexts that have, you know, that go far beyond just, just mergers. And so I think it's, you know, the that process needs to be very thoughtful, that's so all I'd say. Okay. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts before we wrap? I don't really think so. I mean, the, the intersection of intellectual property and antitrust law has been like a really fundamentally interesting spot. And if we're talking about, we're here talking about innovation, we're on a panel about innovation. I still think that both bodies of law are fundamentally aimed at advancing innovation and creating innovation. And I think it's important that we continue to have these types of dialogues to make sure that the two can work together effectively to do that. Yeah, and I'll just say that, I mean, I think, again, you know, I'll come back to, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine has been sort of a poster child of, I think, what we get from the innovation in, this, in the pharmaceutical industry in particular. And I think we just need to be extremely careful when we think about how do we tinker with the sort of the incentive structure surrounding that innovation um, in the future. Richard, anything? Um, well, please join me in thanking our panelists for what's been, for me, a very fascinating and educational <laughs> discussion today. Thank you.
Are we good? Right. So uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Uh, I know it's going to be hard for last panel between uh, now and the cocktail hour, so we're going to keep it very interactive and, and lively. Um, so this panel is uh, titled Precautionary Antitrust versus Dynamic Antitrust. Uh, what do we mean by that is, I think, a um, general transformational shift from exposed judicial enforcement of antitrust rules toward more ex uh, rules of competition. Uh, we hit into that uh, this morning, but I think we're going to deep dive uh, into it uh, just now. Question is about uh, this trade-off between regulation and adjudication. Should we favor more rules of competition, or should we just, within the current antit antitrust laws, uh, reinvigorate enforcement or think enforcement differently, but within the current framework? And we already see a uh, change in the rhetoric, in the language, as we had last July, the executive order of uh, President Biden on competition. And I think uh, Senator Klobuchar wrote a book uh, titled Antitrust, but advocating at the same time not to use that word antitrust anymore, but to use competition. And so we should be talking about competition. And I think behind this rhetorical change is the idea of regulation of competition with ex ante uh, rules. So I'm more than delighted to have a, a great line of speakers with me uh, who can going to shed light on these uh, very important issues. So first, we have Anna Meyandorf. Uh, Anna is uh, joining us uh, online, and she's a principal economist from Bates White. Uh, we're very pleased to have you, uh, Anna. And um, we have Fiona Schaeffer, uh, who is a partner at the law firm Milbank. Rosa Abrantes Metz, who is principal economist at Brettel. And we have Robert Lund, who is a university uh, professor at the University of uh, Baltimore. So thank you all for being with us. It's a, it's a great honor and great pleasure to, to, to be discussing with you uh, these issues. Um, so first, uh, I'll start with uh, Rosa. Uh, what do you think about these uh, issues of regulation and adjudications? Do you want to jump in? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me for this interesting discussion. Um, I would like to just give a little bit, maybe oversimplified view of where I see the European way of looking into these and um, the still current US way of looking into it. And I should disclose I am European, so I do have the exposure to both. Um, and I should also disclose that I, I do work, I do a lot of work on multi-sided platforms, um, testifying in a week on a trial on a matter like that. And there's a few others coming in a variety of industries and they're all in this case involve either collusion or monopolization. So I do know those issues do come up. There's a potential for abuse. Um, uh, but it might surprise some people um, also given my prior kind of experience personally in terms of my career in which I developed a lot of empirical tools that I discussed, mentioned as screens to detect a variety of conspiracies and manipulations in several markets, example, the libel rigging and many others that I do tend to go after uh, wrongdoers. That said, I don't think that everybody's a wrongdoer and um, I like the market. I like when markets play out. Uh, and so my view, surprisingly, some of my colleagues, is, is a view that is a lot more in favor of a, not completely free market, but a, a little bit more of that and less interventionism. So, uh, you know, as an economist, I, I see things in essentially the following way. So in the U.S., it's everything centered around competition. You keep your eye on the prize. And that's what motivates you to innovate. Um, I feel that personally. I think this is why the United States developed to become uh, the country that it is from Europe, from the perspective I used to have as a little kid growing up in the 70s where we didn't have all of this great new stuff developing. I used to wonder at that time whether people were just smarter in the U.S. because all of the great stuff came from here. Uh, and, and obviously, it, it's not inherent. It's not 
that people were smarter here were just that they had a better, more favorable environment to reach their potential. So, you know, I, I, I worry about the disconnect between the eye on the prize and the acknowledgement that we work for a prize and particularly in the context of platforms, which is what I'm going to talk more about because that's more centered, there's a lot of innovation there. Uh, an innovator can find itself in a monopolistic position just because he was really good at what he was doing and uh, he got the whole market. Uh, and that should not be a bad thing per se, is my view. Uh, can the monopolist then abuse the market? Yes, it can. I work on a lot of those cases. and um, But I think that uh, we should not presume that uh, just because you're a monopolist, you must have to be bad. Um, so, you know, the system that U.S. has had, while not perfect, nothing is perfect. And I'm sure there's type one and type two errors. Um, I, I think the 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 fact that firms have the opportunity to defend their conduct and put forward um, um, what they may be accused of at court and defend is a really good thing. Um, the in May the best won't win, and then let's keep an eye on them to make sure they don't abuse and they don't harm competition and consumers. The European system. Uh, is um, takes the premise, in my view, that just um, innovation is bad if markets are less concentrated. Well, there really is no uh, no settled literature on that, neither evidence. It's so very much industry specific. Uh, but that's the position Europe takes, and and therefore there seems to be a pretty big dislike of big platforms. Now, I'm not here saying that big platforms may not do wrong things, but um, the position does seem to be if you're big and you're a big platform, hence you're bad. Um, I think that this kind of approach that really um, does not analyze the network effects that platforms provide, uh, the scale, that innovation, and that is completely dislinked from any potential misconduct, may not even have any misconduct at all, and just fit people into buckets through regulation. You either belong to this bucket or you don't belong to that bucket. And making the market accessible to some competitors potentially would have no chance to compete, not because of any legal conduct by the incumbent, but just because they're just not good enough. Um, I, it's a little bit of a softer version of picking the winners and the losers. Um, from my own experience growing up in Portugal, that didn't work out very well for us. Uh, so in the seventies and prior. So I tend to dislike that type of interventionism. I know there are, I've been on both sides of cases. It's, I know sometimes the system may not always get it right, but I think most of the times it does. Um, so I worried about these, these arguments also of, of saving resources and let's just get everything preset uh, so that we save resources and uh, time. Um, I don't, I'm not convinced of this kind of argument. Uh, in general, that's also what I used to hear on screens. We would just want to save resources. But, you know, if that's the argument, why don't we just presume everybody guilty that is accused of a crime? Um, saving resources is important, but it can't be the primary objective in, in my view. Um, so, Again, the, the, the innovation, the argument on the innovation is really not clear. And I think that all of this said at the end, I'll, I'll put a but really in favor of some of the things Europe is doing from an economist standpoint. But in general, the approach seems to be um, let's treat platforms as utilities. Well, platforms are really not utilities. And there are two key differences. Platforms tend to innovate. I don't remember the last time we ever heard that our uh, utility provider or power provider innovated. And we multi-home, right? Um, so we go to Facebook and we go to Twitter and we go, we don't multi-home on power uh, and electricity, neither do they ever get displaced. Well, platforms, a lot of them, a lot of the markets, these markets are characterized by a lot of disruptive innovation. And I think that 
Europe is in some ways this linking the prize from the incentive. And as economists, we need to understand what's the incentive that people have to actually do something so that we can affect that incentive. Um, in, in, in Europe, for example, um, if you're a monopolist and you're bad, and therefore uh, all these smaller competitors may end up getting access to your own platform, um, what essentially what, what you are doing is telling all the smaller firms don't really innovate because when you get really big and really good, I'll take your part and give to the other little ones coming next. So I don't think the message is very good. And of course, this these argument is the most important in the most in, in the industries that I'm characterized by a lot of innovation. There are platforms in particular industries that don't really innovate that much, uh, but there are many others that actually do. So all this said, I do have a particular concern sometimes when it comes to platforms, which is even absent any conduct, a monopolist may be innovating uh, and he may not have had any exclusionary conduct, et cetera, but it may become just so big that its own scale may really impede entry. And, um, and you may end up, one may want to design something of the nature that we, that we have, for example, for pharmaceuticals and others, uh, which is um, let them innovate, let them get big, let them get better. But after a certain amount of years at the right price, maybe their infrastructure would be able to be accessed by uh, a smaller company. Um, so that's that's uh, my general view in a nutshell. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rosa. That was so much food for thought um, and lay down the debate very um, clearly. Um, I think, Rob, um, Bob, you, you're going to have a, a very interesting inputs and very interesting perspective. By the way, I love your tie. Um, so please just share your your, your thoughts on, uh, on on this idea. I think you're going to put forward about sure. no thought monopolization. Sure. If you can't see it, it's a monopoly tie, which if I'm not going to wear it today, when am I going to wear it? <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. Um, and I'm especially delighted to be here because my topic has not been discussed seriously in the United States for almost a half century. And I'm grateful to Aurelian for inviting me to talk about the possibility of no fault monopolization, monopolization without anti-competitive conduct, or you might call it monopolization per se. Now, you might be wondering why I'm holding this book called Reading Law by Justice Scalia and Mr. Gardner. Well, Reading Law contains Justice Scalia's approach to interpreting statutes. And now you're probably wondering, well, wait a minute, he said he's going to talk about no-fault monopolization or monopolization per se. What's he talking about Justice Scalia for? And the answer is, this contains textualism. Justice Scalia believes in reading statutes according to a textualist philosophy, and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to try to convince you that if you use textualism to read Section 2 of the Sherman Act, you will see that it is a no-fault statute or a monopolization per se statute. That is, the Sherman Act does not require uh, anti-competitive conduct for violation of its monopolization or attempt to monopolize prong. Now, as, as we all know, Section 2 makes it illegal to monopolize or attempt to monopolize, and it's got a whole bunch of other words in it that we don't really have to go over today. But nowhere does it require anti-competitive conduct. It contains no exceptions. Now, regardless what some of you may think about textualism, at least three Supreme Court justices are hardcore textualists. They do it all the time. That means they read the Bible all the time. And every justice uses it sometimes. Uh, justice Kagan said, we are a generally fairly textualist court. Okay, so what is textualism? Well, if you're like me, you probably didn't pay much attention to it until recently because Scalia was the only one that did it. So why waste your time on it? Before I found this book, I thought it consisted of three very simple steps. 
First, forget about the traditional approach to interpreting statutes. Forget the legislative history, the, the, uh, the committee reports, the four debates. That's all irrelevant. Second, find out how dictionaries, especially dictionaries, but also legal treatises and cases, define the key terms when the statute was enacted. Step three, stop. <laughs> Don't read anything into the law that isn't there. Anything that isn't a straightforward and plain interpretation of the words in the statute. Now, then I discovered this 560-page book. It's not quite so simple, but in the, in the time allocated, I can give you an overall textualist read of Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So we begin. How was monopolized defined in dictionaries when the Sherman Act was passed in 1890? Well, Scalia helpfully gives us a list of half a dozen dictionaries of the period he considers reliable and authoritative. So I looked up the word monopolize in all six of those dictionaries and found that monopolize was defined, well, the way it's defined colloquially today without all the legal baggage that has added been added to it over this century. In other words, it was defined as simply to get a monopoly, period. There was no anti-competitive conduct requirement. I'll give just two examples. The Webster's Dictionary of the Period defined monopolize as, and I quote, to purchase or obtain possession of the whole of as a commodity or goods in the market with a view to appropriate or control the exclusive sale of as to monopolize tea or sugar. My final one, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary of the Period had a similar definition. To get into one's hands the whole stock of, to gain or hold possession of, to have a monopoly. Now, none of these definitions of monopoly, of monopolize, required uh, any anti-competitive conduct. A firm that was a monopoly had monopolized, period. I also examined legal treatises of the period. The eight that Justice Scalia liked, none of them contained monopolize because um, uh, monopolize wasn't used widely before 1890. I did find the word monopolized used in one pre-Sherman Act common law antitrust case and in six Supreme Court cases decided the decade after uh, the Sherman Act was passed. None required anti-competitive conduct, although most did not address the issue. Moreover, some of these cases used the term monopolize and monopoly interchangeably, and this provides more support for my thesis that no anti-competitive conduct is required for a Section 2 violation. Now, I did a similar analysis of the word attempt, as in attempt to monopolize by itself and in, in uh, as part of an attempted crime. And again, I came to the conclusion, which I'll skip for, for lack of time, that the word attempt in that context means the exact same thing it means today colloquially. So in conclusion, Section 2 of the Sherman Act, if you're a textualist, as three justices and sometimes every justice in the Supreme Court is, is a no-fault statute, a monopolization per statute uh, with no exceptions. Now, if I had more time, um, my co-author, uh, Professor Richard Zerby, an economist, gave a 26-page overview of the economics of no-fault monopolization, if we had more time. Uh, in addition to everything you said, he pointed out some things on the other side, the good things that could happen if one uh, uh, had uh, monopolization uh, per se. The problem is we've never seriously examined this question in half a century. I mean that literally. This is literally the first time uh, in half a century anybody's even thought to ask the question whether we should have no-fault monopoly. So this 26-page section is just a, a, a glancing overview of some of the economic issues. There's so many empirical issues we just don't know. Uh, uh, and all I'm really trying to do is to start the, uh, start the discussion uh, right now. If anybody wants to see Professor Zerby's 26-page analysis of the economics of uh, no-fault monopolization, I'll be delighted to send you a copy. So in conclusion, I have just two, uh, two things to say. First, where did the requirement that anti-competitive conduct is necessary for a Section 2 violation come from? It is certainly not in the Sherman Act. It's not even hinted at in Section 2. Shouldn't we admit that judges simply made it up because judges decided it was good policy? 
This is not textualism. In fact, it's the opposite of textualism. And my final point is, again, to thank Aurelian for inviting me here. This is the first time in a almost half a century that anyone has seriously thought about this issue, and, and I applaud him for uh, broadening the scope of the analysis to include what, uh, for the last half century, people have not even been allowed uh, uh, to think about. So thank you again. I know it's not my turn yet, thank you. Yeah. but I just wanted to Press comment, the, Bob. On... Press the button. Sorry. Yes. Bob, so that's a really interesting argument. I wonder, what's how do you deal with the second part of that textualist argument, which is, okay, monopoly equals monopoly. It doesn't equal dominance. Right. It's a single firm. So absent a single firm in the market or a dangerous probability of achieving single firm monopoly, you don't have a violation. Um, I'm happy to respond if that's not, yeah, no, definitely. If that's not a question. Um, I guess I'd respond in one of two ways, in the monopolization prong and the attempted monopolization prong. Um, Justice Scalia also says a good textualist is not a literalist. There was an 1898 Supreme Court case that called a firm with a 98% market share a monopoly. Now, literally, does a 98% firm have a monopoly? Not literally, but Scalia says a good textualist is not a literalist. So I think a firm with a 98% market share would qualify. How much lower? I don't know, 90%, 82%. But how about the attempt to monopolize prong? Okay. I think that would be um, revitalized a lot more. The monopolization prong, you're right, might not be monopoli uh, uh, reinvigorated at all. But, it, but the attempt to monopolize prong, I, I submit, would be. Interesting. I mean, I, I wonder if Google would actually like your definition, the textualist definition, because if it's either 98 or dangerous probability of achieving 98, I, I might like that standard, but just yeah. food for thought. It, 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 it is food for thought if you, if you were a Google. How low could a court go and, and I mean, 98%, you can say, well, that's kind of a fudge. I mean, come on, let's not, you know, let's not be a literalist because Scalia doesn't like literalists. How about 95, 90? The, the Standard Oil Trust in 1890, I believe, had an 88% market share. Um, is 88% close enough? I don't know. But yes, it, you might have to go back to the, and then we're into intent. Did they try to get a monopoly and so on, you know, in the attempted monopolized prong? That would be tough. Very interesting, and I think we're going to come back to that. Uh, plenty of questions, of course. Uh, Anna, uh, do you want to have some thoughts to share? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, definitely. Okay, great. Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel and also for allowing me to participate remotely. I've been ill for a few days and uh, am happy not to be spreading my germs to the those of you who are collected uh, in that room. Um, so I've been having a lot of fun thinking about this uh, topic as I, as I considered what my remarks would be over the last few days, and it allowed me to clarify some of my thinking. But uh, let me start with the proposition that I think that competition policy uh, now in this day and age should be clearly protecting not only current but future competition, uh, I acknowledge that maybe not everybody agrees with that, but I think probably most people do, uh, which also means that competition policy should be thinking about uh, the impact of uh, the organization of industries and firms uh, on innovation. So innovation, uh, if you look at the economic literature, uh, is much more likely under some circumstances than others. Some markets see more innovation, some industries see more, more innovation, some see less. Um, so Carl Shapiro and others have written about this extensively. Um, Professor Shapiro um, has introduced the concept that I'm sure is familiar to many of you of contestable markets. So markets in which actually market share can be uh, acquired through uh, innovative products and enough of that market share can be acquired so as uh, that to make an innovation profitable, those are the types of markets in which we're gonna see more innovation. 
Uh, I'm also uh, going to posit to you that um, consumer demand can and should be allowed to generate some market power uh, and it, it, in response to innovative firms. So innovative firms, say Instagram, for example, is motivated by the fact that it can either become a Facebook or be acquired by a Facebook, right? This is one of the things uh, that, that entrepreneurs are looking for is profits down the line. So um, I think as competition enforcers, we need to keep in mind that we need to let consumers vote with their dollars. And if they happen to vote in such a way as to favor one firm, uh, that, that is actually a good thing for the economy and not a bad thing. Now, having said that, you don't wanna to get to the point uh, as I think you know, previous speakers have noted, uh, where that market power is solidified in such a way that additional innovation will not occur and uh, ultimately leading then to harm to consumers. So uh, ideally we put in place a competition policy, both ex ante regulations where possible and ex post uh, litigation and adjudication uh, that keeps even markets that have dominant firms contestable. So let me give you some examples. Uh, I think the econ literature has shown, for example, that markets in which long-term contracts are uh, dominant uh, probably have less innovation than, tho than those in which long-term contracts uh, are discouraged. Another example is compatibility requirements. Uh, if uh, in tech, uh, there is a way to impose through regulation a requirement of interoperability between various types of innovations, whether it's software, uh, you know, data, the interaction between software, hardware, and data, that also will increase innovation. Um, predatory activities, for example, predatory pricing, clearly will decrease innovation. Um, the patent regime can be very important uh, in this aspect. So. For example, there's been um, some writing uh, on the fact that more stringent novelty requirements may decrease the returns to uh, relatively small scale innovation, but increase the returns to relatively a larger scale or more important innovation. So these are all ways in which I think the regulatory system can um, create sort of ex ante rules of the game to ensure contestability, even in markets in which consumers have voted uh, to give uh, one particularly innovative firm or several particularly innovative firms a relatively large share of the market. Um, let me just close by saying that um, in terms of patent regulation, um, I have seen um, actually directly in some of my casework that some of the litigation that is brought by one firm against the other um, in the guise often of uh, intellectual property violation or patent violation uh, is actually being used as a strategy of raising costs to entrance or deny market access. So, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, maybe would happen then on the other end on the, on the um, sort of ex post adjudication uh, where courts should be, you know, aware of and sensitive to this issue that um, you may have superfluous or pretextual IP litigation, uh, which really has an underlying competition motivation. Um, and I've seen in a number of cases where that has had a very negative effect, sometimes not because the case will be lost by the uh, alleged violator of intellectual property, but simply because the case is drawn out in court for two, three, four years uh, and the plaintiff in the case uh, in the meantime, has had a chance to catch up with the innovation that is being introduced by the by the plaintiff. So that closes at least my introductory comments, and I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. That's, that was great uh, addition uh, to setting the stage uh, for this discussion. Uh, Fiona, I'm sure you have plenty of things to say. <laughs> Thanks, Aurelian. Um, lovely to be here today and to talk about uh, a really interesting topic and I like to get back to basics to fundamentals and for me that involves thinking about how this country 
uh, became great. And I've been thinking about that a lot recently because I've been watching this series that some of you may know called, and, and forgive me for the title, I did not make it myself, but it's called The Men Who Built America. Um, and of course, it should now say the men and their wives and LBGQT, whatever it is, partners who built America. Um, but watching this with my son, um, I would say to him every five minutes when, you know, Rockefeller is predatory pricing or uh, buying up all the refineries or Vanderbilt is blockading the bridge into New York Harbour um, such that, you know, other railroads can't get in uh, or Carnegie is doing a whole host of anti-competitive and, you know, unregulated activities. I would say to him, that would be illegal today. That wouldn't be allowed. Uh, but what these barons and titans of industry, depending on you know where you sit in the political spectrum, were able to do was, well, Rockefeller when he was confronted with uh, the train, the train, uh, I guess, uh, not monopolists but uh, cartelists who were ganging up against him, decided I'm not going to use trains to transport my oil anymore. I'm going to build pipelines. And the the, uh, the railway guys who wanted to get into New York um, and serve that population had to build infrastructure around the monopoly area that Vanderbilt had. So that's all a long way of saying. Um, I think that there is some real benefit to a bit of a Wild West uh, unregulated environment to develop innovation and to to have what we think about in Schumpeterian terms as competition for the market, competition to develop the market. The next question is, what do we need to do to maintain competition in that market? And it may be at that point that you do need regulation uh, to maintain or provide access to what has become essential infrastructure. Uh, but whether something is an essential infrastructure or something that just needs to be built around is not necessarily uh, a question we can answer until the infrastructure is quite uh, advanced. So I, I, as an Australian who grew up with a lot of monopoly, natural or not, um, and then went to Europe and found a lot of regulation and not, a, not so much innovation and now find myself in the United States with a lot of innovation and not, not so much regulation, think that we should be careful before wading in um, too quickly and too aggressively with a, a really um, systematic regulatory scheme that regulates the out of innovation. That is a, a very interesting insight. And uh, to go back to the gilded age also is very useful. Rosa, yeah. I guess the foreigners here are on the same side. Uh, there's, there's always the tendency that the grass is greener on the other side, but that's really not always true. And I think to a great extent, um, empirics will show that the US has been the most innovative country in the world by far, um, even in a per capita basis. And while some of that may also have come from some practices, sometimes that would have been illegal now, uh, I like the Wild West um, with some level of oversight because that is really comes back to the incentives as an economist. That's the price is what drives people's conduct. And if they cut out the price at the end of the day, they're just not going to bother to do it. And uh, that's really the 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 benefit of innovation. I would also add that in order to innovate, um, companies have to be profitable. They need to have a certain level of market power. They need to have money and their safes in order to invest. And being profitable is not a bad thing. Um, you know, sometimes as an economist, even you might wonder why is it that there are these very large profits by these monopolists, he's not innovating and nobody else seems to enter the market. What's going on? Well, probably some illegal conduct is going on. That's why nobody else is coming in. Uh, so sometimes there is abuse, but a certain level of profitability does need to be attained. And, and I worry sometimes that 
profit is becoming badly seen when in reality, that's really what drives uh, most things. Right. Yep. Uh, but there's a, there's a wonderful quote that I, I don't think I'll get exact from a, a, a turn of the last century philosopher named Mr. Dooley. And it went something like this. And again, this isn't going to be exact. He said, the trusts are hideous monsters developed by the men of enterprise who have done so much to make our country great. On the one hand, I would stomp them underfoot. On the other hand, not so fast. <laughs> and then we all have this ambivalence. We want everything, right? We want the innovation. And then we care about the people who are, who are spending too much uh, on the products. So the question is, we want a balance. And I guess what I'm suggesting, if you had no fault monopoly, monopoly cases take what, five years, 10 years? So by the time you start a case, maybe 10 years afterwards, we, we get a verdict. Um, will incentives go down if you, if you attack them after five years, 10 years? Yes. How much? How much will incentive would set up to innovate go down a little bit or a lot? That's a that's a that's a that's an empirical question. What about incentives of people? Uh, will it be easier for people, other people, to innovate in that industry? Where will their incentives to innovate go up? Well, maybe so. How much? Uh, what about the overcharges of the people who are paying more in the meantime? Do we care about those overcharges? Uh, what about so-called Posnerian cost of monopoly, protecting your monopoly, spending your monopoly rents to protect it? Um, how about effects on privacy? We could go on and on and on. It, it's a mixed bag, but I certainly have to concede the basic uh, idea that yes, of course, we want uh, we want incentives to uh, innovate and to compete really, really hard. Of course. Um, Anna, do you want to react to what you just heard? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it seems to me that we're all in in vigorous agreement here. Um, so I, I would be interested in hearing. Uh, what kind of ex ante regulations the rest of the panel thinks would be sort of effective in ensuring that firms that are profitable and have large market share are disincentivized from engaging in monopolizing behavior and uh, that the markets in which they're operating are, you know, sort of remain open to new entrants and innovation. I think I've proposed a couple, but I'd be interested in hearing what everybody else thinks about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're going to move precisely on this issue of regulation and ex ante. So, um, first, very quick question, perhaps yes, no. Is it adjudication, you just referred to it, very too long? And is it the, 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 the judicial enforcement for antitrust rules just taking too long and so that we really must get rid of these cases that take a, a decade? Or is it just part of the process that is acceptable, this, this lengthy process. I mean, we're, uh, you're referring to, to Europe. Uh, there was a, a fine, um, European Commission fined Intel in 2009, and then the Euro General uh, Court of the European Union reversed that fine just two months ago. So it means like almost 15 years after. And, and for practice that was taking place perhaps in 2005, so 20 years after. So is it normal? Is it too long to... Because that's the main rationale for regulation, saying that we should get rid of adjudication because of the, 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 the lengthy uh, process that it, it incurs. Uh, Fiona, do you, do you want to jump well, in? First of all, I'm very much a believer that regulation and adjudication by the courts are, are complements, not substitutes. But I also believe strongly that these cases, like US elections, take way too long. Now, I'm not saying we'd go to a three-week snap election like the UK or Australia, but something a lot closer to that in the timeline I think would be very desirable. The only benefit, and I'm not sure that it's an intentional benefit of the US system, is that by the time uh, an, an Intel, or and that's a European case, but you know, an IBM or a Microsoft or a Google has finished with this litigation. The common feature tends to be, no matter who win, wins or loses, that they are more of a has-been at that point. And I've, I've often wondered um, whether that's just the affluction of time or whether the litigation process in itself distracts the innovative would-be monopolist from the job of innovating and, you know, makes them become 
more cautious uh, litigation, uh, you know, interregnum effect of litigation and everyone, lawyers pouring all over them, meaning that, you know, they don't do great business or innovate anymore. Yeah. The fear of disruptions. Yeah. You, you become less disruptive. Well, in a couple of weeks, I'll be testifying on a matter where the conduct happened in 2006. Uh, so that's been almost 20 years. But I think that is part as well. Yes, maybe it takes a little too long, but um, there are the cases are decided, there's appeal, there's counter appeal, there's all of these layers. And then in our particular case, Amex, the Amex decision came out. And so after these cases had been decided, now the case is being redone because of the Amex decision. And um, it keeps a lawyer, lawyers and economists very busy. I do think that would be an advantage in condensing it a little bit, but I worry about, I think people should have an opportunity to appeal and counter appeal. And, and obviously a lot of these cases are pretty complex. Uh, it does take a long time to get a good handle on what's going on and what should have been going on. I don't know really how feasible it is to reduce the time, maybe half, without really hurting the quality of the work being done. Yep. Well, um, this is almost a classic uh, uh, stereotype of economist versus lawyer. I mean, the economist always wants to look at everything. That's their training. And they can give you almost any situation where it's good or it's bad, depending on a million factors. And they're right. They're 100% right. But the job of the lawyer is to try to simplify and have presumptions. We have a Philadelphia National Bank presumption, which I applaud. Maybe I'm the only one in this room that applauds it, but I think it's great. It's right most of the time, not 100%, but I hope at least 51% of the time, and it simplifies litigation. When Arita and Turner came out with their reasonably anticipated average variable cost rule for predatory pricing, it had a lot of flaws, a lot, but at least it was relatively simple. And so now we have a predatory pricing rule that, you, you know, we, we, we could, okay. And I'm proposing one more in the monopolization area, the monopolization per se approach. You can call it presumption. You can call it uh, whatever you want, but, but we can't have cases uh, lasting 15 years. That's absurd in any field, but especially the platform. I was giggling when you said that, but but you're, of course, you're 100% right. And that's not the outlier for a case to cause to, to, to last 10 or 15 years. It happens a lot. And if we eliminated the conduct requirement, uh, then maybe a 15 year case would, would, would only last 10 years, which is still terrible, but but it's not as bad as 15. <laughs> Right, and so that brings me to the to, your, to, to the next question, which is about your your um, your argument for no no fault monopolizations. So precisely, this leads to a per se rules of illegality, and and of course, there's a big question that Fiona already raised about if we read monopoly, then it means 100 percent of market share or something perhaps close. extremely close to that, uh, which rarely uh, rarely take place, and 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 and. That comes back to the common law principle, common law origin of engrossing, where the, this idea of monopolizing the supply or the supply of a resource, supply of a of, of an child. But let's assume we have these no fault monopolizations for 100% of market shares. Then there's no need for regulation uh, anymore because it will be much quicker, or there will be almost like ex ante rules. Is that, is that what well, you well, hint to? Well, okay, it would be a violation of the law. Or remember, you've got the attempt doctrine. So I would hope some of the market shares would be a lot lower in the attempt doctrine. Okay, but then the question is the remedy, right? Uh, and the number of single firms in the United States that have been broken up Almost none, really. I mean, it's almost a handful. It's pretty rare. We usually have an, injunct an injunction, conduct relief of some kind. And I assume, especially if you had a no-fault case, you wouldn't break a company up. It would be some kind of injunction. I mean, in other words, if one, if one company does something truly horrible, and I mean, truly horrible, then you might break it up. But we almost never do that. So certainly a no-fault case would be an injunction, which would be border on regulation, to tell you the truth. It would be a you know, regulatory injunction. You can't do this and you must deal with them. And, and you can't give preference to and anyone other than uh, uh, your own uh, goods on Amazon or what, whatever it would be. It would be regulatory. So it would slide into regulation. Yes. yes. So uh, let me make an observation as an economist. So it's a monopoly over what market? 
Are we going to now spend five years defining yeah, the relevant that would market? Take, that would take five so, years. Yeah, I, I agree. But but regulations cannot put in paper all of these. Platforms are complicated. They operate in many different markets. There's links horizontal, horizontally, vertically. Um, there's defining the relevant market in a platform context is extremely hard. I've uh, been going through that process now. So, you know, coming out and saying you're a monopolist in these markets, so you're out, then we'll open 10 years of arguments about what really is a market you're accusing me of being an, a monopolist in. Um, I have no solution to the, the fact that much of the time, probably most of the time, we're going to fight for years over the relevant market. I mean, I don't see how you avoid it in a case like Facebook, Google. Maybe there's a hospital in the middle of nowhere where you could say, okay, this hospital in the middle of nowhere really is a relevant market. We all agree on the geographic market. We all agree on the product market. It could be, but but still, I agree with you. By and large, a case like Facebook will be litigating market definition for five years, but that's better than 15 years. I know that's pathetic, but, no, 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 no. but that's all I can say. Right. Uh, the, also, the question, can I, sorry, can I just uh, yeah jump in? Sorry, it's hard for me to because I can't see the panel, so I can't be waving and uh, trying to intervene. So uh, I think another reason to be cautious about this sort of per se monopolization is that uh, very uh, sort of dramatic innovation frequently leads to the creation of new markets, where by definition the lead innovating firm will be a monopolist from the get-go because it's introducing something so new that, that a market doesn't even exist. And uh, I would hope that, uh, you know, as we think about these things, we, we allow for that innovating firm that creates an entirely new product category will be allowed some measure of profits in order to incentivize that kind of innovation. But then then this regulation gets really complicated because then you have to, well, you're a monopolist, but you have to be a monopolist that is really, really big because if you're a monopolist who is really, really teeny, then you're okay. Um, that's the danger of these types of, of uh, regulations, I think. Um, uh, it is impossible that they will cover all the potential scenarios and then they will distort firms into fitting themselves into different categories to their own benefit. Um, I, I, my personal view is that it is better um, uh, to go to court and fight over what may or may not have been illegal. May I? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, all these cases, even under the best scenario, the monopolist is going to be able to enjoy their profits for what, five years, 10 years? I hope not 15 years. So there, they would get some years to, to enjoy, enjoy uh, a, a nice profit. Second, everything you're saying could apply to price fixing. If two little barber shops in Washington D.C. fix prices, technically they can go to prison. Now we would never do that, but if you're, but but we make a per se rule against price fixing. We hope we're not so stupid as to enforce it against two little barber shops in Washington D.C. But yet, on the other hand, if you know Apple and uh, uh, Apple and Google want to fix prices, then we've got a tool, a per se tool, a presumption, if you will, that uh, we don't have to live. Uh, did they actually affect the price of anything when Google and uh, Google and, and and Apple fix the price of cell phones? It's per se illegal or presumptively illegal, however you want to want to so, phrase it. So I think it's no different in the in the price fixing area than in the in the monopolization area. We can bring stupid cases in any area. I well, think. Let me just add one point. <laughs> I think it is different outside of platforms as well, because a price fixing, traditional price fixing case, you're just raising prices and there's potentially no at all pro-competitive effect. Here, in the context of platforms and industries that innovate, I'm still not saying that they should be able to collude on one side to innovate on the other, they shouldn't. But when you think of monopolization, yes, uh, there is the pro-competitive effect of potential innovation. And that's what does not exist typically in a price fixing case. And it's why this should be a rule of reason. Well, so I think that a lot of the monopolization cases, whether they be modern platforms or, you know, oily infrastructure of the, the 1890s, are about access to infrastructure that the monopolist has created or controls. And a judicial remedy 
requiring access to infrastructure on an ongoing basis. I think that's just really hard for courts to do. Um, you know, and breaking up companies is hard to do and doesn't really achieve access that, that, that is needed and wanted by those who would compete in that market that's created by the innovator. Price fixing, on the other hand, is very easy judicially. You know, did you do the bad thing? Yes, no. Um, punishment and don't do it again. So I think that's just a lot more amenable to a, a, an effective judicial remedy. I, I think one of the things we need to think about within, with the regulation is, is the infrastructure that's been created something that's become so essential, um, dare I say an essential facility, that um, access should be required uh, as a regulatory matter? Or is it better? You know, Is there a tipping point that says Google is now a public utility, in essence. That's the Google shopping case. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, or is it better to say Google, you know, is going to be defeated by the forces of creative destruction because people will innovate around? Look, I agree completely with what you just said about the remedy. In price fixing, you have a real easy remedy. In monopolization cases, you almost never have a real easy remedy. So we edge into regulation. And we're going to be going there if the government wins the Google case or if they ever bring a case against Amazon. Do you preference yourself or do you, do you discriminate against others? We're going to have to get into those issues if the government makes it that far. I guess what I'm saying is let's skip the anti-competitive conduct stage and then, yes, at the end, we're going to have to figure out uh, a workable remedy. And no, it's not like price fixing, which is just evil. Don't do it again. Yeah. Anna, do you, do you want to react on the, the regulation and ex ante rules? Uh, no, actually, uh, no. I'm, uh, okay. I'm, All right. I'm so uh, I just wanted to think from, from an innovation perspective, and I think, Fiona, you referred to that. Most of the companies now compete to create a market for the market and less and less in the market in the sense of price competition marginally. And I mean, there is this, this perhaps this uh, unintended consequences of saying that if you create the market and per definition, you're a monopoly of this market, there's this notion of market tipping so that you, and, and that is exactly explicitly used in, the, in Europe with the Digital Market Act, this market tipping so you're gonna be regulated automatically uh, isn't, it, wouldn't that work as a deterrent effect to create the market on the first place in the sense that you don't you don't rip off the entrepreneurial rents that are at the basis of the creation of the market you see the, this dynamic uh, competition that we we've been talking about uh, today um, how can we make sure that the regulation of a, a market that has just been regulated that has just been uh, created doesn't deter um, the very process of dynamic competition. Uh, do you see those potential and attendant consequences of saying that, why would I create a market if I know I cannot derive the, entre the entrepreneurial rents or profits that are associated with that, with that rent? So it's, it's very about incentives, right? So how can, you, how can we ensure that regulation create the optimal incentives for entrepreneurs and, and creators. Do you have some hints on that? The, the incentives issue. Which, which one of us would, would, you, would you like to? And, and, and I may add something. I think I probably repeat myself because I've been focusing on incentives a lot. I think the European Union legislation is very static, uh, which is part of the problem. Uh, people take a measure and they think that everybody else is going to keep reacting the way that they were before but people adjust to policies. And so I completely agree with you that um, I will not innovate if I will not create a new product from which I will be immediately regulated because I fit that one pre-specified bucket uh, when I can't keep doing the same thing in the market I'm in and we keep having profits without having as much oversight. So I think we need a better handle on the dynamic consequences of these policies. And honestly, I used to study economic growth as a discipline 20 years ago, and it, the, the literature has the evidence. Um, I think people just don't want to see it. 
um, uh, on, on the consequences of these types of regulations to economic growth, and by that also, you know, more choices to consumers. So not just plain growth, but higher quality of, work, of life. Jennifer? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, it's also about the normative question of what do we want as a society? Sorry to get deep and philosophical, you know, after, after five on a Thursday. Um, but, you know, do we want the convenience of Uber um, everywhere and, and not have the convenience of the yellow medallion cabs driving down the street? Do we want things delivered to our door seamlessly and not have the high street, you know, small shops necessarily? Um, those aren't just pure questions of economics. They're, I guess, questions of plurality and, you know, maybe going to the European concept of diversity of competition and competitors. Uh, but those are normative choices. They're not, you know, preordained. Uh, and those are things that I think are political choices. Um, the, the only I, I've been ranting and railing against... Um, against regulatory lag, against uh, uh, cases taking too long. But to some extent, it's good, right? I mean, if if you bring a case against a monopoly, once we're sure it's a monopoly, and then it takes five or 10 years before uh, the case is over, they've got to enjoy their monopoly rents for five years or even 10 years. What? How many years does it take? I mean, we don't give patents infinite patents. Uh, how many years is optimal for patents? Reasonable people could uh, uh, could differ on that one. How many years is optimal on a monopoly profit? Assuming we can ever define that, uh, reasonable people can uh, can debate that one too. Um, I guess I'm advocating for a shorter period, but not a zero period. Of course, I mean there's got it's they've got to be able to have an incentive to innovate and to compete compete hard. Uh, what other values should go into our calculus other than innovation? How about privacy? Should that go in there? We talk a little bit about that in our paper. Do monopolies perhaps uh, do a better job, uh, do a worse job of uh, protecting privacy? If you believe that literature, should that enter into your calculation? How about income inequality? There's some reason to believe uh, that monopolies contribute to income inequality. If you believe that literature, should that enter into our calculation? So I'm calling, I guess, for a lower period of uh, monopoly, uh, of the market's just leaving monopolies alone. Um, but if you consider these other factors, maybe you should shift the balance a little bit. Right. Um, Anna, do you want to jump in on the, how, how do you see regulation, the uh, the shift from exposed antitrust to ex ante regulations and the pot potential uh, unintended consequences of uh, regulation. Um, in, in the oh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem with uh, sort of replacing consumer choice with uh, regulation is that consumers will actually end up being worse off because, you know, and sometimes consumers make choices that lead firms to, to acquire monopoly power. Um, it's a good question how long that monopoly power should be allowed to exist. But I must say, I sort of lean towards, you know, if you have a firm with large market share that is innovating and competing to maintain its large market share, rather than using its market share to prevent other firms from competing, then I don't really have a problem with the fact that it's big. Um, I have a problem, you know, if it's engaging in behavior that prevents other firms from from competing for, you know, for some share of that market. Um, so I guess in my mind, you know, big is not necessarily bad. And certainly from an economic perspective, there are some things that big firms can do that small firms can't. Um, and, you know, regulators are, there's a lot, you know, I already gave a list of the types of regulations that I think, you know, would enhance exactly uh, you know, this environment in which even large firms are facing competition and therefore being forced to, to uh, innovate. So, you know, those include um, sort of thinking about what the patent regime should look like. It includes, you know, compatibility requirements and so on. So I think we should think really hard about, you know, what exactly those regulations would look like uh, while still leaving room for adjudication on the other end if it becomes apparent that the large firms are engaging in in competition reducing behavior 
Right, thank you. So precisely moving on these ex ante rules, uh, what type of rules would you envision which would be better? And what type of, I mean, the, the there has been this, Sub, uh, examples of non-compete clause, ex ante rules about non-compete clause, but also exclusionary contract, meaning a bit like the Clayton Act, where you list a number of uh, prohibited behaviors. Would that work? Would it? Would it just be over encompassing? Would it? There, how how do you think that uh, would work in terms of regulation or listing the prohibited practices that you don't want? Um, firms to, to engage. Is it possible to, to list those practices? Bob, do you want to start? Uh, I'm happy to start or happy to follow. I mean, that was kind of the idea behind the founding of the Federal Trade Commission, that they'd be able to come up with uh, all these practices. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the idea has failed. Uh, I don't know. But 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 what, but what maybe we can find some. I mean, you, you mentioned non-compete clauses. I mean, there are rumors that that will be the subject of the first FTC competition rule to make non-compete clauses uh, illegal, or at least illegal for workers up to, you know, you name the figure, $50,000, $100,000 something like that. Now, whether you, when you have a rule, then of course the economists have a huge role to play as to whether we're going to have a rule or not. You have the state of California, which has banned these these uh, uh, non-compete clauses. You can study whether the economy of California cratered uh, after they made these clauses illegal or whether maybe California still does okay. Um, you can limit it to the food industry if you really want. We can study it. But uh, anyway, um, I guess you had another panel on uh, on whether uh, whether the FTC really does have the power to make rules, but certainly you could single out areas like non compete clauses and uh, maybe make a competition rule. And the advantage of rulemaking is that all the economists can present all the empirical data and analyze it, and then the commission can uh, hopefully come to the right decision. I would add that. Um I'm sure there are rules one can come up with, but I my experience has been that so many of these things are very case and industry specific. Um, so, you know, I, I work on a lot of cases where there's exclusivity contracts and those contracts are used by platforms to literally block anybody else from entering because they lock one side of the platform in that is necessary and nobody else can come in because they can't get that side of the platform ever. But there are cases where these types of contracts can be pro-competitive um, in particular industries, not necessarily in this context. So I have, um, I, I worry about having these types of rules that are too general. Uh, and that presume that all of these conditions uh, are necessarily going to lead to harm to consumers when sometimes that really is not the case. I think maybe guidelines rather than preset uh, rules that must be enforced on things that are desirable and things that are not desirable rather than making them uh, the law of the land necessarily. Well, speaking of law of the land, one question I wanted to ask you, Aurelian, because I know it's an area that you focus on, is the impact of the DMA. And in particular, you know, we might decide, and I think we'll decide in the US, that we're not going to do something equivalent to the DMA or the kind of pervasive European regulation approach. But are we de facto going to be subject to it anyway, in the same way that GDPR is something we worry about here, even though no legislature has enacted anything akin to GDPR? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good question. And I think uh, I have that in mind when I ask those questions. Um, this, the DMA, it's, a, it's all about uh, laying down ex ante rules of competition uh, so that you have those do's and don'ts that are very precise, very clear. And that's rational for the European Commission to propose and to adopt uh, this, this DMA. But the thing is, we're dealing with global companies and the cost of having different internet or different products or services according to different co customers across the world is, is very important. And so you may have just one way of having those products and services irrespective of the continent, meaning that the DMA will be the default rules, will be the default rules for those companies that are subject to the, to D, to the DMA. Like you referred to it, the, the GDPR in the sense that to adapt to the GDPR 
according to the location of customers is, is to create a, a, an adaptation so that at the end of the day, you have these companies just w apply the GDPR and the cost to have the California privacy law is minimal, if not zero, because these companies have already integrated the GDPR. And I think we may end up in exactly the same situation because we know that the Congress is very unlikely to pass antitrust bills uh, uh, because, well, it went through uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee, but uh, for, for these bills to go to the floor is uh, very unlikely. And I mean, very uh, oppositely, uh, the European Commission and the European institutions uh, uh, know how to pass legislation and they know how to pass it very quickly. So the DMA will be the standard, the de facto standard for digital competition, or at least for the regulation of those five, six uh, companies. And we all have their names in, in, in our heads, but I think the DMA will also apply to Alibaba and Booking.com. Uh, so that would be perhaps the two uh, companies that uh, would be added to, to the DMA. But yeah, I think the so-called Brussels effect would be in full play with respect to the competition of the regulation of competition in digital markets. Yeah. So, so it's all over, really. <laughs> We're debating. The debate is done. <laughs> I think the debate is done. And the fifty-first uh, state is here, and it's uh, <laughs> bigger than any of the others. Or, or maybe we're now a part of the EU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if anyone was at the antitrust spring meeting that last week, I think you will have seen a very, you know, uh, lively and uh, enduring picture of Vestager holding hands with the FTC and the DOJ um, chiefs now in a, a bond of um, absolute, you know, symbiosis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for we've talked for the transatlantic divergence for decades, but now there, there's a transatlantic convergence, which is very subtle. Someone needs to send the memo to the courts, though, because I'm not sure they've <laughs> got that one yet. I, I'd be careful. I think there was a study that on what we wish for us that came out a short time ago that ranked GDP in the United States per state and ranked some in Europe. And the UK was only, I think, was if the UK were a US state, it would be in the bottom two or three of the 50. So I don't think that's what we really want to aspire to. Uh, I, I would be really, really cautious with that. Was that pre or post Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a few months ago. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. We were doing so well before. <laughs> To speak of caution, precisely, it's this um, aspect which is very important go back to, to, to Europe and which has major implications in, in the US, is this so aspect of the precautionary principle. This The whole idea that we will apply some sort of precautionary logic to competition. What is the precautionary logic? Is the reversed burden of proof and lowered evidentiary standards. This idea of ex-ante rules, like shifting from exposed to ex-ante, but these ex-ante rules also have uh, per se rules of illegality or uh, reversed burden of proof. And that is very core to the Digital Market Act, but also to a number of antitrust bills which are only proposed but may not be uh, adopted in, in Congress. So what do you, I, I'm just going to ask to all the panelists, what do you think about this idea of a reversed burden of proof? Like it's, per, you know, coming from permissionless innovation to permissioned innovation. It's prohibited unless you show otherwise. And that's this changes the nature of innovation, and if not of disruption. What do you think about this uh, reverse burden of proof? Um, I think it's essential. Um, let's go back to non-compete clauses. Um, it, someone of my <laughs> persuasion would say, let's make them illegal uh, for workers less than 100,000 who earn less than $100,000 a year. And if you can show why you need a non-compete clause for training purposes, you have to give workers an incentive to stick around for three years, and then you'll give them a training course. And you see, that's why you don't want to train this worker uh, at McDonald's, and then they'll, you know, you'll make them a McDonald's manager, and then they'll go to Burger King the next day. If, if you could overcome that presumption, uh, God bless you. But I would make them ill presumptively illegal because there are thousands of these cases. McDonald's is different from Burger King is different from Jimmy. I mean, there's thousands of them. On the other hand, if it's a presumption and they can convince the court that we really do have a good training program and that's why we have a non-compete clause, even for someone that makes sandwiches. Okay. 
I actually agree with you, Bob, and that was a lively debate that we had um, on that very issue because I proposed in our comments for the ABA uh, when we were commenting on this potential rulemaking on, you know, making presumptively, well, per se unlawful uh, non-competes for low lower wage workers. And I said, why don't we have a presumption? But I have not been able to think of any other instance aside from that instance where a presumption would, you know, that I'd be comfortable with a blanket presumption. Well, I Although when you say presumption, I mean, you do know per se and presumption are really about the same thing. I mean, a, a, a price fixing is per se illegal, but a case like broadcast music tells us it appeared to be price fixing, but it wasn't price fixing because they had a good explanation for why they fixed prices. So we're not calling what they did in the broadcast music case um, uh, uh, price fixing. So really per se, when the more you think about it, and Salop wrote a wonderful article explaining why per se is another word for presumption on the defenses. So I'm sorry to no problem. Uh, I, I tend to agree with Fiona. I think there are a few examples like the one you just mentioned where this makes sense, but I think in general that's not a good principle. Uh, I think that people should be found innocent unless they can be proven guilty, and that is the system we have, and that should not apply any differently to competition. Um, with that said, there are you know a few cases um, I, right now, I cannot think of any other besides the one you mentioned that one may may think that we may want to have something of that nature, but certainly not overall. Yeah. Anna, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, yeah, I just want to jump in actually and make a more general comment because it was raised earlier is that I think that there's a danger and this came up in the in the spring meetings uh, and elsewhere of trying to solve many, many problems through competition policy that maybe could better be addressed uh, by regulations in, you know, not by the competition authorities. Uh, I think there are many labor issues which cannot be solved by the competition authorities. There are environmental issues. Uh, there are, you know, there may even be some innovation issues, but, um, you know, it concerns me when I hear some of the rhetoric now coming out of the agencies how many different types of social problems they're trying to address or they think are occurring because of a lack of competition. Uh, I, I actually don't think that competition between uh, platforms will solve our you know, issues of uh, you know, use of our private data. I think people just tend to ignore you know, all of the warnings they get about what's gonna happen with their data and they click work right through. Um, I think that there are other regulations that need to be put into place, uh, which we to, together as a society have to decide where we stand on them, uh, rather than relying on the on the agencies, competition agencies to solve them for us. Um, I'd like to remind us all that we're talking about civil liability, not criminal liability. If this were criminal, then of course you give people their day in court, presumption of innocence, burden, uh, you have to show beyond a reasonable doubt. But here we're talking about civil issues. Is Jimmy John's uh, non-compete agreement um, good or bad? And if we've decided in terms of type one versus type three, type two error, and you could even say type three error, the cost of the litigation, if we've decided that 90% of the time non-compete agreements in the fast food industry or for workers of less than $100,000 a year, 90% of the time they're anti-competitive, then we make them all presumptively illegal and put the burden on the other side to uh, show, uh, show some necessity for it. Uh, the more presumptions, but you can't possibly go after McDonald's and Burger King and Jimmy John's and so you, you just can't do a full rule of reason on all of those. We don't have the resources. Uh, defendant wins. It's a defendant's paradise. So you make them presumptively illegal. And if they can come back, the rare example where price fixing isn't price fixing or 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 where, where there's an efficient merger despite Philadelphia National Bank or or where or or where you have a training program for uh for for fast food workers okay okay show us and and you've overcome the presumption i i respectfully disagree i i think that just because people don't go to jail doesn't mean that there aren't real consequences to them such as losing their whole uh earnings potential um i think 
it, there are a lot of cases, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, resources cannot be the reason why we change the rules of the game when the government can't win a case. And there may be sometimes be good reasons why the government can't win a case, uh, which is there is no case. Uh, sometimes there is a case and something went wrong because the other side did have more resources to put in place, but that that's that's competition even at that level. And, and I think people are entitled to be and 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 the companies aside from issues like price fixing and things of that nature to be found um, guilty only after the government has proven that they are. And, and I think the DOJ just announced that they're going to uh, start criminal cases, right? I in, think, in monopolization, monopolization case. So I think the criminal fines, criminal. You may, uh, I right. think, maybe re uh, reinstate it. So, now, so. now, they have announced that, and I, I trust people in here know that it's a matter of history. No one has gone to prison for a Section 2 violation. People have been charged criminally mm -hmm. uh, about 50 years ago, I think was the last time, but no one has ever gone to prison for a Section 2 violation. So you do have to wonder, is this real? I mean, I mean, they said it. Yeah. They said it. Uh, you know, here I am arguing for no fault, which is, you know, kind of out there, right? And 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 they're talking about putting monopolists in prison. Isn't that even more out there? <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, uh, there is I think that the anti aren't the anti poaching cases all being sort of criminal yeah. adjudicated as per se conspiracies? That was yeah. my understanding. Yeah. I've seen yeah. some of those complaints. Yeah, but those are section one, of course. Yeah, that's yeah, you're right. true. Price fixing. Right. Yeah, that's. It's price, price fixing. And right. Uh, right. Uh, Fiona, do you want to reflect on the, the jail aspect? <laughs> well, I was on the panel with the, uh, the DOJ, you know, DAGs, as they call them, which is a funny name because in Australia, I don't know if you know, DAG means someone who's, like, not very trendy. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, I, I asked for specifics on when we could expect a criminal uh, Section 2 case, and I got very little except go back and read that case of 50 years ago, I guess. Um, but, oh, which was dismissed, by the way. I mean, they, they didn't prove it. The court ended up saying you haven't proved anything and kicked the Department of Justice out. But, but I do think nature abhors a vacuum, and one of the things that we've seen over the past 20 years or so is very, very few monopolization cases being brought by the U.S. government and a lot more of that activity shifting to Europe and you know, other jurisdictions around the world. And one of the things that the, uh, the DAG said on that panel was, you know, it's not that we're losing Section 2 cases, it's that we're just not bringing them. And they apparently plan to change that. So you know, I, for one, would, would welcome seeing more jurisprudence in this area, because I think there's really a dearth of modern jurisprudence on section two, that is, you know, in my mind, uh, you know, a really rigorous analysis. I mean, we've got the Amex case, which is really a section one case, and I think horrible reasoning. Um, I'm really hoping that there'll be more, you know, rigorous thinking about this, not just at the agencies, but at the at, at the ju judiciary in the courts. Well, there's the FTC Sure Scripts case uh, right now that is monopolization. Uh, so I've got one very, I've got one very interesting questions uh, online. But just before going to that, questions: Is there any questions from from the room? Yes, plenty. Uh, yes, Julie. Um, Robert, I think your proposition is really fascinating. Um, so a comment and a question. Um, a comment is: If you're looking for what's the right number, is it ninety eight percent? If it's 92%, whatever it is, in the spirit of everything old is new again, the Alcoa decision provides you a rule. You have the famous 30, 60, 90 rule. So I think you're all set there. Um, Except to be 90, not to 60. That's right. Yeah, Maybe 60 I, I, would be for the attempted monopolization. I, I, I think you may be right. right. I think you right. may be right. Um, but but as, as far as the question, um, so at least for me, so reveal my private information. I'm an economist, not a lawyer, but I sometimes play a lawyer on TV. Um, <laughs> it, it's hard for me to take this argument seriously in the presence of Section 1 of the Sherman Act, right? So if we're going to read, have a textualist approach to Section 2, then we have to have a textualist approach to Section 1. 
And I mean, the Supreme Court there even said, right, Congress couldn't have meant every contract, right? And so they relied on sort of the common law interpretation, right, that only unreasonable contracts were illegal. And, and, and it took 50 years before we actually arrived at a per se rule for price fixing. And so I, I just would be curious your reaction to that. Like, how did those two pieces fit together? I'd like to remind you of the rest of section one. Every, every contract combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade. It's gotta be in restraint of trade. So that means all you economists can say, well, that contract does not restrain tra trade. So, so section one is not, uh, 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 well, section one wouldn't forbid every contract, only a contract that restrains trade. If you have a contract between two barbers in Washington, D.C., how does that possibly restrain trade, right? It doesn't. So I don't think we have to worry about that. Textualism, I'm not pushing textualism. The, the last three appointees to the Supreme Court swear they are uh, hardcore textualists. Uh, there was a recent opinion where every justice, uh, all, all nine of them went along with textualist reasoning. Um, how much influence will, te will textualism have? I don't know. What would someone like a, like a Kavanaugh do if he actually got one of these cases and he professes to be 100% hardcore textualist? Would these really conservative justices really do it or would they? I suspect they might just fudge and say, well, there was no monopoly here because you've misdefined the market. They, could, they, they don't have to get to this if they don't want to. But anyway, back to your section one question, restraint of trade. I would, I would hit on that part. But trade is not market. That, anyway. That in restraint that. of trade. So it would have to. Re re right. Trade in some Correct. Contract. But I think. Let's move to the, to the. You could interpret it that way, you know. If, if if I sell you this pen, but then someone else can buy the pen from you. So how does that restrain trade in pens that I sell you this pen? He can offer you offer me a dollar. He offers you two dollars. I mean, you know, we can we can fudge that one if we want. Uh, yes. Uh, great panel, international panel. So I'm going to ask an international question pertaining to the issue specific to monopoly or monopolization specific in wartime issues happening right now. So I'm sure you understand where I'm going with this because you have countries who are now determining what is and what is not monopolization, interference, and all these other issues. Any thoughts or opinions on how this changes the dynamics of an international law aspect of monopolies and big companies and all these other issues? Any thoughts? Anna, any thought? You. You. Um. Well, I think that the current sort of wartime situation points to the uh, vulnerabilities of uh, becoming dependent on a small number of suppliers of any good, right? So in that sense, it sort of cuts uh, in the opposite direction from what I and other others on the panel have been saying, which is that there's, you know, that allowing companies to be big is not necessarily bad. Allowing companies to be big and then having those companies be uh, subject to wartime conditions in which we may no longer want to rely on them uh, causes, you know, both political and economic problems. And that's where I think at least Europe is finding itself with respect to reliance on, on Russian oil and gas. So um, in, in ter I'm not sure what impact it has on competition policy, but I can see that this situation uh, would lead us all to think um, seriously about diversifying our sources of uh, critical inputs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a non-antitrust statute that gives the president of the United States the power to veto, I believe it's any merger on national security grounds, and it's a non-reviewable decision, non-reviewable by the courts. So if what I read is correct, and it may not be, China has monopoly or pretty close to monopoly on some 
really important metals and materials that are used in batteries and other things. And if hypothetically there's a, a an American company that makes graphite or whatever it is that one of these things that the Chinese uh, allegedly have close to 100% share of, then the president should use its power and say, you may not buy this American company that makes titanium or graphite or wh whatever it is. Um, it's not really an antitrust law, but 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 there it is. National security. National security law. Yes. Any no? Right. I'm interested in your perspective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, Richard, uh, do you have uh, the mic? I could say a word about the defense thing, and then I have. I have a, a very, very short question. Um, what happened in World War II is that the is that the precursor to the Defense Department signed a memorandum of agreement with Thurman Arnold, which he didn't like very much. It said that the defense, the the War Department and the Navy Department had absolute authority to veto any suits, and that throughout the war they made sure that that the that the antitrust people did nothing. And, they, and in fact, through, throughout the post-war period, the Defense Department worked very hard to avoid any breakups. They want, they like big firms. They, they, they were opposed to the AT&T breakup. They were, opposed to, uh, they were opposed to all of these things because they wanted a single large firm that, that would be under their control. My, my question is, why make things like price fixing and non-compete clauses Illegal? Why just not make them unenforceable? Um, the uh, people who engage in price fixing would love to fi continue to fix prices. They make money. I mean, unless you say you've got treble damages or jail, they'd love to continue doing it and police each other. And uh, if if you cheat on the prices, and I'll not what game theory says, but yeah. but 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 it's it's empirical. In other words, you you can look at. Uh, Friend of ours, colleague of ours, uh, John Connor, has, has has found so many examples of successful cartels that have succeeded in raising prices for long periods of time. You can find jury verdicts uh, sustained on appeal. You can find careful economic studies by dozens, hundreds of economists showing that it does work. It doesn't always work, but it does work to fix prices. Maybe not forever, but it works. But unenforceability does not remedy the harm to a third party victim who is not a party to that bargain. So I don't see how it helps. If I'm the car manufacturer that has been the victim of all of these car parts companies fixing prices and bid rigging, telling them, hey, that, that bid rigging was unenforceable. Um, I don't see how that really helps the, the injury that's occurred. You have a private suit in which they would be paid? Is that the idea? No, I'm thinking of any harm to the victim of a cartel. The victim of a cartel who's by definition not a party to the bargain can say it's an unenforceable bargain, but that doesn't help them. But even if they're found guilty, it doesn't harm them unless they're paid for it, right? But anyway, you, you may be right. I don't want to. You, I don't want to you may bring an antitrust, uh, antitrust class action, perhaps, right? So just to remunerate, to compensate the. Mm -hmm. The harmed consumers, right? If that, you can, if you can uh, prove it, of course, yeah. and, and so on. Yes. Yeah. Well, a lot of those class actions do rely heavily on government investigations. Yeah. So I think they feed into each other a bit. A lot. Yes. A lot. So this is this is a very fascinating discussion. Uh, just the last questions from the on online, which is a very interesting question actually. Um, to speed up antitrust litigation. Shall the U.S. have specialized courts for antitrust, similar to specialized courts for IP? And, and we've seen that this, this idea, I think, bringing the U.K. perspective, I think that's exactly the case. But what about the U.S.? What should the U.S. do? Yeah, I would be in favor. I right. think we have such different decisions coming out of courts with such different and, and variable experiences. I've become a little despondent about the ability to get consistently rigorous um, decisions that we can all buy into. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sabre Fair Logic to me is an example of a decision I just don't even really understand. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I'm I'm afraid we tried that in 1914. It's called the Federal Trade Commission, and I'm an alumni. I'm I'm allowed to say bad things about it because I used to work there. But you're an alumni too, or, or you're not an alumni. Well, that's a judge, jury, and executioner. That's not a court. Yeah. No, but it, but it is the first court before the Court of Appeals. Is I mean, it, it, it's more than a court. It's more than a court. It's a captive court, and that's but, the problem. But to say that the F. Yes, kangaroos. That's right. Right. Yeah. But but even from my perspective, just the expertise of the FTC, how shall I be polite about this over the years from 1914 to the present? How many times have you looked at those five commissioners and say, wow, those are the best and the brightest, the finest, all five of them? How often has that happened that the quality has been that high of the decision makers at the FTC? I wish it had been a better experiment. But what about something like the federal court for competition claims, as opposed to an administrative decision maker? Uh, Rosa, do you want to wait on? I actually don't want to comment on anything about the FTC. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. I'm right. testifying on their behalf. Right, you're right. Uh, Anna, do you want to wait on, on specialized courts? Should we have specialized courts on uh, in antitrust? I mean, I think actually it's a good idea. I would, I would favor that. Um, I do think the FTC is a little bit different. Those are political appointees. You know, those appointments change. You know, to some extent, as the administration changes, and so it's a slightly different uh, framework. And having judges who have more experience in, uh, you know, in a whole set of antitrust cases, I think would be very beneficial. Great. Uh, that closes our panel. This was a fantastic uh, discussion. I wanted that to be lively. I think it was lively. Uh, so just join me to upload my uh, co panel Thank you. This was fun. Thank you so this much. Which, and which show is this? We, uh, we have 15 minutes. Previous. No, we have no breaks. We have no breaks, and I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. You know, I've read a lot about the first years of the West. I've just read, and I think the books I like is, I think, my son's favorite. Yeah, my son is. Maybe, maybe. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And look, as an antitrust economist, you'll be... You're no, I know. I know. Sometimes when I read these things that you mm. you were just mentioning, these I'm like, well, I have the same reaction reading the book. Account. Yeah, that like really the, the stuff that Vanderbilt did. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. out there. But um, yeah, this is fun. This this was actually really good. You know, I haven't as much thought about this topic mm. before. Mark has practiced antitrust law for over a decade, and including as an enforcer uh, at both the Federal Trade Commission, as we talked about, and at the Department of Justice. And also he practiced uh, in the private sector at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison uh, law firm. 
He received his law degree from the University of Houston Law Center and his undergrad in philosophy uh, from the University of uh, Chicago. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aurelian. Uh, I'd also like to thank ITAF's Schumpeter Project on Competition Policy and George Washington University's Regulatory Studies Center for hosting today's conference and for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's generally humbling to, be, to join such an impressive lineup of panelists and speakers. Before I jump into it, I do need to offer this standard disclaimer that my comments today are solely my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Senator Lee or any of his other staff. Uh, I also know that I'm the only thing standing between you and free drinks, so I'll try not to get in the way of that. Uh, with that said, as an antitrust lawyer working in the legislative branch, I hope I can speak directly to today's themes. What is the path forward for antitrust public policy, and what might Schumpeter or the concept of dynamic competition have to offer that path? My thesis is this. We need a new vision for antitrust law in enforcement, in courts, and in Congress. And I believe that conservatives are best situ situated to provide that vision. The greatest challenge for antitrust policy right now is that the ongoing debate, both among practitioners and in the halls of Congress, is dominated by a false dichotomy. On one side, you have the neo-Brandeisians, who started the debate by criticizing the prevailing consensus among courts, enforcers, and legislators as to how the antitrust laws should work. The movement is led in no small part by non-expert and non-practitioner antitrust commentators, none of whom view their outsider status as a negative because they take issue with the entire antitrust bar itself defense counsel and enforcers alike. Their philosophy is typically described as big as bad, which is true, but only captures part of the picture. The label they apply to themselves is actually the most telling, anti-monopoly. No, not pro-competition, but anti-monopoly. This is an important economic and legal distinction, and I respect its adherence enough to believe it's intentional. The Neo-Brandeisians don't just want more or stronger antitrust enforcement, they have a fundamentally different view of the law and economics of antitrust. Their vision is far more expansive than ex post litigation. For the anti-monopolists, antitrust is a tool to address nearly every social and political malady, real or perceived. And of course, this will always be a moving target. Recall that the same people who have been telling us for years that antitrust analysis focuses too much on lowering consumer prices now want us to know that antitrust can fix inflation. To accomplish their vision for antitrust law, the neo-Brandeisians would transform antitrust analysis from an examination of legal and economic evidence aimed at ascertaining likely competitive effects to a mix of per se rules and something akin to a freewheeling public interest standard. As we've seen in other contexts, this latter approach in particular is a recipe for rent seeking on a massive scale, but I suspect that is a feature and not a bug for them. It seems to be a source of existential frustration for the neo-Brandeisians that the public interest standard has been applied in regulatory contexts, but not antitrust law, a field not limited to a single industry, but with the potential to govern the entire economy. That, I believe, is their ultimate vision for the FTC. For the Neo-Brandeisians, the FTC has always, was always intended to be, but for over a century has never fully realized its potential as a general purpose economic regulator rather than a law enforcement agency. That may be one reason why the agency has lately appeared to adopt a merger enforcement policy I call the field of dreams approach. If you build it, they will come. One of my favorite suggestions from the Neo-Brandeisian crowd is the idea that a quote textualist reading of the antitrust laws calls for an expansive application. Never mind that courts would still be required to define terms like competition, restraint of trade, and monopoly. And I suppose we'll simply have to discard the restraint of trade common law tradition that preceded the Sherman Act, as well as the legislative history evincing Congress's intent to establish a federal common law system of competition law by statute. The good news will be for uh, the law students. Once we have a textual, presumably literal application of Section 1 of, Sher of the Sherman Act, they'll no longer have to study contract law. But the most ironic part of being a neo-Brandeisian was observed by Bill McLeod a couple months ago. He pointed out that Justice Brandeis himself would almost certainly oppose their project. It was Brandeis, after all, who joined a unanimous Supreme Court in Schechter Poultry to strike down parts of the National Industrial Recovery Act, holding that rules related to fair competition could not be tied to any discernible standard and thus ran afoul of the non-delegation doctrine. The FTC would do well to bear this in mind, as well as the current composition of the court, as it explores rulemaking under Section 5's unfair methods of competition. 
I could go on cataloging the dangers of the neo-Brandeisian approach to antitrust law, but in the interest of time, I would simply direct you to Commissioner Wilson's keynote speech last week, which gave them a thorough treatment. The general thrust of the movement is that antitrust enforcers should be, to quote Orwell, infallible and all powerful, every success, every achievement, every victory, every scientific discovery, all knowledge, all wisdom, all happiness, all virtue are held to issue directly from their leadership and inspiration. And what is the alternative? On the other side of the debate are advocates for the status quo ante, whom I refer to as the non-interventionists. As the name might suggest, this group is essentially libertarian and generally skeptical of antitrust enforcement or any government intervention in free markets. In their view, actual threats to competition are rare and in any event, usually resolve themselves when left to market forces. Where the neo-Brandeisians seek expansion, they seek minimalism. The non-interventionists place a strong emphasis on economic analysis, which they believe to be objective and more often reliable than not. They insist that it is merely a coincidence that their economic theories almost always counsel against antitrust enforcement. The non-interventionists like to name check Bork more than they like to read Bork, which you can tell because they haven't yet canceled him for the views he expressed in slouching towards Gomorrah. Speaking of Bork and economics, the non-interventionists place a great um, emphasis on the consumer welfare standard though they place much less emphasis on the fact that by consumer welfare, they actually mean total economic surplus, including the profits of monopolization and cartelization, truly a great feat in branding. Many non-interventionists glibly compare antitrust to regulation. To be sure, antitrust enforcement and direct regulation exist on the same spectrum of gov government oversight of the economy, but they are on opposite ends. Conflating one with the other is a good indication that you know little about either. Finally, the non-interventionists also insist that we shouldn't be concerned about the actions of private companies because they don't hold government power and can't compel anything at the point of a gun. I know I'm painting in very broad strokes here, but the point is this. The neo-Brandeisians and the non-interventionists are really two sides of the same coin. Both sides purport to offer a grand unified theory of antitrust, one that would defer to government, the other that would defer to private economic power. Both sides want courts to look beyond market competition one to condemn conduct because of non-market societal harms, the other to excuse conduct because of non-market benefits. Both sides advocate for strong presumptions, one tending towards strict liability, the other towards strict legality, and deny that antitrust analysis should take facts and effects seriously in, in individual cases. Both sides damage antitrust enforcement through politicization by attempting to tilt the odds in favor of their preferred political interest, labor or capital. In a word, both sides are dangerously reductionist. They each in their own way rely on an overly simplistic philosophy to obscure a more complicated economic reality. At the same time, both sides also say something true, rendering the antitrust policy debate largely an ink blot that only confirms the priors of each side. So what do we do about it? The only way to resolve the impasse is to offer a competing vision. Part of the problem is that only one side of this debate has artic articulated what it is for. The other offers only opposition. We can appreciate the neo-Brandeisians for diagnosing real deficiencies in the decisions of antitrust enforcers and courts in recent decades, and for asking hard questions about the goals and assumptions of antitrust analysis, even while we forcefully oppose their irresponsible, reckless, and economically illiterate prescriptions. Yet we can't stop there point out their disregard for the rule of law and lack of regulatory humility by all means, but without something better, without an acknowledgement that they are trying to solve real problems, we're simply shouting into the void. Criticism without a solution is just whining, and advocating for the status quo ante will only serve to push people into the arms of the radical left. Which brings me to today's discussion. Can Schumpeter provide a path forward? Well, as you might expect a lawyer to say, it depends. If Schumpeterian antitrust is simply another form of non-interventionism, it really has little to offer the current moment. For example, let's look at one of the core theses of Schumpeter, which is that perfect competition is essentially an elusive myth. Real progress comes not from competition within markets, but from innovation that displaces markets. Schumpeter describes it this way in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. The fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods, the new methods of production and transportation, the new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. He observed that every market, quote, takes considerable time in revealing its true features and ultimate effects, and there is no point in appraising the performance of that process ex visu of a given point in time, 
we must judge its performance over time as it unfolds through decades or centuries. A system, any system, economic or other, that at every given point of time fully utilizes its possibilities to the best advantage may yet in the long run be inferior to a system that does so at no given point of time because the latter's failure to do so may be a condition for the level or speed of long run performance. Every business strategy must be seen in its role in the perennial gale of creative destruction. Jerry Ellig described it in the, in the introduction to dynamic competition and public policy more concisely. The critical antitrust issue is not we just whether a particular exclusionary practice produces some identifiable consumer benefit in the present, but also how that practice will affect the path of innovation in the future. On the surface, there's something insightful here. Competition is dynamic, and the benefits that come from transformative change as one market displaces another may outweigh whatever benefits might have been realized from competition or harm from the lack of it within the static legacy market. Upon reflection, it almost seems obvious that the most impactful innovation is of the paradigm shifting sort rather than marginal improvements in static markets. But does this hold up to scrutiny? Schumpeter's theory of dynamic competition hinges on the existence in markets of endogenous innovation, innovation internal to the market from individual entrepreneurs or firms R&D departments. There are two problems with extrapolating from this a reason to avoid antitrust scrutiny in static markets, however. First is the incentives of incumbent firms in the market. A monopolist simply isn't going to invest in innovation that would challenge or cannibalize its existing market power. History has shown instead that monopolists, especially when they're publicly traded and have fiduciary obligations to their shareholders, often innovate to entrench and protect their monopoly rather than disrupt it. Take, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, whose representatives love to tout how much money drug companies spend on R&D. However, an April 2021 CBO report found that while small companies develop a greater share of their R&D to developing and testing new drugs, larger drug companies devote a greater share of their R&D to things like line extension improvements for existing drugs. This is consistent with the rash of abusive behavior we've seen in the industry over the last few decades, including pay for delay agreements, product hopping, and patent thickets, all of which are aimed at protecting existing monopolies from competition, and all of which pharma defends as necessary to innovation. In their chapter on innovation and antitrust enforcement and dynamic competition and public policy, Daniel Rubenfeld and John Hoven note that there is a substantial body of evidence that leading incumbents prefer a different path of innovation than challengers. And quote Nancy Dorfman's observation that leading companies generally use technology as a means of reinforcing their position without changing the fundamental rules of the game. Because it may disrupt the nature of competition in a given industry, a new technology which modifies the key factors for success tends to be perceived as a strategic opportunity by marginal competitors and as a threat by the leading competitors, even if they are the ones which develop the new technology. The second problem with reliance on endogenous innovation is that the potential for and nature of would-be paradigm-shifting innovation from marginal competitors is often directly influenced, if not controlled by, incumbent monopolists in the legacy market. Even disruptive innovation to some extent relies upon legacy technologies and networks, Nothing new is created in a vacuum. Conduct that increases barriers to entry, increases switching costs, or limits interoperability only exacerbates this dynamic. Monopoly power in the legacy market can empower a firm to control the quantity and quality of innovation in emerging markets. The idea that we should tolerate greater market power within markets because it fosters greater innovation to disrupt that market gets things entirely backwards. The Microsoft case is a perfect example of putative innovation that actually served to entrench an incumbent monopoly in a static market, which, when successfully challenged, allowed true innovation from new entrants to initiate dynamic competition that fundamentally altered the industry. Today, we may be seeing something analogous in Google's control over digital advertising. Even new developments sold as innovation to protect privacy, such as Google's plan to eliminate third-party cookies, have the effect of further entrenching its monopoly in digital advertising. Google is only able to do this because of the wealth of personal data afforded it by its position in the browser, search, mobile OS, video sharing, and personal email markets. Moreover, when incumbent firms can't constrain disruptive entrants, there is still the possibility of acquisition to obviate the competitive threat. This is particularly the case in the tech industry, which has in no small part outsourced its R&D to Silicon Valley venture capitalists. While the potential for acquisition has led to an explosion of VC funding for startups, it has also created a dynamic in which truly disruptive innovation, which always is most likely to occur outside an incumbent firm, is now even less likely to realize its full potential. 
innovators that would fundamentally disrupt the marketplace are either acquired by an incumbent in order to blunt the risk or to co-opt the innovation to augment and protect an existing market petition, such as in the case of Visa's recent attempted acquisition of Plaid, or the innovator will never get funding in the first place because an incumbent firm controls the terms of entry. It's now common knowledge in the tech space that the best way to get funding is to develop a feature or complement to the product of an existing firm, the tech version of pharma's line extensions. Far from the perennial gale of creative destruction, this looks more like the perennial lull that Schumpeter warned against. For all these reasons, it would seem then that the fate of endogenous innovation likely to bring about dynamic competition hangs itself on the state of competition and legacy markets. But on top of the practical realities that constrain endogenous innovation, there are policy grounds to be skeptical of Schumpeter's theory as well. First, there is the simple fact that economists are not good at predicting the future. And his conclusion, El acknowledges, quote, the damning inquiry, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? If only the FTC had kept the same humility in mind before concluding in 2013 that the harm from Google's practices would be safely contained by the market, a conclusion based on a number of predictions about the future of the market that all turned out to be wrong. Second, consumers and policymakers have every right to conclude that real measurable harm in the instant static market outweighs the speculative chance of future benefits in a new market. Given that Schumpeter says this process may play out over decades or even centuries, it is not unreasonable to oppose what amounts to an intergenerational wealth transfer or a lottery ticket for the benefit of tomorrow bought with today's higher prices. And third, even setting aside the speculative nature of future benefits, consumers and policymakers may be skeptical of the desirability of future innovation. Look at the metaverse. No doubt, Mark Zuckerberg is frustrated that his current business depends on two competitors to reach his users. The metaverse will allow him to create a walled garden of his own. But after two years of lockdowns, Zoom meetings, and virtual schooling, who still thinks that more time spent in the virtual world is good for society? As Franklin Fisher put it in his essay on innovation and monopoly leveraging, it is not true that higher rates of innovation are necessarily socially preferable to low ones. Policies that generate the socially optimal rate and type of innovation are not known. All of this cautions against unreservedly recommending Schumpeter as our guide for the path forward. At the same time, some of Schumpeter's themes point to a very wise and important piece of counsel that economic reality is often far more complex than we realize, and that we should avoid imposing grand theories upon it, or at least remember the virtues of caution and humility when we do. The mid 20th century, when Schumpeter wrote, was inundated with broad brushstroke philosophies of politics and economics. Schumpeter pushed back against that to acknowledge things were more complicated than they seemed. We shouldn't put his theory on a pedestal in the same way he criticized others of doing with theirs. Rather, what we should do, or what we should take away, is the general observation that no one economic theory can perfectly explain every market. As Professor Langlois put it in his contribution to Ellick's collection, the more uncertain the world, the harder to tell predation from dynamic competition, an observation that naturally cuts both ways. Today, we are similarly beset by overly simplistic views of politics and the economy. A Schumpeterian response that pushes back against reductionist thought would be a welcome change. With that in mind, what might a new vision for antitrust that eschews grand theories look like for policymakers? To start, I noted at the outset that I think conservatives are uniquely situated to offer this new vision. While the left has become enamored with a progressive vision of antitrust that would make even Justice Brandeis blush, the right has begun to rediscover that concentrated economic power can be just as dangerous as concentrated political power. Schumpeter himself, in fact, supports this view. In a chapter on Marx, he observed, many socialist writers besides Marx have displayed that uncritical confidence in the explanatory value of the element of force and of the control over the physical means with which to exert force. Ferdinand LaSalle, for instance, has little beyond cannons and bayonets to offer by way of explanation of governmental authority. It is a source of wonder to me that so many people should be blind to the weakness of such a sociology and to the fact that it would be obviously much truer to say that power leads to control over cannons and men willing to use them than that control over cannons generates power. We should all take a moment to savor the irony that the objection they're just private companies should find its roots in Marxist political philosophy. And conservatives are waking up to this fact, are accepting that a system in which private interests wield almost insurmountable control over commerce, speech, and social interaction can be just as oppressive as political tyranny. But unlike the left, 
they still appreciate the dangers of big government. Conservatives, then, may be the only ones who can hold these two poles in tension. It will be up to conservatives to chart a path forward for antitrust policy that avoids both the scylla of big government and the charybdis of big business. Much is possible through relatively incremental reforms that could nonetheless significantly invigorate antitrust enforcement. For example, Congress could consider legislatively directing antitrust enforcers in courts to interpret consumer welfare as consumer surplus or buyer surplus where appropriate, rather than total surplus. This would ensure that the benefits and harms of conduct or mergers are related to the relevant market and would discourage mergers whose primary benefit is a wealth transfer from consumers to shareholders. Shareholders deserve a return on their investment, but Congress could stipulate that it not come at the expense of competition. Congress might also consider directing courts and enforcers to give greater weight to evidence of anti-competitive intent than speculation by economists as to whether it would bear out. As Robert Bork put it, the judge, legislator, or lawyer cannot simply take the word of an economist in dealing with antitrust, for the economists will certainly disagree. I think it's safe to assume that the businessman whose livelihood depends upon it has a better sense of the likely outcome of his actions than the economist paid handsomely after the fact to excuse them. Several of the authors of Ellig's Dynamic Competition in Public Policy point out how many modern markets are not readily amenable to the traditional analysis of market share and monopoly power. Congress could take the lead here by reminding courts and enforcers to look first to direct evidence of market power before attempting to infer it from market shares. Perhaps new evidentiary rules would help facilitate this. In the tech industry specifically, Congress should emphatically reject the national champion model of competition, whether against China or any other nation. Arguments that antitrust enforcers should take a light touch to big tech because we otherwise might fall behind China are specious, especially when coming from the very tech companies that have invested billions of dollars in abetting China's technological rise. The truth is that America's strength is our diversity of talent, which is refined through competition. Protecting incumbents from competition doesn't make us stronger against foreign nations. It encourages stagnation and creates a single point of failure. It also leads to crony capitalism and a private public surveillance state. How is that any different from, let alone better than, China? In a chapter entitled Taking on Big Tech in his recently published memoir, former Attorney General Bill Barr suggests that one possible approach to addressing competition problems among big tech companies would be for Congress to empower a federal agency to, quote, order platforms to divest certainly previously acquired firms with the aim of reducing the platform's market dominance and promoting competition. Barr proposes that, quote, the statute would not direct specific divestitures by name, but would define the particular characteristics requiring divestiture. I expect that we will see approaches similar to this from Republicans in Congress in the very near future. All in all, conservative policymakers should embrace a more vigorous approach to antitrust enforcement while simultaneously rejecting the overreach demanded by the left. We can aggressively oppose the concerted effort to transform antitrust law into a public interest standard that will simply replace private sector monopolists with government bureaucrat monopolists and ensure that the majority of innovation is in new ways to engage in rent seeking. At the same time, we can also reject the laissez-faire approach to antitrust enforcement that will not only fail to lead to the great strides in innovation that the libertarians like to promise, but would also push the public into the arms of the neo-Brandeisians. To reiterate, the options on the table in the current antitrust debate are unsatisfactory. One side wants near total deference to big government, the other near total deference to big business. If Schumpeterian antitrust stands for the proposition that economic reality is too complicated and ultimately unknowable to justify nearly any antitrust intervention, that it doesn't offer much more than to dress up non-interventionism in economic nihilism. If, however, Schumpeter stands for the proposition that economic reality is more complicated than it seems, that competition, competition takes place along more than one axis and over longer periods of time, then it provides wise counsel to avoid attempts to impose any single grand unified theory of antitrust on the economy. Congress, led by conservatives rediscovering their suspicion of all concentrated power, should reject the false dichotomy of neo-Brandeisian government control or non-interventionist neglect and enact policies that correct deficiencies in the law while avoiding a return to past mistakes. Historically, the conservative approach to government has been to avoid relying solely on the abstractions of economic theory at the expense of facts and to instead focus on preventing abuses of power whether political or economic. It is time for antitrust policy to reflect that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dev, for the great speech. Uh, 
with that, I think the conference day is over, and I invite everybody to come check it out. Thank you.